Honorable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this Parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Senator Mr. President, Shot. I move that the Government Business Notices of Motions No. 1 and 2 be postponed to a later hour of the day. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Messages have been received from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. Corporation, Corporations Law Amendment Bill 1995, Student and Youth Assistance Amendment Bud, Budget Measures Bill 1995. The Minister. I indicate to the Senate that those bills which have just been announced by the President are being introduced together after debate on the motion for the second reading has been adjourned. I will be moving a motion to have the bills listed separately on the notice paper. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities may be taken together and be now read a first time. Clark, sorry. Oh, the question is the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Mark. Corporations Law Amendment Bill 1995 and Student and Youth Assistance Amendment Budget Measures Bill 1995. Mr. Minister. President, I tabled a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the Student and Youth Assistance Amendment Budget Measures Bill 1995 and move that these bills be now read a second time. I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Leave. Granted, in corporation leaves granted. The question is: the motion be agreed to? Those that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. In accordance with the order agreed to on the 29th of November 1994, further consideration of the second reading of these bills is now adjourned till the first day of sitting in 1996. Minister. I move that these bills be listed on the notice paper as separate orders of the day. The question is: that, that motion be agreed to? Those that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Messages have been received from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. Superannuation Industry Supervision Legislation Amendment Bill 1995, Social Security Legislation Amendment, CIRA Pension and Other Measures Bill 1995, and Customs Tariff Legislation Amendment Bill 1995. The Minister. Mr President, I indicate to the Senate that the bills which have just been announced by you are being introduced together after debate on the motion for the second reading has been adjourned and I will be moving a motion to have the bills listed separately on the notice paper. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities may be taken together and be now read a first time. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Superannuation Industry Supervision Legislation Amendment Bill 1995, Social Security Legislation Amendment Care of Pension and Other Measures Bill 1995 and Customs Tariff Legislation Amendment Bill 1995. Minister. Mr. President, I table revised explanatory memoranda relating to the bills and move that these bills be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. The question is the motion be agreed. Sorry, is leave granted for incorporation? Leave is granted. Senator Senator Calvert. I'll move, <laughs> uh, I'll move for the debate on this uh, matter be uh, adjourned. <coughs> Question is: the motion be agreed to? Those that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Shot. I move that the bills be listed on the notice paper as separate orders of the day, and I move that the resumption of debate on these bills be an order of the day for a later hour of the day. Question is: that motion be agreed to? Those that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. Government business order for the day number one: Commonwealth Bank Sale Bill 1985. Second reading adjourned debate. Senator Calvert. Thank you, Mr. President. 
Uh, for those of us who were here last week, you remember I had available to me about one minute to commence the hearing of this bill. And I made the point then that uh, uh, much, much of the detail that is uh, associated with this bill will be dealt by regulation and uh, the Senate are forced to play a guessing game in an effort to determine what the real intention of uh, a lot of these critical clauses are. But no, I've got no doubts that during the, the course of the debate of this bill on the committee stages that perhaps some of the concerns that have been raised in the other place and here will be clarified. Um, This uh, particular matter, the sale of the Commonwealth Bank, of course, has, has created a lot of uh, division amongst the Labor Party in particular because uh, the Commonwealth Bank was held up as one of the icons of, uh, of the Labor Party. And uh, the government have taken this very opportunistic uh, step to selling the rest of the Commonwealth Bank off to, uh, to fill a hole in their budget. And I think it's, if there's any, ever any doubt about the disastrous state of our economic uh, position, this bill says it all. Uh, the Australia of today has one of the uh, largest deficits in the world. Taxes have increased to unprecedented levels. Uh, with a laughing stock of the world economy, and our waterfront obviously is as well, given the criticism over the weekend by uh, international shipping uh, companies. Mr. De Mr. Acting Deputy President, we know we're a country which has it all. We've got rich resources, natural beauty and skilled workers, yet we're a country which has continued to slip back under this Labor government. Now, the Treasurer has attempted to uh, hoodwink the Australian people into believing that we were going to have a budget surplus of something like $718 million. The real position, of course, is that the budget shows a deficit of around $8.5 billion. So this sale of the Commonwealth Bank is a desperate sell-off of the family jewels in order to continue this charade. The government's record in relation to asset sales mirrors its dismal performance on other counts. The Labor Party has only managed to achieve $5.8 billion, or 53 per cent of a projected, a projected total of $11 billion in sales since 1987-88. And we sit back this year and wonder how the government, which only managed to sell $55 million in asset sales last year, will make the quantum leap to sell $5.4 billion in the space of a year. Well, I've no doubt that this bill is not going to be the uh, final act of deception and, and double dealing by this government. Make my mis no mistake, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. This government has an agenda to once again turn us back on its principles, as it does so well, and its aim is to see Telstra and Australia Post, post both with so for sale signs in their shop front windows. Now, the coalition has made it perfectly clear that we've got no intention of selling Australia Post, but make no mistake, this government would sell its grandmother in order to stay in office. I'm sure we can all remember the letter which the Minister for Finance at the time, Mr Willis, included in the, in the September 1993 prospectus for the Commonwealth Bank. And he said, quote, the government has no intention of selling the Commonwealth Bank. That was the assurance that this government gave all those mum and dad investors who were looking to invest their savings in the, in, in the bank. And I have to say, Mr Acting Deputy President, I was one of those people and I wish to declare an interest that I haven't one of the short, small shareholders that bought into the Commonwealth Bank at that time. And, and I believe that, uh, uh, that the government had no intention of selling the Commonwealth Bank, but there, here we are today, two years later, we see a complete backflip by the government and uh, I just wonder, yeah, of course it was a false prospectus and uh, I think that matter was raised at the time, but of course, uh, because the, the minister was protected by uh, being a member of the government, of course, and nothing happened. But um, I just wonder sometimes whether Mr Willis had the same loss of memory that has afflicted other ministers uh, in that other place. This isn't the first time that the government's been dishonest, of course. Uh, in 1986, when answering a question regarding our airlines, the then Minister for Transport and Aviation said, I can assure the honourable, and I quote, I can assure the honourable member that the government's policy is that both Qantas and Trans Australian Airlines will remain in full public ownership. Another Labor lie. 
It's evident that the minister's word once again means nothing. In 1991, the government had an electoral platform which promised to ensure that the Federal Airports Co Corporation remained in full public own ownership. Only last week, only last week we, be, we were debating the Airports Transi Transitional Bill 1995 and the Airports Bill 1995, which laid rest to another sacred cow of the Labor Party uh, and their philosophy. And of course, uh, we don't have to uh, think back too far to the sale of a and I mean, it hasn't happened yet. We've debated the bill. We, we procrastinated over that for so long that instead of getting a taxpayers, uh, taxpayers getting a benefit from the sale of it, it looks like uh, we are going to get a, a, a deficit. It's going to cost us money to sell the a &L. Thank you, Senator McGoran. Two million dollars a day. Now we know Mr Keating admitted on the late line program in June of 1994 that it makes no difference if Telstra is publicly or privately owned. So there's a little inkling of what might happen further down the track if this Labor government is unfortunately returned to office. So, um, so we could see Telstra lining up as well. I've got no problem whatsoever with the government adopting so willingly the policies of the coalition. We all know that uh, the coalition policies have been, uh, and have been shown in Victoria in particular, that, that asset sales uh, properly conducted can be of benefit in reducing uh, the debts, the huge debts that the Labor Party has been running up both in the state of Victoria and uh, also in, in, uh, in the Commonwealth. But, um, but you, you could argue, of course, that the government is last, last saying, uh, starting to see some common sense by, by, uh, by privatising these public assets. But what needs to be remembered is that on every occasion to date that this government has made a firm commitment to, to do one thing, their actions have been completely the opposite. What the government's actions show is that more than ever they can't be trusted. Anyone in the Australian community who believes that the government is interested or indeed capable of telling the truth really should take a long, hard look at the facts. Furthermore, when the government makes its election promises, people would do well to remember the great and long string of broken promises which have come out of the mouths of Labor ministers since the last election. The reaction of the Commonwealth Bank to the government's plans have from the start been understandably cautious particularly in relation to the buyback option which has been pushed by the government. The bank sought to ensure that, a, as a precursor, there would be an independent examination of shareholder approvals, that, that there would be a special resolution under corporations law or the Australian Stock Exchange listing rules as considered necessary by the bank board to deal with matters such as any necessary approvals from regulatory authorities, any, any selective buyback and any necessary amendments to the bank's memorandum and articles of association, which remove all special rights to the Commonwealth. The bank also wanted to ensure that there would be agreement on the transition arrangements for the Commonwealth uh, guarantee of the bank's liabilities and that there would be agreement on the future of the Commonwealth Development Bank. That has most certainly not occurred, and today we're in this chamber debating a bill and I don't believe that any of us present can say with any surety that the exact future of, the, what, of what the exact future of the bank is going to be. That position is indefensible. It's indefensible to the government, and, it, and uh, it pays absolutely no regard whatsoever for those small investors like myself and others who are such a vital component of the bank structure. The, structure. the fact that the future of the Commonwealth bank Development Bank hangs in the balance, without any certainty, is perhaps the most glaring of the government's failings. We know the Commonwealth Development Bank, of course, uh, is not the bank of the high flyers or the multinationals. It is very much the bank of ordinary Australians, those in small business and those on the land. The importance of the Development Bank is recognised by a special charter in the Commonwealth Banks Act. The main role of this bank is to provide finance where it may not otherwise be available. It's a bank where what is important are cash flows and prospects rather than compulsory security. Its role is very much, as its name would suggest, to aid in development. And there are hundreds and thousands of farmers around Australia that have, at one time or other, been forced to use um, capital from the, uh, from the Commonwealth Development Bank, and it still plays a very important role in small business, as uh, the minister at the table would, uh, would know. Um, and so it's, it's very important, and it's, it's one of the major concerns that the coalition has. Uh, the future of the Commonwealth Development Bank. 
under this bill which we are debating today, that charter, uh, that charter that existed before will no longer be law. We will have to rely instead on a memorandum of association which is to be part of the new Commonwealth Development Bank Limited. Now, the coalition, which is all, always mindful of, uh, of the need to support those in small business and those on the land, considers the proposed arrangements to be less than satisfactory. Even the explanatory memorandum recognises this fault in the present legislation when it says, quote, the bill does not define the future role of the Commonwealth Development Bank, unquote. Our very genuine concerns are compounded because the memorandum further states Quote, the Commonwealth will continue to pay an annual subsidy to the Commonwealth Development Bank to undertake the banking activities defined in its charter. Unquote. We've got no idea, absolutely no idea, however, what the level or type of the subsidy will be. All we have is to go on is some vague notion relating to the shareholders' agreement which is to be entered into by the Commonwealth and the bank before the transfer occurs. None of this goes anywhere near meeting the requirements of the Commonwealth Bank Board. It may be, Mr Acting Deputy President, we see the end of the Commonwealth Development Bank as we know it, and the Coalition believes that this will have very serious consequences in denying small business, and the rural community in particular, access to a source of funding which has been critical to their growth over, over the years. There is in fact no guarantee, of course, that, 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 uh, that it will survive because the Commonwealth Bank has made it very clear in the past that it relies on the Commonwealth subsidy to successfully carry out the charter. In other words, no subsidy, no development bank. Item 29 of the schedule to the bill repeals section 85A of the Commonwealth Bank Act, which provides for the grant of financial assistance uh, from the Commonwealth to the Commonwealth Development Bank. Some $41 million will be paid in subsidies by the end of the year 1995-96 financial year, and it should be and should that level of funding support be removed from the small business and rural sector, then obviously the effects will be very significant. It is ill-conceived to deal with this bill before those matters are finalised. Because a memorandum can be amended under the Corporations Law, the Commonwealth Development Bank will be left with no option but to pull all its loans on a strict commercial basis to the detriment of its existing clients. Because the Commonwealth is now trapped into selling the Commonwealth Bank in order to save any semblance of, uh, semblance of its budget predictions in the lead up to the election, it has hatched up a plan to unload onto a privatised uh, Commonwealth Bank a development bank without any guarantee of subsidy and which as a result will have no choice but to place uh, the development on a totally commercial basis. At the end of the day, if the Commonwealth Bank decides to acquire the Commonwealth, Commonwealth shares in the development bank, it would be free to move down, uh, close down the operations of the development bank on the grounds that it did not consider the subsidy sufficient to meet its financial needs. In order to ensure that the future of the development bank is assured, the government must reveal before the, par before the parliament the full de details of the proposed shareholders' agreement, and in particular it must be upfront in regard to a commitment for future subsidies. Any terms associated with the shareholders' agreement will also impact on any buyback of shares held by the Commonwealth before the balance of the shares goes on sale to the public. The Commonwealth Bank must inevitably have its funds depleted by the terms of the buyback, and those same funds may well come uh, at the expense of the development bank. Such a figure could well approach a billion dollars, and without a guarantee that the Commonwealth will continue to support the development bank, its future looks even more shaky. As my colleague, the member for McKellar and the other place, Mrs Bishop, pointed out, it's totally unsatisfactory that the only time this parliament will see the shareholders' agreement is when it's signed, although I understand that, in fact, this may uh, be made available before it's signed, and if that's the case, I'll, I'll wait to hear from the minister to explain that during the committee stages. The issue of foreign ownership is also one which requires greater attention by the government. It's clear that the government has learned little from the Qantas situation, and as a result, we continue to have in this bill a retrospective approach to dealing with the problem where the limit has exceeded. The, Commonwealth, uh, the coalition, Mr Acting Deputy President, won't be uh, standing in the way of, of the second reading. We, we are moving an amendment that, that raises the concerns uh, that we have, but we certainly uh, won't be voting against the uh, second reading. Uh, I want to make that clear right now. Uh, the future of the Commonwealth Development Bank 
must not only be guaranteed but we must also ensure that it continues to undertake its present role in providing specialised assistance for rural communities and small business. We know that the Small Business of Australia looked to the Coalition for support. A recent uh, Yellow Pages survey shows that they don't trust the Keating government. You can understand why. Um, and I think when we're discussing this uh, particular development bank uh, and the sale of the Commonwealth Bank, we should also consider how the AIDC could be uh, utilised in the role of providing assistance to small business and rural export producers. We need greater attention to the issue of respectivity in the regulations and finally there's a need to resolve the issue of the shareholders uh, meeting when the government was previously of the view that it could be all done by legislation. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, last week uh, when we started uh, debating this bill I distributed a, uh, an amendment on behalf of the coalition, a second reading amendment. Um, I uh, formally move that amendment. As I said, we won't be voting against the second reading. Uh, I know there are, there are amendments being put forward by the Democrats. Um, I'll speak on those further during the committee stages, but I'd, I'd, say, I'd like to make, make it uh, quite clear at the outset the Coalition won't be supporting those amendments purely and simply because we believe uh, that they uh, give too much power back to the Treasurer and we, after all said and done we are trying to sell the Commonwealth Bank into private ownership. Why would we want to then turn around and, and, and uh, let the Commonwealth Development Bank be uh, virtually by, by the uh, interference of the Treasurer um, have the same degree of involvement as, the, it was pre as previously uh, was held by the government and the Commonwealth Bank? So I think it defeats the purpose somewhat. Um, so, as I said, we will be supporting the bill. Um, I commend uh, the amendment which I formally move to the second reading, and uh, I look forward to hearing um, comments to those queries I raised from the, uh, from the Minister during the committee stages. Senator Wheelwright. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I wanted to say a few things about the sale of the Commonwealth Bank, although I'm very conscious of the pressure of time that uh, is being felt by government senators this week with the degree of government business that we wish to get through this and so I will be as brief as I can in my remarks. But nevertheless, I am actually Senator, you'll have to look at the latest one. Anyway, I think it is time certainly to sell the Commonwealth Bank. It was a, a very early Labor government which brought the Commonwealth Bank into being and it is entirely appropriate that it is this Labor government which uh, finally pushes it out of the nest. The first uh, tranche of shares were put into the market in 1990. And since then we've seen a very orderly market in the shares. We've also seen no intervention on the part of the government in the running of the bank. That's entirely appropriate because the bank has to compete on an equal basis with its competitors. But I think it's also worth the Senate remembering that uh, the Treasurer's intervention on the subject of fees and charges for individual depositors has been very effective in recent weeks in changing the attitude not only of the Commonwealth Bank, which first proposed that those fees be raised, but also other banks. And I think it's indicative of the fact that, in terms of regulation, there is very little more that is now needed to ensure an efficient running of the banking system and also a banking system which meets the needs of, its needs of the community and the needs of its customers. But I do at this juncture want to com compare the, uh, the government's attitude to the selling of the Commonwealth Bank with the opposition's attitude to the selling of Telstra, because I think it really does show in stark contrast the difference between the two sides of this Senate on the question of privatisation. The Commonwealth Bank is a mature business in a very mature industry. It has really reached an appropriate level in its development where the amount of change that it's going to face in the foreseeable future is far, far less than that which it has faced in the recent past. On the other hand, Telstra is a fast-growing company in a very, very rapidly changing business sector. It is in the infant industry of communications. And it is for that reason, I believe, that the government wants to retain Tel Telstra, despite the fact that the opposition wants to sell it. If we look at what's happened to the Commonwealth Bank, and more particularly the banking industry, over the last few years, the major regulatory changes are behind us. The 80s was a period of very rapid deregulation in banking, not only in Australia, but around the world. The banks, all of them, changed. They changed their attitudes to their customers. They changed in their attitudes to the community in general and they certainly changed in the services that they provided and the way in which they operated. 
and the Commonwealth Bank changed with them. There were certainly some mistakes made during that period of change in the 80s, and many lessons were learned. I think it's often forgotten that uh, the foreign banks, which this government allowed to enter the market during the 80s, bore considerable losses as a result of the mistakes they made, the sort of losses which no Australian would be particularly enthusiastic about Australian banks bearing, but that was the price they were prepared to pay to come into the Australian market and, em and embrace a, a completely new world. We've also seen considerable benefits to consumers as a result of the changes of the 80s. We've seen borrowers see the end of the offence that was the savings book account which paid 1 or 2 per cent interest at the same time as borrowers were required to pay 12, 13 per cent on their home loans. That gap between borrowing rates and deposit rates is a function of the deregulation that we saw in the 80s. We've also seen business, avail see a business have available to them products which were inconceivable 20 years ago or 30 years ago and certainly when the Commonwealth Bank was, was first thought of. These risk management products are based on derivative markets which have seen phenomenal growth. And again, I think we can say that they've developed in an orderly fashion, they're in a mature stage now, and they're something which is available to all banks and to all customers of those banks. The net result has been a Commonwealth Bank now which is more profitable than it has ever been, which is showing a better return on its capital than it ever has, and one which the stock market has given its approval to. If you contrast that with the telecommunications industry, it is obvious that that industry and the major players in it are still evolving. The growth in that industry is absolutely phenomenal. We can hardly stand here now and possibly imagine what products will be available to consumers in 10 years' time or even 15 years' time. The rate of change is absolutely extraordinary. And at that point, and because of that change, there is still a public interest that has to be protected. To abandon Telstra now is really to say we don't really care about the rate of change, we don't care what the products might be, and we don't care about the players in that market and what future they might hold. But if you look at what the opposition is doing, the opposition is ummed and ahed about its policy. But I can tell you now, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, what the opposition's policy is on telecommunications. It is to raise as much money as possible for the next election. The opposition simply wants to sell Telstra because it wants to outbid the government in the coming election campaign. It wants to have a huge sack of money on its side so that it can go into the marketplace, it can go, to the, it, it can go essentially to bribe the electorate and say, we can outspend those on the other side because we've sold Telstra and we're going to use that money for that purpose. I was quite elated when Senator Tierney said that there was actually a policy had been announced on telecommunications by the other side last week. And with great enthusiasm, I rushed to the faxes but sadly, I found that uh, it only related to a two-line statement by Mr Howard in a speech to the National Farmers Federation. In fact, I can read this policy in its absolute entirety. It, uh, it was far less than I had hoped for and, indeed, I think the public deserves. He said, Today I announced that a coalition government will require Telstra to offer all of its customers who have lines connected to digital exchanges with access to ISDN as a standard service. We will also require Telstra to substantially complete its FMO or digitisation of exchanges by the 1st of July 1997 instead of the current year of uh, 2000 target date. Well, how can you do that if you have just suddenly decided that you're going to sell Telstra? And what's more, you're not going to sell Telstra because it's a mature business. You're not going to do it because you think that Telstra is going to provide the best return to the public. You're going to do it simply because you want to get as much money as you possibly can for the next coming election campaign. The two things are completely contradictory. You can't talk, as Senator Calvert did, about public interest and what banks should be doing and what the Commonwealth Development Bank might be doing, and in the same breath say you're going to sell Telstra with the sole aim, the only aim, of getting as much money for it as you possibly can. I think what the government is doing in selling the Commonwealth Bank now is redeploying in a responsible way Commonwealth funds, some four and a half billion if uh, current share price uh, values hold up to reduce its borrowings and to maintain a sound fiscal policy. But I think it stands in stark contrast when a government responsibly sees that a government-owned entity is at the end of its life, it is in a mature phase and can take its place in the private market. Compare that with Telstra, which we cannot envisage its shape within uh, five or even ten years' time. To sell that purely for the purposes of raising money to fund your election promises, I believe, is irresponsible. Thank you. Senator Kemp. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to speak briefly on what is a, an extraordinarily important uh, bill before the Chamber, the Commonwealth Bank Restructuring Bill. 
And I look forward to uh, voting with the government, with um, Senator Wheelwright and Senator Carr, Senator Coates, or, uh, Senator Schott, all those people all over the years that have uh, railed and complained that maybe the coalition uh, would sell the Commonwealth Bank. And uh, it's a day I look forward to, and um, the sooner we vote on this bill, uh, the better. And I, I assume there will be a division called by uh, the Democrats, and uh, we, can, we can then, Tom, uh, vote together on this, uh, Senator Wilright, on this important bill. I heard your, uh, your complaints about uh, Telstra and uh, the, the, uh, the privatisation of Telstra, and it, it harked me back. Uh, not, not so long ago, not so long ago, to a speech uh, by um, uh, uh, your former Prime Minister, Mr. Hawke, in the, the Ben Chifley uh, lecture, and uh, this was in September 1987. So we just hark ourselves back, not a long period of time, but um, this is what Mr. Hawke said then, and, it, and Senator Realwright's speech uh, reminded us of, of the Chifley lecture. And uh, this is what he said. Uh, this is uh, the Prime Minister of Australia, Mr Hawke. What in the name of reason is the justification for breaking up and selling off the great efficient national as assets like uh, Commonwealth Bank, uh, Telecom, TAA and Qantas? As the people of Australia come to realise the extent as the people of Australia come to uh, realise the extent of the economic and social vandalism proposed by our proponents. Of course, the vandalism that uh, he was talking about, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, included the vandalism of selling the Commonwealth Bank. And so I can understand uh, uh, Senator Wilwright as a, a former stockbroker, uh, recognising that the potential advantages to a future government in, uh, in selling uh, Telstra, as indeed, in fact, most of the telecoms around the world are privatised. So I would have thought I would have liked you to address that particular issue. Why, why is it in this uh, great nation of ours uh, telecoms should remain exclusively in the public sector and not even have any proportion of its shares sold? And why should other countries in, in fact, um, effectively privatised uh, Telstra, and uh, it would have been interesting if you had have, had have been able to grapple with that argument. But of course, we've had these scare tactics before, <laughs> and the trouble is, no one believes you. Um, I go to Victoria, and the, the Labor Party rails against uh, Premier Kennett for um, privatising uh, this and that, and I come to Canberra, and we find the Labor Party in Canberra. Uh, privatising this and that, and boy, are there some big chunks that, that are being privatised. Uh, in fact, there was an extraordinary incident the other week when Senator Realwright was on this side of the chamber and I was on that side of the chamber, and Senator Realwright was, was voting for the privatisation of the Federal Aircraft Corporation in Sydney Airport, and uh, of course, uh, because of a, an, another issue and a, another difficulty, we uh, weren't voting together on that particular issue. But, Senator Realwright, I would have been more cautious on going on record the way you did uh, today, um, in view of the record of your party, as really great privatisers, despite what they say in elections. And you know, the Labor Party uh, the, the, the Labor Party doesn't worry too much about what you say in elections. But, um, Senator Realwright, in the hugely unlikely circumstance, hugely unlikely circumstance that uh, the Labor Party wins an election in the, in the next ten years or wins the next election. Uh, there's no question the Labor Party will be selling Telstra, and we'll be standing up and we'll be quoting to you uh, uh, all, that, all those speeches you made, and you'll be working out whether you come into the chamber or not, or what sort of uh, sort of way you can sort of distinguish what you said then from what you said now. But the Labor Party, it has to be said, and I conclude on this matter, has no credibility on this issue. Uh, I remember Senator Evans. Uh, in this uh, chamber, uh, boasting, he said uh, that uh, now we've sold the Commonwealth Bank. He said there's nothing left for you to privatise. It, you know, gone through all these things the Labor Party had privatised, which they said before every election they wouldn't privatise, and then they came back and uh, decided they would. 
Uh, so, Senator Real right, I think uh, the contributions you make to this chamber are actually more thoughtful than a, a lot of your uh, colleagues, it has to be said. And uh, I don't sort of uh, argue that. I think your speeches are interesting, typically. But on this one, I have to say you fell dramatically uh, because uh, you, should have, you should have at least, out of deference to the public interest, explained why the Labor Party had so totally reversed its uh, position. Economic vandalism from Mr Hawke one day, responsible government policy from Mr Keating the, uh, the next. Now, uh, uh, you know, you might all refer to the former Prime Minister as Marcel Marceau. And at least you know, he put that position, but, but you, you've utterly changed course on it. You've backflipped and you've, you've, you've flipped onto, onto the privatisation thing with, with a, a vengeance, and you didn't explain to us why it was so important to Mr Hawke in his Chipley speech. And Senator Schott undoubtedly went around uh, in the 1990 election. I remember Commonwealth Bank officers saying, don't vote for Senator Kemp, he's, uh, he's, a, he's a going to privatise the Commonwealth Bank. And uh, I mean, all your party did that, and you probably you didn't do it because, uh, in a sense, you probably weren't on the campaign trail. But see, we're all aware of this history. We all know the immense baggage that Labor Party carries on this. The great icon of the Labor Party, of the, of the government enterprises, was the Commonwealth Bank. Well, you know, you've sold that, and you're about to sell it. So no one believes you on these other issues now, and uh, why should they, given the whole history? But. I don't want to be ungenerous uh, with this bill, uh, Mr Deputy, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I will be looking forward to voting with Senator Wilwright uh, on this bill. Uh, they have adopted our policy. They went into the Liberal, Mar Liberal Party supermarket and said, well, we are bereft of policy initiatives, so what can, we, what can we borrow from the Liberal Party? But, and so they said, well, you know, it does not make sense in the modern world, and I think that, makes, uh, that is correct uh, to have uh, major banking facilities uh, in the public <coughs> sector, and so you, you adopted uh, the Liberal Party policy ungraciously. No, no hint, no hint in your speech that uh, you, you had done one almighty uh, backflip. But because you got in, on, into the telecom Telstra issue, it, it did remind us of the Chifley speech and how far the Keating uh, Labor Party has changed on uh, privatisation. I think it's extraordinary that the socialist left seems to be so. Uh, uh, accepting of all this. Uh, someone said to me that in government in the 13 years the socialist left has become more like the social left. And uh, I think that uh, that probably is uh, the case. Uh, uh, I don't see uh, Senator Carr speaking uh, on this bill. would have been interesting to, to hear him speak. I mean, he rails against privatisation in Victoria. He rails against it. And, uh, but he comes to Canberra and he votes for it. So. Uh, the public will have to judge the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the sincerity of that approach. But it's no wonder the Labor Party is struggling. No one knows what they stand for in elections. They're not going to privatise anything after the election. It's Qantas out the door. It's Commonwealth Bank. Very big privatisation. So, as I said, I'm not going to be ungracious on this important bill. The, the Labor Party uh, has adopted, by and large, uh, Liberal Party policy on these sorts of issues. And uh, I look forward to voting with Senator Realwright uh, when the bill uh, is finalised in this parliament. Senator McGrory. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, it's often because we, we do have a, a great backlog of legislation facing the Senate and perhaps because the major parties are supporting this particular bill that we are guilty over, of overlooking the significance of bills that pass through this place. But this bill really must have some, some status in the parliament as it's the final sale of the Commonwealth Bank, the historic Commonwealth Bank. And to that end, it's a discredit to the government that the best they could do was wheel in Senator Wheelwright as the only speaker on the government's side. They could only muster up one new uh, backbench senator to, to speak on the behalf of the government's policy. It, uh, even then, he was apologetic for the time he was taking up in the Senate, and I think he was more embarrassed. By, by the fact that, that uh, he couldn't get any, su any supporters to speak with him on this bill. But it is a credit to Senator Realwright that, that he made an attempt and he put together a, a uh, relatively good, good uh, argument for the government. But it's a discredit to those on the, on, the other gov on the government side that didn't contribute to this debate. In particular, as Senator Kemp pointed out, in particular those uh, senators from the socialist left that have for years feigned their support for the Commonwealth Bank, in fact, made it a cornerstone of their philosophy. It has been an integral part 
of the socialist left philosophy, and not one of them have even entered the chamber during this most important and significant debate. Because the bank does have an important place in Australian history, and its, wor it, 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 its worth has been, been uh, quite significant in Australian history over those years, and in many respects it's been a romanticised bank. And th this has much to do with the beginnings of the bank itself, which go back as far as 1912, when it was introduced by a Labor, Labor government via the Commonwealth Bank Act 1911. And in, in the second reading speech of Andrew Fisher, who was then the Prime Minister, he said, this will be a bank belonging to the people and directly managed by the people's own agents. It will ultimately become the bank of banks rather than the mere money lending institutions. Our chief aim is not to make profits but to ensure safety and security to depositors. So read the second reading speech. Of course, uh, banking has come a long way from those uh, lofty ideals, particularly uh, our chief aim is not to make, make profits. But at, at very least, the, uh, the perception of this bank ha has been fulfilled. It, its role has been fulfilled in the community, at least by perception. It, it has always been a popular bank, and particularly in many of the rural areas, it's had a, uh, had a very special affinity uh, throughout its history in, in, in rural, rural Australia. And this was really borne out by the first allotment of shares when they were offered to the public. It, it's true to say that the shares were snapped up by the mums and dads market, way above its par value, and much to the surprise of the markets, and even more so to the surprise of a very revenue-hungry government. And we, kn we know the measure of, of how people in Australia really do attach themselves to banks when uh, the Victorian State Bank collapsed. Uh, around about 1990. Uh, ironically, this bank was uh, taken over or um, saved by, by the Commonwealth Bank. But the customers of that Victorian bank uh, had such an affinity with their state bank that uh, it was quite obvious that uh, they were going to discriminate against what bank they would belong to. So on the takeover of the Commonwealth Bank, of, of the Victorian State Bank, most of the customers moved across to the Bank of Melbourne, believing that they were keeping their money in their state. So, so customers or clients do, in fact, discriminate against banks. banks. Certain banks are particularly more popular than others, and it's true to say the Commonwealth Bank has been a popular bank since its establishment in 1912. And given this, it's then incumbent upon the government to state clearly that the, the fate of the equally vital Commonwealth Development Bank. And this bank has had a very special and significant uh, part to play in particular for the National Party because uh, its history goes, goes back to its establishment of, of a by the National Party leader, Artie Fadden. It was described by Fadden as a vehicle to provide, and I quote, uh, provide finance to assist primary production or the establishment of the industrial undertakings uh, in cases where the provisions of finance is desirable and the finance would not otherwise be available on reasonable and suitable terms and conditions." Unquote. The Charter of the Commonwealth Bank placed emphasis on, on uh, small undertakings even when the borrower's security did not meet the requirements of the other banks. And the bank uh, was established in January 1960. Um, but, but the, as pointed out by, by um, Senator Calvert quite well, that while the share capital of the Commonwealth Bank uh, Development Bank will will continue to be 91.9 per cent owned by the Commonwealth Bank and 8.1 per cent owned by the uh, by the government or by the Commonwealth. The explanatory mem memorandum, in fact, states that the bill does not define the future of the Commonwealth Development Bank, that the Commonwealth Bank Sale Bill 1995 does not define the, the annual subsidy agreement for, for the Commonwealth Development Bank. These arrangements will be defined in the shareholders' agreement to be entered in, into between the Commonwealth and the Commonwealth Bank before the transfer time. So what it really is revealing, it, it, it seems to be laying the foundations for the Commonwealth Bank to walk away from the subsidy arrangements and terminate 
the specialist lending facilities of the Would Commonwealth the Development Senator Bank. Please take a seat. Those uh, subsidy arrangements are critical to the charter of the Commonwealth Development Bank. In 1994, the annual re report records that the Commonwealth Development Bank received a subsidy of $20 million um, in the year ended 30 June 1994, and in the 95-96 budget papers shows that a similar su sum of money will be provided. Um, more specifically, in the uh, 1995 annual report, the Commonwealth Bank states of this subsidy, this vital subsidy, that the subject, it is subject to the outcome of, the, of a government re review. Its uh, $20 million subsidy remains subject to the annual appropriations of the government. So you can see the setup, because in the same report, buried in the same report, is an even more telling comment. Uh, entitled Looking Forward, um, the 1995 Annual Report, it, it really does tell the story. It, and I quote, it, it says halfway through a sentence, however, as noted at page five, the future of the Development Bank is currently the subject of review by, by the government. Now, it is doubtful that the Treasurer would tell us anything um, about the future of the Commonwealth Development Bank as he is given to misleading us over the very sale of the Commonwealth Bank. Because back in September 1993, uh, Mr Willis reaffirmed his very strong position he'd taken in relation to the government's commitment not to and never to reduce the Commonwealth's holding in the Commonwealth Bank. In a letter, in a letter which was then included in the prospectus for the sale of the second tranche of the Commonwealth Bank, it was included in the prospectus. Mr Willis assured the pr prospective investors, and I quote, the government has no intention whatsoever of further reducing its shareholdings, unquote. And of course, it only took one budget after that before the government put the bank up for sale. Nevertheless, we asked the government, what is the future of the Commonwealth Development Bank? The last thing we want the, la the last thing we want is the government to do to the Commonwealth Development Bank what they've managed to do to the Australian Industry Development Corpora Corp Corporation. The privatisation of the AIDC uh, rivals the very fiasco of ANL, which we debated in this House just a, a, a week ago. As the Parliament would be aware, uh, in relation to ANL, that as each day ticks by, an agreement is, is, is not achieved between the Commonwealth and P&O and the unions, I suppose, as the third party, the taxpayers lose $2 million. And the government, in relation to AIDC, the government got halfway down the track to privatising the AIDC with the sale of some 20 per cent of shares into private hands when they announced a complete turnaround and renationalised or attempting to renationalise the AIDC. And who knows what its future is? But clearly, those that happen to have purchased the 20% uh, in the corporation are the losers. And particularly now that those minority shareholders are under pressure to accept an offer or see the government withdraw its guarantee by um, 1998. It's worthy to note. It's, it is very worthy to note that while those minority shareholders are are looking like losers in this debacle, the, the board, board and executives are not. After uh, 1994, when the, government, uh, when the decision for sale was, was uh, certain, the board decided to hand out pay rises of up to 200 per cent and more, um, and in particular the chief executive went from $320,000 to $1.8 million in one hop. And that, that was um, a similar, similar increase to other key staff. Now, just to put that in perspective, that pay rise, for this losing corporation— they have, I don't think they've made a profit in the last five years, Senator Kernow. Were you aware of where they've been lucky to have made any significant profit at all? in the last five years and certainly don't measure up to our major corporations such as 
the National Bank, or Coles Meyer for, for that matter, but did you know that the chief executive of the AIDC earns more than the chief executive of Coles Meyer and the National Bank? By a long shot. By a long shot. The chief executive of uh, the AIDC is the eighth highest paid executive in, in Australia, while the National Bank chief executive is the 19th. So that's the, that, 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 that's the scale that the chief executive of the AIDC puts himself. It may well be a debate for another occasion. But the point is that um, it, it, it is a fiasco and it, it, it is a, a debacle and it is the shareholders who are the losers. And the parliament can see just from that alone that this government has a very sorry record when it comes to asset asset sales and privatisation. Because since 1991, uh, when, when basically uh, this privatisation program gathered its, mo its momentum, through to 1994-95, uh, in each budget announcement they have never reached their target. In 91, they budgeted for some $1 billion worth of asset sales and they achieved $162 million. In 91-92, they budgeted for some $625 million of asset sales and they reached half that figure. In 92-93, they budgeted for $1.6 billion worth of asset sales and they reached $800 billion. In 93-94, they uh, budgeted for a very ambitious $2.4 billion and of course they didn't get even close, close to that figure at all. It's worthy to remind the government that the sale of the Commonwealth Bank was used uh, in the government's last budget as the deciding factor, late as it was, but the deciding factor to bring the government's budget into surplus by some or $718 million. Now, while that announcement was always recognised as an attempt to gild the, gild the lily, right from the very start, the actuals are now in since that budget, and the budget has not and will not re re reach its, its surplus. And we know that for a fact uh, simply on, uh, on the, on the, uh, that uh, in October the Secretary of uh, the Commonwealth uh, Minister for Transport, Mr O'Keefe, introduced um, legislation to obtain the Parliament's approval to appropriate additional monies to meet essential and unavoidable expenditures additional to those already appropriated in 95-96. So, so they're already looking for some $917 million extra. Now th this is made up not only of a slower growth rate and, th and therefore um, less revenue, but of course the failure of the AIDC's um, sale of, of some $200 million has contributed to, to a government now that is not look like it's going to get its $718 million surplus, but probably the reverse, probably a $718 million deficit. And yet that, that was the, the sale of the Commonwealth Bank was key to the government's budget strategies. Now, with the deregulation of the financial sector in the 80s, it was inevitable that the bank would and should be privatised. We support that. It enters the, uh, the market as one of Australia's top four banks and uh, is pretty well set with, with its uh, healthy financial position to take number two after the National Bank, if it already doesn't hold that position. I, I believe a, a, a competitive and efficient Commonwealth Bank through privatisation will further add to bank competition to the long-term benefits of client and shareholders alike. Nevertheless, even with an unbridled Commonwealth Bank in the marketplace, it is critical that the banks are subject to the strongest competition. Now, we had a taste of that from the Commonwealth Bank itself when, uh, after the PSA had produced its uh, uh, bank charges report, calling upon the banks to show some discipline in re relation to client charges, that uh, in a very short time, less than a month, the Commonwealth Bank put up its charges, which, which didn't, didn't make for much hope in self-regulation. And it was only because the parliament 
and the government had some control, some shares still left in the Commonwealth Bank, that they were able, able to pull them into line to reverse that, deci that decision. But, 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 uh, it is, it, is, it is most important that, 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 therefore, once we lose that control now, that we have proper competition in the financial sector. And that competition, Senator Kerno, will come and must come from the regional banks, which are surely uh, producing a great deal of competition for those larger banks. So, uh, therefore, one of the most tangible benefits of deregulation of the financial sector has been the rise of the smaller banks and the regional banks. And the first major test in this sector came some months ago when Westpac uh, made a takeover bid for the Western Australia's Challenge Bank against the New South Wales uh, smaller regional bank, St George Bank. Now, to say the least, this caused ripples in the financial markets, as it was to set the stage should that takeover be uh, unfettered um, to set the stage for the big four to take over all the regionals and therefore, without doubt, lessen competition in the financial sector. The matter was referred to the Trade Practices Commission, the, the now ACCC, on the grounds of Section 50, lessening competition. I'm pleased to say that while that particular takeover bid was given the green light, the um, Trade Practices Commission, or the ACCC as it is now, laid down future competition rules. But this takeover gave them the opportunity to lay down future competition rules. And, and fundamentally, uh, the decision was to uh, protect the smaller regional banks as they were seen to, to bring uh, competition to the, market, to the marketplace. At least one state must have one major regional regional bank. In my state it will be the, the Bank of, of Melbourne. So on balance the decision was good enough and it will keep the banking sector healthy and, com and competitive. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, that being the case, the Coalition do, do support, as, as Senator Calvert has said, do support the sale of, of the Commonwealth Bank. And, but, however, in, in the committee stages, we will vigorously pursue the question of the Commonwealth Development Bank. And I wish, uh, and, and I wish the, the, the Commonwealth Bank and the shareholders and its clients well as it enters a new era. Senator Kerno. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Well, it's clear that today we're debating the last step in the government's uh, total privatisation of the Commonwealth Bank. Uh, I remember being here to see the lot of it. I mean, people have talked about the way in which the, the Labor government's changed its policy on this. What we're seeing here is another example of this government's bailing out of its responsibility in this area for short-term dollars. Now, there are often good reasons for supporting the sale of assets. The Democrats can't see too many good reasons for supporting the sale of the Commonwealth Bank. Most people seem to have caved in to the privatisation argument in this country. But when I'm asked, why don't you just give in, why do you continue to oppose some of these things, I say, despite what you've said, Senator McGoran, the evidence is that the recent history of banking in this country has proven it to be non-competitive. The Reserve Bank said so itself. The recent history of banking has highlighted the need for proactive government intervention to improve competition. Senator McGoran tells us competition will come. They told us that in 1983. Deregulate, they said. Competition, improve consumer services, it will all come. Well, it's 12 years down the track and we're still waiting. Now, in an uncompetitive, non-competitive environment, Democrats believe the government has a responsibility, it has a role in setting some standards. Now, if we take the example of superannuation and its recent history in this country, the only way the government could get the superannuation funds to deliver a fairer deal on fees was by threatening that they would use the taxation office as a competitor. That's one reason why we believe the government should not give up one of the few means of influence it has over banking in this country. A little bit of the politics of this bill is interesting, I think. It was included in the 1995 budget. 
it seems, at the very last moment to allow Treasurer Willis to announce the magic but deceptive and illusory surplus. I am told it was included in the budget only after the opposition leader gave a nudge and a wink behind the Speaker's chair to agree not to oppose it. This sale of one of the most important and influential assets of this government, of this country, was announced without ever being considered by the backbench of the government or, as I understand it, by the backbench of the Liberal and National parties. And in voting for this today, I wonder if Labor senators will reflect that they are dismantling one of Labor's proudest legacies, the legacy of Andrew Fisher and King O'Malley, the People's Bank. Now, I accept that times change. However, in the case of this sale and this bill, it does represent sanctioning, watering down of ALP policy and breaching an undertaking given to earlier purchases of Commonwealth Bank shares that government ownership would not be reduced. Those who vote for the sale of the Commonwealth Bank will be placing small business and farming finance in limbo by also agreeing to sell the Commonwealth Development Bank without its future role being finally resolved. Those who vote for, for this bill will also be sanctioning that it's okay to give up the scope for governments to possibly influence competition in the banking industry by allowing the Commonwealth to run on lower margins, lower fees, more innovative products and greater accountability to consumers. And I recall in the last election campaign the very important commitment given by the ALP in response to fight back that the ALP was not in the wholesale, wholesale privatisation business. It's a bit hard to remember that, isn't it, when we've had a and &L and uh, uh, airlines, air airports uh, in the Senate in the last week. Then we've got the opposition, and true, the opposition's made no secret of their long-term plan to sell the Commonwealth Bank. But the National Party has always expressed concern about what that could mean for the Commonwealth Development Bank, the farmer's friend, the lender of last resort to farming and small business communities. Now, in the debate in the other place, National Party frontbencher Mr Bruce Scott said, and I quote, that the sale will almost certainly have an impact on the nation's rural and small business people, end of quote. And that, I quote, it represents another slap in the face for those people and their families who have plunged ever deeper into financial and social crisis over the last 13 years. But guess what? He voted for it. And Senator McGoran, I bet you do too, despite all the vigorous questioning you're going to undertake in the committee stage. And I'll tell you why the National Party will vote for the sale of the Commonwealth Bank, which includes the sale of the Commonwealth Development Bank, because to them they have to have to have this view coalition stability is more important than the concerns of their constituents now the democrats believe that the commonwealth development bank is too important an institution to be trifled with and the bill before us repeals the legislation governing the role of the development bank as the lender of the last resort and the provisions underpinning the government subsidy to the bill. We're told that these provisions will be subject to a memorandum between the bank and the government at a later stage. Well, in this committee stage, Senator McGoran, you might like to pursue this line of question because I wonder if you've seen the Commonwealth Bank's 1995 report. I wonder if you would agree with me that the bank doesn't seem to be terribly keen about being saddled with the low margin nature of the development bank's activities. The Commonwealth Bank Annual Report notes that the development bank is, and I quote, currently the subject of a review by the government. The bank's objective remains to achieve a proper commercial balance between the consequences of the charter and the size of any subsidy received in support of it." End of quote. Now, the message there is clear. It's clear to me. The bank will be putting pressure on to maximise the subsidy and minimise the obligations to assist rural and small business operators. 
Now, I just wonder if the National Party do really want to assist by acquiescing in what is clearly the first stage of the dismantling of the development bank as we know it. I'll give you an opportunity to vote for our amendment, Senator McGoran, because under our proposal we want to guarantee the future role of the Commonwealth Development Bank. Under our amendment, it would not be swinging on the breeze, depending on bank management and the Federal Treasurer to hold their word on it. Rather, we would propose by our amendment that the role could not be changed without the approval of Parliament itself and, through Parliament, the input of affected rural and small business sectors. So let's just see when the vote comes how genuinely concerned the National Party is about these sectors. So let's just see whether it's a matter of mouthing a platitude and then voting differently and hoping that people out there in the bush won't notice. This sale bill is also the opportunity to see how seriously we feel about corporate honesty and behaviour. And there's been a lot of talk over the lifting of standards of corporate behaviour, particularly in relation to undertakings in prospectuses, etc. Well, here we have a majority shareholder, the government, in selling its shares, going back deliberately on a commitment it gave just 20 months ago that it would not sell its, sell its share in the bank. Thousands of mums and dads, investors all over Australia, lined up to buy Commonwealth Bank shares in the knowledge that the government had given an ironclad guarantee that government majority ownership would be preserved, along with the guarantee. Then Finance Minister Ralph Willis, in a letter included in the prospectus, said, and I quote, the government has no intention whatsoever of further reducing its shareholding. What a joke. 20 months. This was confirmed in LAW law in the Commonwealth Banks Act, Section 27L, which requires the government to remain the majority shareholder. But today, as I said, 20 months later, we are asked to repeal that section. We are asked to sanction Mr Willis's breach of an undertaking on which many shareholders probably acted in purchasing their shares. Now, a lot was said at the time by, I remember, Mr Peter Costello saying that if Mr Willis were the director of a private company, he'd be facing an Australian Securities Commission investigation and a possible five-year jail sentence for a possible breach of section 996 of the corporation law for false and misleading statements in a prospectus. Now, I'm not a legal expert, and while there is an argument that technically the government is not in breach of the corporation's law or the trade practices law, it remains the case that it is a very poor example to set for the private sector. Company directors would be entitled to ask why it is that someone who's running the company, the country, doesn't have to comply with the kinds of laws that someone running a company has to. They'd also want to know why, after making such a fuss, the opposition has backed down and decided to sanction this by voting for this sale bill. What sort of message does that send to the corporate sector? That it's okay to say anything in a prospectus? As I said at the beginning of my speech, the Commonwealth Bank could play a significant role in forcing the pace of competition in the market pace. A government-controlled bank, not required to maximise profits, could set new benchmarks in terms of maximising service and value for money. In the past, with its commitment to housing finance, to promoting household savings, to maintaining a presence in country towns, to looking after small savers and small businesses, the Commonwealth Bank did indeed fulfil this role. Now, I really, we, all over Australia, people are asking, who is going to do it now? With financial deregulation and corporatisation, Commonwealth Bank has progressively shed this traditional role. Democrats think that's been a tragedy. But to go to the economic arguments, the Commonwealth Bank is a very profitable institution. This year, its after-tax profit was just under a billion dollars. In the previous four years, it averaged an annual profit of over $600 million. I mean, that is an income stream that is owned by Australian taxpayers. In selling off the bank, 
the government chooses to deprive Australian taxpayers of that income stream. And what's worse, as Dr John Quiggin and Professor Bob Walker have pointed out, in privatisation decisions, this government and other governments are forced to sell their assets for much less than their net present value to the government because of the different taxation and borrowing status of would-be private investors. So not only do we sell it off and lose the income stream, we sell it at a lower price than it's worth, losing a second income stream. In selling the Commonwealth Bank, we lose the potential to influence the behaviour of our banking market. And why shouldn't we be worried about that? We lose the potential to keep the biggest and most popular personal banking house in this country from exposing itself to corporate and merchant banking in an inappropriate way. We lose the potential income stream. We kick sand in the eyes of rural and small business borrowers and we sanction what some people have called a massive deception of shareholders acting on a prospectus in recent Australian corporate history. And for the Democrats, they are some very good reasons for voting down this bill. As I say, I really urge National Party senators who have voiced concerns about this, I urge those who are interested in public finance and corporate governments, I urge those who are interested in improving the competitiveness of our banking sector to join with the Democrats and the Greens, Senator Harradine, in voting this bill down. On the opposition's second reading amendment, I make the, just the following few comments. On Part A, uh, the role of the Commonwealth Development Bank being ill-defined and should be included as a schedule, well, Democrats share the concern of the opposition in that respect, but we believe the Senate should go further than a mere second reading amendment and legislate to ensure that the Commonwealth Development Bank can't be watered down by the bank itself or by a future federal treasurer. It doesn't take long to learn in this place that treasurers don't keep their commitments on things to do with the Commonwealth Bank, for example. In this case, a commitment not kept for more than 20 months. If the Treasurer did keep his word, this bill wouldn't be before us today. So while sympathetic with Part A, I don't believe it goes far enough. Part B, I wonder if this is a misunderstanding. Senator Calvert's not here, but no doubt he can tell me. As I understand it, the probable buyback will require the approval of 75 per cent of shareholders. I think this uh, hardly places it in the category of compulsory acquisition. And I don't think, therefore, that the case for this clause, uh, part, part B of this amendment, has been satisfactorily made out. On part C, the potentially retrospective nature of the regulation-making power in this bill has been already the subject of a report by the Scrutiny of Bills Committee. The Democrats don't accept the government's argument that the government wants to grant this power to ensure that if it makes a mistake, because it has cut so many corners on the sale processes already, it can retrospectively fix them. I don't think it's appropriate. It sets a bad precedent, even if the regulation is disallowable. I wonder why the opposition um, wishes to proceed with this item as a second reading amendment, rather than as a bona fide amendment, as suggested by the scrutiny of bills. So the Democrats can't support this second reading amendment uh, in its present form, particularly Part B. However, I just reiterate, irrespective of a successful second reading amendment, we should not be voting for the sale of the Commonwealth Bank. Senator Ochi. Mr Acting Deputy President, the Commonwealth Bank was founded in very different times from these today. It was founded at a time when it was thought appropriate to have a government-run bank. And there was a lot of merit in that proposition. But, Mr Acting Deputy President, what was appropriate in the 30s faces grave difficulties when confronted by the realities of the 90s. And it is a reality that the world, in terms of the financial world, is becoming increasingly internationalised. Be it for good or for ill, those are the facts. And the suggestion that we can somehow return to a situation where 
uh, the Commonwealth could print money, as some people advocate to me in letters, or that we should have a bank run by the Commonwealth which somehow sits apart from the mainstream banking world and yet is a broad-based retail bank is unfortunately an untenable proposition. And the facts are that we have to recognise the change in the international financial situation in the same way as it is impossible these days to defend fixed rates of exchange, so too it is unrealistic for us to say that we believe that the Commonwealth Bank should somehow remain some protected fiefdom, whilst all around it banks are changing, growing and getting more power. And one of the grave dangers, Mr Acting Deputy President, is if we take the view that the Commonwealth Bank should be kept as a government-run entity we run the very real risk that one of our major Australian retail banks will fail to have the opportunities to develop overseas in the way that other Australian banks are at the moment. And one looks at the recent purchase by the National Australia Bank of a $2 billion banking operation in the United States to see how the opportunities of that bank existing in the private sector have resulted in more power, more leverage for the Australian banking sector overseas. And in an international world, that is necessary, Mr Acting Deputy President. So there are sound reasons why the Coalition supports the general thrust of the privatisation of the Commonwealth Bank. But there are points that should also be made about this privatisation. And when the government first floated its stake in the Commonwealth Bank, it gave undertakings that it would not float a further stake. And then that undertaking was broken. That undertaking has been broken to the detriment of shareholders that went into the first tranche. And given that, I think there is a very clear message in terms of the manner in which the privatisation should proceed. When the rest of the government's stake in the Commonwealth Bank is sold, it must quite clearly be sold as one tranche and not as two. And why do I say that? Well, very simply, the role that the government should place on whichever bank does the privatisation must be a very clear one. It must be, as so far as possible, to maximise the sale proceeds for the Commonwealth and also for the Australian taxpayer. And if you sell it as two tranches, then demand for the first tranche will be depressed because Every buyer who goes into that first tranche knows that there is a further tranche in the wings, that there is additional supply, and therefore institutional demand for the first tranche of shares will be lower. And it's quite reasonable to say, Mr Acting Deputy President, that by selling it as two tranches you could well end up with a result which is 5 to 10 per cent less than what you would achieve if you sold it as one tranche. Now that's based on an assumption that it's possible to sell all of the remaining stake in one tranche. But if one looks at the market around the world for privatisations at the moment, which is ferocious, there is a voracious appetite out there for uh, stakes in newly privatised government business entities, then it is perfectly reasonable to say that it, it is achievable that we could sell the remaining equity in one tranche. And certainly I know from my contacts in the banking industry that that is a view that many banks have, that it should be sold as one tranche, and that is something that the government should take into consideration. But I want to make a point about the timing of this sale, Mr Acting Deputy President, because last week those of us in the opposition were treated by, to an extraordinary display from the minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cook, who rose to tell the Senate that the opposition, he said, was financially and fiscally profligate for the simple reason that he claimed that the opposition would hold up the sale of the airports and therefore would damage the bottom line position of this year's budget. It was Senator Cook's assertion that the coalition would damage the budget outcome for 1995-96. 
Now, fortunately, my friend Senator Short rose and corrected Senator Cook and pointed out that, in fact, the sale of the airports is not scheduled to occur until 1996-97. In other words, there is no damage being done to the bottom line of the budget. And of course, we all know in relation to the sale of the airports that, that can go ahead as soon as uh, the government wishes to meet the concerns that we and the opposition have. We're not blocking it. We're merely saying that it's appropriate for the parliament to place some conditions on these things. But I want to point out what was said by the government a couple of weeks ago to those banks who made presentations in relation to this privatisation. Because Mr Willis had all the banks lined up here in Canberra. They all came down and they all made their presentations suggesting how they believed that this privatisation should take place. And in the process, those banks were told by the Treasurer, when they asked about the timing of the float, that it would not occur until after the election, irrespective of when that election was held. Now, on the assumption that the earliest date that the election could be held is now somewhere around about March, and given the election could now be as, as late as May, because the government has already said they're going to put off the budget until August. It is blatantly obvious to anybody who makes the, the slightest inquiry that this sale of the Commonwealth Bank will not happen this financial year. And why is that important, Mr Acting Deputy President? I'll tell you why that's important. Because in the budget that was delivered in May, the government relied on selling at least one tranche of the Commonwealth Bank in this current financial year. Now, the estimates of the value of the, the remaining equity in the Commonwealth Bank range from $4 billion to $5 billion. And assuming that the first tranche was less than the second tranche, which is one of the things that one have to, would, would probably have to do in order to, to maximise the overall return on the assets, it is very clear that by the government's own delay, this budget will have between $1.6 and $2 billion punched out of it, because the sale of the first tranche of the Commonwealth Bank will not occur this financial year. And I want all the scribes in the press gallery, Mr Acting Deputy President, to take note of the fact that this government's budget will be in deficit not because of anything that the coalition has done, but because the government itself was incapable of proceeding with the, private, the remaining privatisation of the Commonwealth Bank as it planned. So I predict quite confidently that the budget deficit outcome for this financial year will exceed $2 billion in the red because of the additional spending pledges that have been made by the Prime Minister and because of the fact that just a couple of weeks ago the Treasurer told the banks bidding for this privatisation it would not occur until after the election. It is totally impossible to expect that even a portion, even the first tranche of the remaining Commonwealth equity in the Commonwealth Bank could be sold in three months. Assuming an election was held in March, the new, new government would be, would be in, in office by, by the beginning of April. But that would only give them April, May and June in which to not only plan out and implement the sales strategy but also bring that money in to the Commonwealth coffers. It is quite obvious that this government, through their own ineptitude, has now punched a $1.6 to $2 billion hole in the Commonwealth government's budget position. And I believe that that's a fact that Australians should be made aware of because there is a reason why this government has delayed this sale. And that reason is simply this, that the government had no intention of bringing that money into the budget this year. The government's intention always was that it would occur in the next financial year, hence the statement that it will be sold in two tranches, one this financial year and one next financial year. It was always the intention that that stake would be sold in the next financial year, and it was always the government's intention to include in the budget estimates money that they knew they would never get in so that they could say to the Australian people, we have produced this year a budget surplus. But it was a surplus in estimate only and a dishonest estimate at that, because the facts are that it will not happen. 
And of course, next financial year, the government was rather hoping that they would be elected and that they could bring in the same, the same sale proceeds into the budget twice and say, in the next financial year, aren't we wonderful financial managers? We've achieved such a great turnaround on the 1995-96 result, which of course was always going to be a deficit. And that's the reason why the government has done it the way it has. And that is the reason, Mr Acting Deputy President, why the Commonwealth was unwilling to put an actual estimate on the value to the budget this year of the sale of the Commonwealth Bank. They didn't want to put an accurate figure on it because they knew that then it would be possible for the opposition to quantify the amount of money that would be lost from the bottom line position before we got to the election. It was always intended to be an exercise in deception. But, Mr Acting Deputy President, from a government which has excelled at deception, what should surprise us about that? And so we see this lovely little fiscal charade from the government, where they pretend to privatise something this year, privatise it the following year, bring the figures into the budget twice, make themselves look, look like angels when, in fact, we know that there's something <laughs> Far from angels, Mr Acting Deputy President, when it comes to fiscal management. That's been the strategy of the government. And of course, there is one other factor which has been behind the government's thinking on this, and it is quite simply that the government knows that amongst its voters, amongst its heartland, the sale of the Commonwealth Bank is a very, very contentious issue. That there are many people who form the view that the Commonwealth Bank is rather like the family silver, that you shouldn't sell it. So rather than having an unseemly factional brawl in the ALP in the lead up to the election, what did this strong, this, this, this uh, powerful government that was going to exercise national leadership in the interests of all Australians do? It put it off. It put it off. Because it was the easy thing to do. Rather than making the tough decisions, rather than seeing that privatisation occur this financial year, rather than seeing it happen before the budget, the government decided, well, we'll put it off. It helped them dodgy up the figures for the budget and it helps them avoid contention in their own party and amongst their own supporters for what they are doing to the Commonwealth Bank. And that, Mr Acting Deputy President, exposes the duplicity and the dishonesty of this government that they are unwilling to tell the Australian people what they are doing, they are unwilling to be honest in their budget estimates, and they are unwilling to make the tough decisions necessary for the future of this nation. And one of the things that gravely disappoints me is that this government has so far squandered the proceeds of asset sales in recurrent spending. In other words, assets that have been built up through taxpayer contributions through investment by government, have been built up and put away and saved, have been squandered, wantonly squandered, to pay for government election promises, to pay for recurrent spending, not to pay for infrastructure, not to be reinvested in new assets, but to be used to fund this government scheme or that government scheme so they can run around and wring their hands and say that they're concerned about Australians. The real concern, if this government has a sense of conscience, the real concern for Australia should be shown and should be achieved by reinvesting the sale proceeds, as the coalition is committed to doing, or by paying off government debt, not using it, not squandering it on, on, on a political holiday, which is what we are seeing at the moment. The future of this nation, Mr President, is such that Australia's fate is in the balance and a continuation of the fiscal profligacy of the Labor Party can only result in one thing, a lower standard of living for all Australians. The Commonwealth Bank sale, just like the sale of the airports, is proof that Australia needs sound financial management. And instead of seeing a, a wanton and willful and wasteful Labor government, Australia needs a coalition government now more than any time in the past, a coalition government that will make the right decisions for the benefit of all Australians and not just for the benefit of the Labor Party's factional, factional uh,
disputes. That's what we need. That's why this government is shameful and wasteful, and that's why they must be thrown out at the next election. Senator Margetts, I'm, I'm taking it you don't want to take up your right to speak at this stage. I, we'll, I will take it up when the, sure. it uh, reconvenes. We'll <laughs> wait for a couple of minutes and well, for about 51 seconds. Questions without notice. <coughs> Senator Short. Thank you, Mr. President. My uh, question uh, is to Senator Cook, representing the Treasurer, and uh, I refer him to the. Uh, Order. And to make about ministerial arrangements. Order, Senator. Yeah, it's just. <coughs> it's uh, further arrangements. Leaves granted, Senator Evans. Further arrangements announced on 14 November I inform the Senate that the Senator McMillan will remain overseas on official government business until the 28th of November will therefore be absent from question time today and tomorrow. He is visiting Washington to participate in discussions with agricultural leaders and to lobby for Australia's interests during the finalisation of the new farm bill. In his absence from question time today and tomorrow, I will continue to take questions on trade. Senator Collins will represent the Minister for Communications and the Arts and Senator Bolkus will represent the Minister for Admin Services. Thank you, Senator. Senator Short. If you'd like to start again, please. Thank you, Mr. President. My uh, question is to Senator Cook, representing the Treasurer. And I refer to the fact that uh, in the last few days, two of Australia's most respected business leaders have given the Keating uh, government uh, the thumbs down. Uh, first, the uh, retiring Woolworths chairman, Paul Simons, uh, saying that the uh, economy is fragile. And uh, yesterday, the uh, ANZ uh, Bank uh, chief, Don Mercer, attacked the government on its uh, superannuation and microeconomic uh, reform uh, policies and its inability to deliver a responsible surplus, uh, budget surplus. And I ask the minister, why should the Australian community not believe Mr Mercer when he says that the government's failed policies are likely to cause a rise in interest rates next year? The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cook. Mr President, uh, of course the government doesn't uh, speculate in interest rates. Senator Short knows that. This is a provocative question. He is playing politics once again. It's got nothing to do with real information. Mr President, uh, however, uh, Don Mercer did say a few things about the Australian economy yesterday. And uh, if the opposition, as it sometimes does, describe the Australian economy as highly vulnerable, then I wonder how they would rate an economy with an average growth over five years of 2.5 per cent and inflation of 10 per cent. How would you rate an economy of that sort? Order. But uh, that's what their leader, Mr Howard, achieved when Order. he was Treasurer, Mr President. Under his economic stewardship, the average real economic growth rate was 2.5 per cent and the average inflation rate was 10 per cent. Later this week, the Australian Bureau of uh, Statistics will release the latest uh, national accounts data. After four years of continuous economic growth, these data are expected to show that the economy has chalked up yet another quarter of economic growth. And all the signs are that the economy is set to continue growing, not just for several more quarters, but indeed for several more years yet. Even with the uh, recent moderation in growth, Australia, it should be noted, still has one of the fastest growing economies in the whole of the OECD. And, uh, Mr President, the transition to long-term sustainable growth is now being reflected in the economic data. These data show activity moderating in some sectors, of course, such as housing uh, industry, but as well and as well in some of the regions. However, one of the hallmarks of sustainable growth is that those parts of the economy with moderating levels of activity are matched by others in which activity is growing strongly. Uh, for instance. As housing construction started to decline late last year, non-dwelling construction began to pick up and is now growing strongly. 
Robust exports and rural recovery are also showing important sources of strength to the economy. The transition earlier this year from extremely high, unsustainable levels of growth to more moderate but still strong levels is only now being reflected in the labour force data. That's because employment is a lagging indicator. It provides a better measure of where the economy has been in the recent past rather than where the economy is now or where it will be in the future. Mr. President, in this question, Senator Short also referred to superannuation. And, uh, Mr Mercer made some remarks about superannuation uh, in his Business Sunday interview yesterday. What should be remembered that, that Mr Mercer was speaking for the banks. The banks have an obligation to their shareholders to make a profit and distribute the profit to their shareholders. Superannuation funds, to whom he wasn't so kind, have an obligation not to make a profit and through their trustees to distribute the, uh, the advantages to their members. And that's an important distinction when one goes into the debate about whether banks should have a bigger role in superannuation as opposed to industry funds. But, Mr President, uh, the position of industry funds in the superannuation industry must also be kept into perspective. Data from the ISC show the total superannuation assets currently are around $190 billion and that industry funds have assets of around $9 billion. I conclude uh, this facetious uh, unanswer to this facetious question by saying that, uh, that uh, yesterday we had Mr Howard saying that there is not much fat in the economy to, to cut out in terms of the budget because uh, the fat that existed 10 to 15 years or so ago has gone. I remind the Senate who was Treasurer 10 to 15 years ago. John Howard. Who cut it out? We did. That's why there's not much fat now. Yet at the same time, in contradistinction to his leader, we have Mr Costello running around Australia making flagrant uh, promises of new expenditure while opposing over the last four years $11 billion plus the uh, in, terms time of, uh, in, in terms of uh, in terms of budget, in, in terms of budget time income, has expired. Supplementary, Senator Shaw. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Well, I, I note from that further blustering attempt to uh, <laughs> to uh, hide the, the, the issues and gild the lily that the that the uh, Senator Cook has again failed to uh, provide any substantive answer to the the questions that are put to him. And I note, in particular, that the minister has not denied. Uh, Mr Mercer's uh, contention that on the government's uh, present uh, policies, interest rates are likely to rise next week, despite the fact uh, Mr. President, that they are already amongst the highest in the Western world. And I repeat to him again the question, I give him another chance at it, how is the government going to achieve Order. an underlying uh, economic policy framework that will avoid interest rate increases inevitably occurring next year, as will be the case under their present policy stance. The minister, well, nice Senator try, Mr. Sh President. Senator same question, different uh, clothing, but the same intent. You know, and, uh, and uh, you know that every responsible government minister will not engage in speculation about the direction of interest rates. And for every commentator that says one thing in the community, Don Mercer being among them, other commentators say another thing. And, uh, and I, can point, I can point you to a body of different commentary, none of which I, well, none of which I endorse because I'm not going to be drawn this matter. Now, Mr President, the question is who are the better economic managers? We have the coalition lying to the Australian community about how they'll balance their budget by saying, uh, by saying they will not cut anything but by nonetheless giving away billions of dollars of special pleadings to interest groups while at the same time blocking $11 billion plus dollars of income to the budget. Now, how you work that out, Mandrake couldn't solve that problem, and no serious economic commentator in this country regards you of having any credentials at all on economic management. Every time your leader, Mr Howard, is asked about what's his economic policy, all he does is launch another expired. truck. Senator West. My question without notice is to the Minister representing the Minister for Social Security, Senator Crowley. Minister, I understand a study. Order conducted in the United Kingdom has found that Australia has one of the best and fairest systems of family assistance in the world. What information are you able to provide about the report and its findings? The Minister representing the Minister for Social Security, Senator Crowley. Uh, yes, Mr President, I am uh, very pleased to be able to tell the uh, Senate about a very interesting and very timely piece of research uh, coming out of the University of York in the United Kingdom, which is very good news for this government's policies and programs for families. 
The findings, um, written in particular by Dr Peter Whitford, Whiteford, are reported in the latest issue of the Social Security Journal, published by the Department of Social Security. And if anyone wants to really um, uh, get a quick skim over what this uh, uh, report is about, then they can read Ross Gitton's article in the Sydney Morning Herald today. He's actually had a very close look at it, and he actually concludes that our system does more to direct assistance to low-income families than any other system examined. Now, the other systems examined included um, Australia, studies of Australia, New Zealand, Japan, United States, Norway, Sweden and the 12 uh, countries of the European Union. And unlike a lot of other studies that we've seen recently, this study included uh, a whole variety of benefits, all cash payments, tax allowances for children, assistance with housing costs, assistance with childcare costs and the impact of the spending on health. And what uh, this uh, uh, study shows is that the package of cash benefits for low-income families in Australia was 47 per cent above the average for those 18 countries. It also found that the uh, low-income working families in Australia paid the lowest uh, level of direct taxes, which is income taxes and social security contributions, of any of those countries. So it is a, a, a very encouraging, in fact I think a very big tick in favour of this government's policies of targeting and directing its payments and its assistance to those most in need. If you want to compare a family with two children earning half average weekly earnings, um, pay only 40 per cent of their income tax, 4 per cent, sorry, only 4 per cent of their income, tax, income in tax in 1992, that is about half the tax burden of a similar family in the United States, one third the level of Japan or the United Kingdom, one fifth the level of New Zealand, France or Germany, and less than one-seventh of the taxes in Denmark and the Netherlands. So it is um, a, a very, very important and very useful article indeed. As um, the article by Ross Gittens goes on to point out too, that it is, uh, should be a very big challenge. Well, he doesn't say this, but I do, concluding from what he says, a very big challenge for the opposition's policies. A very big uh, challenge, because uh, there is in the Lions Forum document uh, recommendations for how it would be best to proceed by part of the opposition on behalf of the opposition in terms of family policies including a case made for the French quotient system. But this article points out that that's a sleight of hand and the opposition seems to have bought it. That is, because the taxes are low, the social security payments are— well, no, that this is exactly what's so good about this article, Senator Abetz, Mr President, through you. You should uh, go and read the article because what it allows you to conclude that though on, uh, it's true that French families on average earnings pay no income tax, they do have to pay hefty social security contributions. And uh, were we to introduce a quotient system, the loss of income tax revenue would be so great that we'd have to introduce a GST to pay for it. In other words, the overall impact would be purely cosmetic. And he, uh, the article goes on to say, we could make our family system more generous to high-income families, but only by making it less generous to low-income families. That doesn't make sense to Ross Gittins. Order. It doesn't make sense to the government. It does apparently make sense to you to redistribute away from the low-income targeted payments this government has along the income-splitting proposals. Senator Hill knows that we're into in you are looking at income-splitting, and you are also looking at the French alternative under the Lions Forum. This article, this article is absolute confirmation that the way the government is doing it is the best, and it is particularly advantageous for low-income families in this country. Senator Hill. My, my question is to the Leader of the Government in the Senate. And I, refer, I refer to the South Australian United Trades Order. and Labor Council document leaked last week that let the cat out of the bag on Labor's intended fear and loathing campaign, Order. of there course consistent with the right. WA union blockade and Jenny George's stated intent to maintain, maintain industrial action up to the election, of course followed by the national strikes last week. I ask, how can, how can the ALP support a Order campaign of industrial relations disruption at great, at great cost to innocent parties, as justified for political gain? Doesn't a campaign of fear and loathing to frighten voters debase Australian politics? Why doesn't the Prime Minister show some national leadership and contest the issues rather than scare voters into submission? Or is it that Labor has in fact run out of ideas and all that you are left with is the option of a scare campaign? Order. The Leader of the Government of the Senate, Senator Mr. Evans. Mr President, so I sense a certain wistfulness on Senator Hill's part when he talks about this campaign because it's well known that Senator Hill couldn't inject fear and loathing into even a rabbit or a sheep or a lamb. 
were a kitten in the community. You couldn't leave a mark on a soft cushion in terms of record so far. And I can understand. I can understand. I can understand the degree of difficulty you would have in an aggressive Order. campaign by anyone about anything. And I can understand that that causes you a bit of psychological difficulty confronting that possibility. The truth of the. The truth of the. Order. I see. I see. That's another McDonald. A big steaming McDonald. Order. And Senator. Mr. Just withdraw that, will you? I've made a comment on that before, and I ask you to withdraw it. Well, steam was coming out of his ears, and it was Senator Macdonald, but I, in deference to you, I withdraw it. <laughs> Mr. President, the um, order. I haven't seen order. And could I suggest, if you answered the question rather than heaping abuse on the person who asked the question? Well, it was a silly, it was a, it was a silly empty, opportunistic question, Mr. President, and it deserves an appropriate answer. The um, kind of campaign that was mooted in that document, as Senator Hill describes it, I haven't seen it, is a fairly routine kind of an exercise so far as the trade union movement is Order. concerned. It's perfectly understandable that uh, trade unions, feeling themselves to be potentially under siege by Tory governments, both at home in South Australia and potentially here, although God knows why they should assume there's any prospect of that nationally, would want to, would want to act to preserve their position, just as the ACTU did and the relevant unions in the mining industry in Queensland have wanted to do. The uh, trade union movement no, trade union movement is perfectly entitled to defend its position. It's appropriate that it do so by time-honoured methods, not methods Order. that uh, are at odds with uh, larger community values or which cause havoc and disruption on a larger scale than is necessary to make the point. But there will always Senator be differences Ralston. of opinion about that. A little bit of uh, rhetoric, a little bit of hyperbole is to be expected in these situations. There was no more than that, I'm sure, in this situation. Senator Jones. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is directed to Senator Schott, representing the Minister of Employment, Education and Training. I refer the Minister to various claims about the problem of youth unemployment and alternative approaches to address this, this problem. And I ask, can the Minister provide details of how the government is developing measures to alleviate youth unemployment? The Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Education and Training. Thank you, Senator thank, thank, Order. Thank you Mr Senator President. Shot. First of all, the government has always put on the record that we believe uh, unemployment and youth unemployment in Australia is unacceptable, unacceptably high. However, we do want to just put down some of the remarks made round the place and comments, particularly by members opposite about the uh, level of uh, youth unemployment in Australia. The fact that full-time teenage unemployment rate is 29 per cent does not mean that 29 per cent of Australian teenagers are unemployed. That's because only 25 per cent of teenagers were available for, for, for full-time work in October. 55 per cent were in school and 13 per cent were in full-time post-school education. What we should focus on is the 95,600 teenagers looking for full-time work, which is 7.3 per cent of the teenage population. And it's worth noting, of course, that we have in government reduced this number from John Howard's 158,000 in 1983, which amounted to over 12 per cent of, teen of the total teenage population being unemployed. Mr. Mr. President, we have made, I think it's time that, the, that uh, the public understood that there is quite a difference in the way the opposition has been misleading, uh, the, uh, in making misleading comments on unemployment. We have, uh, through our Working Nation statement and Working Nation policies, that the number of long-term unemployed uh, for young people has fallen 10 per cent over the year to October 1995. However, we do want to bring it down even further, and that's the thrust of the Working Nation, the Working Nation initiatives. And last week, the Minister Cream released the results of discussions with 700 young people around the country about employment and labour market programs. These consultations show that young people want more traineeships in growth areas, more options for vocational education and training at schools, and better service from the CES. The Minister has indicated that, all of the, that he's looking at all of these things to improve further how we can address these issues raised by young people. He's already expressed a willingness to encourage the use of schools more effectively to provide pathways to work. We are expanding the options for Year 11 and 12 students to pursue more vocational streams of education. 
we are increasing the opportunities for school leavers to go to university, TAFE or structured training in a job. Last financial year, 69,500 trainees and apprentices commenced work, nearly 5 per cent more than in 1993-1994, and since Labor took office we have increased school retention rates from 40 per cent to 75 per cent and university places by 64 per cent. The point we make all about this, we have not heard once from the opposition, though they are greatly critical of the working nation, what they would replace it with, what they would do to create youth unemployment. The last policy we have announced from the opposition is, of course, that they will reduce the youth, the youth wage to $3 an hour. That is the last time we have heard any policy initiative in three years and over three years from the opposition about what they would do for young people in employment in Australia. The last effort they made, of course, was to have we had a youth bus a couple of months ago heading north with uh, the young boys on the bus from the Liberal Party, Order. Chris Pine and Senator Campbell. And now we have the youth truck wandering around Australia, again putting forward this misleading information that 29 per cent of all teenagers in Australia are unemployed. In fact, it's only 7 per cent of all teenagers in Australia. Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Evans, as Leader of the Government in the Senate. How valid is the claim that the Camalco dispute has been settled when the picket at Weeper continues to be in place? Is it not a fact that the unions have now ignored three Commission recommendations that they disband the picket and return to work? Does the Government condemn this defiance of the Commission by the trade union movement? And furthermore, doesn't this represent the dramatic failure of your industrial relations policy and further proof of the determination of Jenny George and the ACTU to stage an Order. ongoing industrial campaign designed to bring the country to its knees Order, industry Senator by Cook. industry? The Leader of the Government of the Senate, Senator Evans. Well, Mr. Mr President, Order. of course we uh, would Cook. wish that the striking workers uh, well, Senator Abetz is not even interested in the reply. Of course, the, we would wish that the striking workers would return to work as soon as possible in accordance with the Commission decision. Uh, and uh, of course, it is the government's position that they should do so. My understanding of the ACTU position, contrary to yours, is that, uh, as stated by Mr. Kelty, the striking uh, miners have decided not to return, a week, to return to work until the ACTU Disputes Committee reconvenes early this week. And Ms Jenny George, the ACTU president-elect, is um, expected to speak to them at Weeper on Wednesday to try to convince them to return to work. That's utterly at odds with the imputation contained in Senator Abetz's question that the ACTU was in fact determined or concerned or keen to keep this particular dispute going. That's not the case. The ACTU is committed to getting back to work. We obviously want the issue resolved, as does the ACTU, before the Commission, and of course the Commission's orders and directives should be respected. <coughs> Supplementary, Senator Abetz. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I wonder if the Leader of the Government uh, can recall the words of uh, Bill Kelty when he said that the disputed weeper was about the heart, soul and purpose of the trade union movement in this country. Given that the Government has an accord with the ACTU, how much input does the Government have to the ACTU policy in relation to the disputed weeper? The Minister, Senator Evans. Yes, I do recall those words being used, and of course it was about the heart and soul of the union movement, as perceived by the union movement, and to some extent, so far as the government was concerned, to the extent that what was on at Weeper was an exercise in trying to basically de-unionise a mine force and to reduce over time a capacity for collective bargaining to take place at all in circumstances described by the uh, business press as uh, entitling uh, the workers to be concerned about the long-term implications of what was going on. So, of course, it was a legitimate issue for the trade union movement to respond to, as was the associated issue of equal pay for work of equal value. They are the issues that are being resolved before the Commission at the moment. That principle has been accepted uh, by the Commission. The ACTU has won the case already so far as the basic issues of principle are concerned. Well, all that remains to happen now uh, is for the issue to be resolved in terms of the dollars and cents and the particular situation of the particular workforce. And the ACTU right. has made clear its willingness to try its best to ensure that they get back to work as soon as possible. And Ms George will be speaking to them with that uh, in mind uh, later this week on Wednesday as I make clear an answer to the first part of the Senator question. Lees. Thank you, Mr President. My question is also uh, to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Evans. 
<coughs> Minister, I refer, refer you to the undertaking the Prime Minister has given to protect forests of high conservation value, and I ask, are you aware that many of these areas, the most valuable areas in East Gippsland, are outside all existing reserve systems? And in particular, that if you look at an area in East Gippsland, indeed if you look at all of Far East Gippsland and plot the remaining rainforest, most of it is outside the reserves. If you then plot on top of that the endangered species habitat and then line up the coops scheduled for logging this year, you'll find that they all correspond. In other words, are you aware that the Victorian government has scheduled many areas of very high conservation value for logging this year? And finally, will the federal government prevent the clear felling and wood chipping of any more rainforest in East Gippsland? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Evans. Well, Mr. President, Senator Lees will appreciate that these matters are being considered by Cabinet right now, um, and it is a little inappropriate under those circumstances to respond specifically to any particular question about any particular areas and the maps and the regimes that may be associated with them. All I can say generally is, as she will be aware, the public consultation phase in relation to the Deferred Forest Assessment exercise um, in Victoria finished on 3 November. During that phase, Commonwealth and Victorian officials held consultation meetings with conservation industry and community groups on the draft TFA report. Those meetings were held, I'm told, in a very good atmosphere, constructive and cooperative. A number of submissions have been received, some of which are quite detailed. The relevant officials have now started preparing a final DFA uh, report addressing those issues. Um, stakeholders have been given uh, maps, more detailed maps, and arrangements have been put in place for similar maps to occur in the final DFA report. On the endangered species issue, which Senator Lees is uh, obviously particularly concerned about, I'm advised that uh, as one would expect, a number of these issues have arisen during the consultation period I've just referred to. In Victoria, the issues uh, have involved further and will involve further consideration on the adequacy of prescriptions for species such as Leadbetter's possum, the long-footed potteroo, the spotted tree frog, the regent honey eater and the swift parrot. Also three species, the vulnerable variegated pygmy perch, the vulnerable uh, Yarra pygmy perch and the endangered pink-tailed legless lizard were not specifically referred to in the DFA report, and they are being they are, several members of the opposition could uh, will satisfy that description. They're not specifically referred oh, yeah. to, particularly late at night, in some cases after lunch, but they're not specifically referred to in the DFA report, and they're being checked to confirm whether their habitat would be impacted on by forest operations. There are other uh, things I could tell you about the um, conservation reserves and the Commonwealth proposed criteria, including the fact, of course, that they adopt the Commonwealth's uh, criteria very from the technical working group position that they adopt the general benchmark of 15 per cent uh, rather than 10 per cent, and they set specific targets for percentage reservation of old growth and wilderness. You ought to be familiar with that, um, and in any event it doesn't go other than indirectly to the immediate point of your question, but I don't think it's really possible to give you a complete answer until after the present uh, decision process is complete, and Senator Faulkner will no doubt be delighted to give you an answer in Parliament sometime next week on that subject. Supplementary, Senator Lees. Uh, I just remind Order. you, Minister, that we won't in fact be sitting next week, but I do look forward to seeing uh, the results of de deliberations. I wasn't asking you for the results, however. I was more looking for information as to whether you in particular, as a Senator of Victoria, um, have had the opportunity to look at what is actually happening in East Gippsland. So perhaps as a supplementary, I can ask you, have you seen the results of rainforest logging in East Gippsland? And in particular, uh, if you haven't, would you be prepared to do so during the Christmas break? Minister, Senator Evans. No, I haven't done that uh, for many, many years. And um, in fact, what I've just said more than exhausts my knowledge of uh, the present situation with the forests in eastern Victoria. But I, uh, that's an excellent suggestion of uh, Senator Lees in that respect, and I'd be only too happy to find an early opportunity to do so when the uh, when the electors of Holt will allow me to escape from their restrictions for time enough to uh, address these larger policy issues. <coughs> Senator Newman. Order. Thank Senator you, Mr Yim. President. My question is directed to the Minister for Defence. Minister, how do you respond to the comments made by General John Gray, your former Army Chief, who has said that Australia could not defend itself against a prolonged attack because of funding shortfalls and warped priorities? In that it's not only our Army that is having trouble, what priority are you giving to resolving the crisis in the Air Force over the loss of its air traffic controllers? What are you going to do to stop the continuing hemorrhage of experienced air traffic controllers from the RAAF? And will you be asking the Singaporean Air Force to bring its own air traffic controllers to RAF Pierce so that Australia can keep its air force in the air? The Minister for Defence, Senator Ray. 
Well, in terms of General Gray, uh, Mr. President, you can't please all the ex-generals all the time. In regard to air traffic controllers, uh, the greatest effect, the greatest effect that uh, is going to, the greatest thing that's going to affect the Air Force's air traffic controllers is a requirement by the CASA, I think it's now called, for 400 new air traffic controllers by 1998. And uh, the differential, the differential in salaries between uh, Air Force and, uh, and this body, after they have been through their administrative training, is between seven and twenty thousand dollars a year. Therefore, uh, there's nothing that we can do, in a legal sense, to prevent people transferring from the Air Force across to uh, CASA. However, I have had uh, extensive discussions with them, both the Minister for Transport and uh, the head of this particular body, the executive head of this particular body, to see if we can cooperate in such a way as uh, those sort of deficiencies that will be caused by that recruiting will not harm the Air Force. Um, uh, the first way we, of course, responded was to increase the amount of basic recruits that are coming into the system. And by next year, we'll be taking in something like 48 recruits a year, which is quite up on what was done in the past. Um, it would be uh, cost ineffective if you just did that and lost them. The second thing we've talked to uh, CASA about is even if they recruit them, that they return those people to cover the areas they're currently uh, servicing until, they, until the, the need arises in 1998 for them actually to go to that body. And that will do a lot to relieve the strain. It's interesting that you mentioned uh, would Singapore bring its air traffic controllers they're having the same retention problems as the Australian Air Force. Same difficulties, if not more exacerbated than we ha have here in Australia. So the answer to the particular problem, because uh, you raised the specific problem, is cooperation between the Air Force and CASA to make sure they have the planned needs of all around Australia. So there's no advantage to CASA in the long run in taking away Air, Air Force traffic controllers that control skies around Townsville sector 8 around Sydney or to around Darwin, because they'll ne need themselves, if we can't supply air traffic controllers, to do that themselves. And I think the final point that we are looking at, we haven't ruled out retention bonus, even though as a principle I prefer not to get into that area. I don't think it's ever been wildly successful in the past. But secondly, we were looking to restructure the career paths that people take. And that may well have three streams over the future. Uniformed, across to civilian but restaying within Air Force, which will give more stability as to posting. That is, start in uniform but eventually go to serve the Air Force um, in uh, civilian and civilian conditions. The second stream may well be go into the Air Force and then eventually go into the CASA operation. And then the third stream will be those that want to stay in uniform all the way through their careers and will provide the future leadership. It is, uh, those sort of specialist areas though, are going to present a challenge to defence as long as we remain one of the great training institutions in this country. And some of the other institutions of this country, some of the other institutions of this country, I think are going to have to learn to do more of the training themselves than they have in the past, rather than try to poach off Air Force or some other military unit. Supplementary, Senator Newman. I thank the Minister for his answer, but of course he doesn't address the loss of experience, it's simply the uh, the uh, need to uh, recruit more people, which of course doesn't give him experience levels. Can I ask the minister, by way of supplementary, is it correct that the number of air traffic controllers lost from the RAF is in the order of 60 to 70, and that not all of them have gone into the uh, air traffic control jobs in the civilian sector? Is it also correct that six, Sector 8, based at Sydney, which controls Richmond, should have 11 people, but currently only has five? And is it also correct that RAF Pierce should have more than a dozen approach controllers for its day shift and may be down to just two by the middle of next year? Is this the magnitude, the magnitude of the problem? Does the minister have any sense of urgency about it? I didn't see any indication of that from his laid-back answer. The minister, Senator Ray. Well, it's rather ironical that we get the more substantive part of the question in the supplementary, five questions to be answered in a minute. But what I said to you in terms of Sector 8, etc., what, what action we've taken is to sit down with uh, CASA so to make sure that these areas will not be deprived if people move out. And you are right to suggest that some people have moved out of air traffic control completely into other careers. But I mean, that's natural. They're doing that 
or in the civilian and the military area. People do change careers. Not everyone will stay in the same career all their life because um, that's, the, that's, the, that's the trend of modern society. So there's nothing in my answer uh, that was intended to mislead by saying that they're all going to CASA. Some just go out and create a new career. And uh, the point that you've made, that it's not the overall numbers but some of the more experienced people, is right. It is crucial that you don't lose your most experienced people, those that will be training and in fact developing those new recruits through. And that's where our efforts are being concentrated. Senator Margetts. Thank you, Mr President. My question is directed to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Evans. I refer to the announcement <coughs> yesterday of the Prime Minister's initiative for a nuclear weapons free world. And whilst I welcome Mr Keating's apparent conversion to the peace cause, I ask, do the comments in relation to the cessation of the production of fissile material outlined in yesterday's media package indicate that the government is prepared to reconsider its position in relation to uranium exports? And does the minister agree that the quid pro quo in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty with respect to the provision of uranium and nuclear technology to NPT signatories actually provides for the potential for non-weapon state to quickly move to nuclear weapons capability? This reality will require the Canberra Commission to totally reassess the effectiveness of the NPT as a vehicle for the elimination of nuclear weapons. The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Evans. Well, I'm glad that uh, Senator Margetts supports the uh, Canberra Commission on the Elimination of Nuclear Weapons. We even had a grudging acknowledgement of its utility from uh, Alexander Downer, which is a world first, and uh, I thank him for that. And I thank Senator Margetts for her support. I think it is potentially one of the most important initiatives Australia has ever taken, uh, in the sense that if we can craft an agenda for the step-by-step -step reduction of nuclear weapons. Presently there are 50,000 uh, warheads at large in the world maintaining security as we go and creating a situation ultimately of zero and hopefully sooner rather than later, then we will have made a massive uh, contribution to making this world a safer and saner place. And I believe that that objective is not only uh, desirable but attainable. And I hope very much and I expect uh, that this commission, comprised of the extraordinary array of extraordinarily highly qualified people, uh, will make a major contribution to setting that agenda moving forward. As to the implications of all of this for uh, production of fissile material and uh, other matters, including the export of uranium, um, certainly one of the things that uh, it's hoped that the Commission will consider is the virtues of a convention for the cutoff um, on the production of fissile material, thus ensuring that no further uh, such material is produced in the future. That should not be too hard a convention to actually negotiate, and preliminary steps have been taken toward that at the moment, because the truth of the matter is that none of the existing declared nuclear weapon states, including France, are presently engaged in the production of fissile material. And that consideration ought to put at rest uh, a concern that was expressed again, I think, last week by a number of uh, members and senators about the possibility of Australian or anyone else's uranium, for that matter, notwithstanding the safeguard system, ending up in the production of uh, military fissile material. The truth of the matter is that there's no grounds for concern about that because existing stockpiles unhappily are such, so extensive, uh, that as far as I know, and certainly this is true for France because it's been publicly confirmed, uh, no such uh, mis material is being produced, nor has it been since 1992. So under those uh, circumstances, um, there doesn't seem to be uh, any case at all uh, for concern about the way in which the uh, IAEA, IAEA safeguard system is working under the existing Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. The NPT will go on being, whichever way you look at it, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty will go on being an absolutely crucial element in the total equation if we are ever to achieve a nuclear weapons free world, as I certainly hope we can. The notion that there's somehow um, something not very helpful or about the uh, NPT, which seems to run through a lot of questions that come out of the, uh, the Greens and others in the community, really does quite fundamentally miss the point. As I've said on many previous occasions, um, without it, I think we would have been looking at a world with 25 or 30 nuclear weapons possessors, nuclear weapons possessors at the moment rather than the five declared states that we have at the moment, plus, of course, a small number of uh, threshold or twilight zone states. As unsatisfactory as the present situation may be from a number of different points of view, 
and I don't think anyone could be totally comfortable with all aspects of it, in particular the attitude of the, some of the nuclear weapons powers. Nonetheless, it's far and away the best system that we have. It was crucially important that the NPT be extended indefinitely, as it was in April, and that's one of the foundation stones on which, undoubtedly, the uh, Canberra Commission will be building as it erects its plan for achieving a nuclear-free world. Senator Margetts on a supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, don't count your chickens, Minister. Um, Despite statements to indicate that the government believes that nuclear weapons are illegal under international law, the proposed terms of reference of the Canberra Commission specifically call for the maintenance of stable deterrence. Won't the nuclear weapon states and the threshold states perceive that Australia is once again dancing to the tune of the nuclear weapon states? The Minister, Mr. President, as I have exceedingly patiently sought to explain on previous occasions, those propositions are not inconsistent. If you are talking about deterrence into the hereafter or strengthened deterrence, as Mr Chirac and uh, Mr Major were in their joint communique a few weeks ago, you would have much to complain about. But if you are talking about maintaining a system of balanced deterrence while the world moves back to zero, ensuring that in the process there is no great disparity between the nuclear weaponry available to the major powers, you are simply talking good sense. And in the submission that I made to the World Court arguing for the illegality of weapons here and now, it was a corollary to that submission that the court find or make a finding, make a direction that in achieving the reduction of nuclear weapons, it was not an obligation for any state that could do so to do it overnight, but in honouring its commitment required by customary international law, we argued, to zero, it could sensibly get there step by step, and it, would, and it should sensibly get there in an environment where the balanced deterrence principle was maintained. They are not incompatible the propositions, and I think that is very well understood. Senator O'Chee. Mr President, my questions to the Leader of the Government in the Senate. I refer to statements on Friday by Labor Party politician Mr Graham Campbell, in which he said the real Australian was Anglo-Celtic, that a racist was someone who won an argument with a multiculturalist, and in which he said Australia was about to be overwhelmed by Asian migration. He also asked Australians against further immigration to direct their preferences to the Labor Party. Will the Prime Minister now ensure that Mr Campbell is disendorsed as the Labor candidate for Kalgoorlie at the next election. The Leader of the Government of the Senate, Senator Evans. How the, order. How the Labor Party treats its own is none of your business, uh, Senator O'Chee, and nor will it be ever. Uh, how we react publicly to statements of this kind is, however, uh, something that should be put on the public record, and I say, frankly, I react to them with nothing short of disgust. They are utterly at odds with the principles that have been articulated by the order. Labor Party over many years. They are absolutely at odds with the current policy of the party, and no doubt this is an issue that will be further considered by the party in the light of what I have just said. Sub order. Mr. President, order, 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 order. Just take your seat until there's quiet. Order. Senator Collins. Senator Chief. Supplementary question. Supplementary. Mr. President, earlier on this year, the Prime Minister accused the Leader of the Opposition of being weak because he didn't sack a coalition senator fast enough. And now, now, given that we know that the Prime Minister lacks the courage and the strength Order. to sack Mr Campbell, and it's now quite obvious that the Prime Minister would rather tolerate Mr Campbell within the Federal Parliamentary Labor Party than take a stand against bigotry, I ask what credibility can the Prime Minister's statement on multiculturalism have this coming Friday, and why should anybody believe a party that has such blatant double standards on racial uh, tolerance and discrimination? <coughs> the Minister, Senator Ray. The senator which you were referring Order. was, as I understand it, an office holder within the party. That's not the case for Mr Campbell. He's unlikely ever hold an office of any uh, significance within uh, the parliamentary party or within the parliament, I think. Um, and under those circumstances, Order. the options available to the Prime Minister are extremely limited. He can only operate within the parameters of the party institutions, namely the National Executive of the party. No doubt that's an issue that will be further considered by the National Executive, as it has been in the past. <coughs> Senator, sorry, Senator Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Primary Industries and Energy, Order. Senator Collins. Minister, I recall that in August this year, at the meeting of the Agricultural Ministers, you launched the Rural Part Partnership Programme. Yes, I did. know this programme gives rural communities the opportunity to put together proposals for change which reflect the key issues that they face. 
Can you inform the Senate of the progress of this uh, program and which communities are now benefiting from this approach? The Minister for Primary Industry and Energy, Senator Collins. Certainly, Mr President. I'd be uh, glad to provide the Senate with that information. Perhaps Senator McGoran can tell us what he's doing over there and providing us with some information. Are you going to launch those, are you, Jules? Oh, this, oh, this. Senator, Senator Brownhill's paper. Oh, no. paper. Oh, no. Did you get on with the answer? Mr. <laughs> Mr. President, uh, the Rural Partnership Order. Program is, is, was designed to, it's very distracting, designed to uh, transform the way governments do business with uh, rural Australia. It provides uh, an opportunity for communities to put their collective knowledge, skills and uh, experience together to de deliver sustainable uh, development in their regions. The program has been developed cooperatively through ARMCANs, that is with all of the other uh, ministers for primary industry, regardless of their political affiliations, and it's designed to address nationally significant agricultural and resource management, social and environmental issues. Its most fundamental element is a recognition that people that are living and working uh, in rural areas know more about what should be done to guarantee a sustainable future for that region than anyone else. It follows these, that these people are best placed to develop future strategies in cooperation and with sometimes the necessary support that governments can provide. Mr uh, President, partnership proposals are actively being negotiated at the moment or have actually been implemented in southwest Queensland, the Eyre Peninsula in South Australia, the central west and western divisions of New South Wales, the Gascoigne Murchison region of Western Australia, and the Sunraysia and Murderful regions uh, in Victoria. Mr. President, I'm pleased to advise the Senate that today I've approved a federal government contribution to the Atherton Tablelands region to begin work on restructuring and development of that region in light of the decline in the tobacco industry there. Mr. President, it's useful, I think, to highlight the real efforts that this government is making to demonstrate its commitment to regional development, because it stands in stark contrast to the policy alternatives that are being provided by the Federal Coalition and, of course, most succinctly in that now infamous document produced by the Shadow Minister for Regional Development, uh, Senator Ian Macdonald, which had as its bottom line, and I quote, that the Coalition will in fact make commitments, quote, giving them the flexibility of announcing a lot of major long-term visionary Order. matters, but without committing the Coalition to actually proceeding with them. Now, Mr President, in light of this Order. policy document from Senator Ian Macdonald, I must say that I was intrigued to receive a question on notice from Senator Macdonald recently in respect of another regional initiative which this government is providing substantial funds for, and that is the Wimmera Mallee Pipeline. Oh, I will answer the question. I will answer his question, but it was an intriguing question, the first one I've got in this sort of style, because the question asked Question on notice number 2539, quote, could the Wimmera Mallee pipeline be completed without federal government assistance? Mr President, uh, one assumes that this project will go to the top of the policy mirage created by Senator Macdonald for regional Australia, and this of course stands in stark contrast to the actual funding of this pipeline by this government. It would appear, Mr President, that Senator Macdonald now wants the government through questions order, on notice. Order, Senator Collins, point of order. Senator I think Rolfe. it's abundantly clear that uh, we're not getting an answer to the question here. Uh, Senator Collins has virtually conceded that uh, he'll get back to answering the question when he's ready. And if you're, going to, if you're going to assert any authority on the matter, I would have thought this is a perfect opportunity to do it. Let's have answers to questions and not uh, opportunities for uh, ministers to simply put, put things order. on the table which are utterly irrelevant. Order. So I've indicated before that the, the minister has, in fact, already answered the question. He is, he's enti order. Order. He's entitled to develop his answer if he wishes to. Senator Collins. Mr. President, provided he keeps within the broad I will area. Yes, I will conclude, uh, Mr. President, by saying that it now appears that Senator Macdonald wants the government, through questions on notice, order. to identify regional development uh, initiatives that meet the coalition's criteria for announcement. The minister's time has expired. <clears throat> Senator Chapman. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I direct my question to the Minister for Immigration and Ethnic Affairs, Senator Bolkus. Noting the Minister's self-righteous concern in alleging conflict of interest for practising journalists working for senior politicians, I ask, is it a fact that Mr Hendrik Gout, editor of the Public Sector Review, has been in Canberra working for Senator Bolkus, while Mr Gout still works for Order. the Public Sector Review? Will the Minister provide the details of Mr Gout's current employment in his office? Did Mr Gout inform his review readership of his current dual role as editor of the paper and with the Minister? The Minister for Immigration and Ethnic Affairs, Senator Bowles. Mr. Uh, President, Order. Uh, I'll Order. very Senator gladly uh, make uh, available whatever details of uh, the working relationship I have with uh, Henry Crowder, he has with me. Um, in respect to his uh, activities with the union movement, uh, he and I share a very solid uh, and strong defence of the public sector, and that uh, brings us together on this particular issue. In terms of uh, any ongoing relationship with that magazine, I think that's something he's working out. I'm sure he'll be. Uh, uh, putting forward the facts of that as, uh, as, he, as he defines that relationship. But in terms of uh, my um, working relationship with Henry Gout, I'll come very much to the fore and I won't be uh, forging any overtime documents on his behalf. <laughs> <coughs> Senator Kerno. Mr President, my question is to the Minister for the Environment. I refer the Minister to the CityLink Tollway project backed by the Kennett Victorian Government and I ask, Minister, do you agree that a project with significant environmental consequences and which will attract up to $600 million in federal government tax concessions should be the subject of an environmental impact statement under the provisions of the Environment Protection Impact of Proposals Act 1974? Has the Treasurer or the Development Allowance Authority approached your department to request that an environmental impact statement on the project be prepared under that Act? And as the Minister responsible for that Act, will you be insisting that a proper assessment is done before any federal government money is sunk into this project, a project which the Victorian Government has exempted from much of its own environmental protection and town planning requirements? <coughs> the Minister for Environment, Senator Faulkner. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, Mr President, in July 1994, the Victorian Government announced details about the Melbourne City Link proposal, and uh, at that stage uh, the project included the construction of a southern bypass uh, connect connecting the Westgate Freeway to the southeastern arterial and a western bypass connecting the Tullamarine Freeway to the Westgate Freeway. Uh, the State Government later decided to upgrade and widen the Tullamarine Freeway between uh, Flemington Road and Buller Road as part of the proposal. The Commonwealth uh, Environment Protection Impact of Proposals Act uh, has not been triggered in relation to the Tullamarine uh, Freeway project. I understand that uh, legal advice uh, from the Attorney General's Department to the Development Allowance Authority is that the Environment uh, the EPIP uh, Act uh, does not uh, apply to decisions by the authority in relation to the granting of infrastructure bonds or to development allowance. Uh, in the event that a Commonwealth decision or action uh, is required that is in fact subject to the Act, the Action Minister must decide uh, whether a proposal is likely to be environmentally significant and, uh, if so, uh, to uh, refer it to the Environment Protection Agency. Uh, the Environment Protection Agency would then provide uh, advice to me so that I could uh, make a decision about the level of environmental uh, assessment uh, uh, that was warranted, if in fact uh, environmental assessment was warranted. Uh, any such determination would take account of the uh, potential environmental impacts and the adequacy uh, of uh, any state assessment processes that had been undertaken. And, uh, at this stage, of course, I can't speculate uh, on, uh, on uh, Commonwealth environmental assessment requirements because of the situation that uh, I've outlined. The general principle that you raise, Senator, of course, is an important one, and I think you uh, have seen uh, a very strong commitment on the part of uh, this government and myself uh, as the Environment Minister to uh, ensure that uh, proposals or developments 
that uh, are environmentally significant are subject to uh, the appropriate level of uh, environmental assessment. And that is, of course, a position that uh, I won't be resiling from and, uh, and nor will the government. But in relation to this particular matter, uh, the situation in relation to the triggering of the Environmental Protection Impact of Proposals Act is as I've outlined, uh, Senator, and uh, it is a matter that is absolutely appropriate for the uh, Victorian uh, government to progress to full and thorough assessment of uh, the environmental implications of the project. Supplementary, Senator Minister, Kerner. you say the Attorney General has given you advice that uh, if it's not triggered. Are you aware of the legal advice obtained by some of your colleagues, your Labor Party colleagues, and quoted in the uh, Sunday Age? And this advice indicates that if the federal government grants tax concessions, it does become legally involved in the project and is required by law to fully examine the environmental impacts of the project. Are you aware of that advice? Why is it uh, inferior to the Attorney General's advice? Which advice are you going to act on? The Minister, Senator Faulkner. Well, Mr. Uh, President, I certainly am aware of the very strong level of concern there is amongst uh, uh, members of the, uh, the Federal Labor Caucus and uh, of the Labor Party more generally in relation to this uh, particular proposal. There are very significant uh, uh, concerns. I've indicated to you what the situation is in relation to the advice uh, of the Attorney General's Department to the uh, Development uh, Allowance uh, Authority. And of course, as far as my role is concerned as the Environment Minister, it is appropriate uh, for me to, to act if and when uh, this matter is designated. And I think most people understand that that's the, uh, the situation, Senator, but I can assure you the very strong level of commitment that, uh, that I have and my colleagues have in relation to a proper and adequate level of environmental assessment for this uh, important project is not diminished, regardless of the fact that the first and primary responsibility for that assessment lies with the Victorian Time government. <coughs> Senator Campbell. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is directed um, to the leader of the government in the Senate. I refer to the government's latest cruel hoax, a report to be released by the employment minister suggesting that the government's 5 per cent unemployment target by the year 2000 will require economic growth of 3.5 per cent a year throughout the decade of the 1990s. Given that this government has only managed to average around 2.5 per cent a year economic growth over the first half of the decade and that you are busy slowing the economy down, isn't it simply preposterous to suggest that the government has a snowflake's hope in hell of achieving the necessary 4.5 per cent a year average growth over the second half of this decade? The Leader of the Government of the Senate, Senator Evans. Well, for Snowflake and Hill, we're not doing a real bad job, according to The Economist, uh, this week, where in Australia was, forced to be the far was forecast to be the fastest growing economy of the major 15 OECD countries in 1996. And that, of course, would be a continuation of the record that we have been able to achieve so far. Employment uh, will continue to grow through the rest of 95 and 96 and thereafter because the outlook for economic growth does remain very robust indeed. The recent levelling off in uh, employment we see is only a temporary pause, reflecting a lag response, as Senator Cook has already said, I think, today, in the labour market to the slowing in economic growth to a more sustainable rate since late uh, 1994. We're not trying to slow the economy down any further than we did. We did, of course, take the view that it was unsustainable at 6 per cent plus. That view, I think, uh, was universally shared. It had to come back to around about uh, in the uh, three and a half, four range. That's where we hope to uh, have it and to keep it. Employment growth in 95-96 is still expected to be broadly in line with the budget forecast of 3 per cent, with the unemployment rate uh, being expected to fall throughout the rest of 95-96. Uh, the job vacancy rate still remains at a high level by historic standards, and that itself is a, a key indicator of continuing employment growth. We've got uh, in the Accord 8 a specific union commitment on employment growth. Under the new accord, the government and the ACT are committed to creating in excess of 600,000 jobs by March 1999. We uh, have a strong endorsement for the Working Nation objective from the accord. And throughout uh, the last uh, period, and particularly since the last uh, election, 
the, uh, the track record of this government has been extraordinarily strong on employment. We fully expect that process to continue in the future and uh, the unemployment figures to come out in the way that we forecast as being perfectly possible. Supplementary, Senator Mr. Campbell. Mr. President, I, I presume that uh, Senator Evans is referring to so the same Economist magazine that reports Australia as having the highest inflation in the world, the thir third highest interest rates in the world and the fifth highest youth unemployment in the world. But I'd like to refer him to the Business Review Weekly that last week showed in a survey done by Access Economics that out of all of the, nation, all of the OECD nations, only two of them had unemployment that was actually rising. And bearing in mind that Australia's teen jobless rate is 29 per cent, uh, which is much higher than it was when the working nation policies were first introduced, um, could I ask the minister to answer, don't all of these indicators simply prove beyond any doubt whatsoever that your government has any answers for Australia's employment woes or economic woes? and that it really is time for a change of government. Minister, Senator Evans. Mr. President, it's simply not the case that unemployment is rising. One quarter's figures do not a total story tell. The overall trends are what are important. The unemployment rate of 8.7 in October was well below the peak of 11.1 per cent in October 93. The unemployment rate fell by 0.4 in the 12 months to October 95. The number of unemployed in October is 18.2 per cent below the peak that was recorded in October 93, and most importantly of all in that litany, the unemployment rate is expected to fall further to 8 per cent by the June quarter next year. And I ask that further questions, can I? Are we up to time? Yeah. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. You may raise your point of order. No, no. Order. It's before. A oh, sorry, Senator Evans. Sorry, would you like me no, to do this? On the 22nd of uh, November, Senator Campbell asked me, as Minister representing the Prime Minister, a question without notice about the release of a Prime Minister with youth statement, youth unemployment, and youth suicide. I undertook to obtain an answer for Senator Campbell. I'm happy to have it incorporated in Hansard if he's willing for me to do that. I seek leave is, accordingly. Is Thank leave you. granted? Leave is granted. <coughs> Well, after question time on the 23rd of November, Senators Harradine and Heron invited me to reconsider a ruling which I made during the course of question time order to the effect that the use of the name of a senator or a member of the House of Representatives with the implication that a senator was a liar is contrary to Standing Order 193. I have reconsidered my ruling and I believe that I was correct to intervene in the way that I did. Standing Order 193 prohibits offensive words, imputations of improper motives and personal reflections in relation to senators, members of other houses and certain other protected official hold, office holders. Sorry. My predecessors have consistently ruled that it is contrary to Standing Order 193 to make any suggestion that a senator has lied, <coughs> that is, deliberately and knowingly made untrue statements. Past president rulings have pointed out that it is not out of order to state that a senator's statements are untrue or misleading. The offence is constituted not by contradiction of another senator's statement, but by the implication that a senator has deliberately or knowingly made untrue statements. As one of my predecessors ruled, it is for the chair to judge whether this implication is present in any particular instance. Past rulings have pointed out that expressions which may otherwise be acceptable are disorderly when, in their context, they carry the offensive implication that a senator has lied. The rulings to which I have referred are listed at page 232 of the printed version of Odger's Australian Senate Practice, 7th edition. During question time on the 23rd of November, Senator Ian MacDonald interjected to Senator Cook, and I quote, you will just do a Carmen on it. It was clear from the context of this remark that the order that the senator was using the name of a member as a substitute for a direct accusation, order, As a, as a, sorry, that the senator was using the name of a member as a substitute for a direct accusation that Senator Cook would deliberately make false statements. Subsequently, I required Senator Gareth Evans and Senator Bob Collins to withdraw expressions in which they sought to use the name of Senator Ian MacDonnell in the same way. I emphasise that the offence against Standing Order 193 was contained in the, sorry, that was contained in these expressions was the implication that senators told lies. 
Where that implication is present, the expression is disorderly regardless of what substitute words are used. Senators have often used substitute expressions to try to get around the prohibition of, of, uh, on accusations of lying. It is obvious that the chair must intervene when this device is used because otherwise the pro prohibition could be more or less openly flouted. In order to uphold the standing orders and the standard of debate, I will continue to intervene when it is clear that a substitute expression is being used to subvert the prohibition and to make the forbidden imp implication that senators are lying. In the course of question time, Senator Ian MacDonald referred to an answer to a question by Senator Gareth, Gareth Evans, and I quote, as coming from the leader of the party that is seen as the greatest mob of liars in history. As that remark clearly implied that Senator Evans and his colleagues in the, state, in the Senate are liars, I required Senator MacDonald to withdraw the remark. In the noise which followed, interjections by Senator MacDonald and others, most of which are not recorded in Hansard, persuaded me that Senator MacDonald had not said what in fact he had said and is recorded in Hansard. I therefore did not persist with the requirement for withdrawal. Senator MacDonald's expression, however, was clearly disorderly. Rulings of my predecessors have made it quite clear that words which are offensive when used against a particular senator are equally offensive, if not more offensive, when used against a group of senators. Again, the past rulings are recorded at page 232 of Rogers. In concluding this statement, I observed that the Senate has been extremely unruly during question time in recent weeks and it has not been possible for the chair in the general disorder to censure every disorderly expression. I simply say to senators, as I've said on previous occasions, that the recent behaviour of some of them during question time is bringing both those senators and the institution into disrepute. I again appeal for appropriate standards of debate and conduct to be restored to our proceedings. Few senators have not complained at some time about the low standing in which MPs and senators are held by the public Yet in the one hour of question time each day, the activities of a few senators, and I mean only a few, does more to diminish that standing than most other activities at other times. I seem to be taking leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator. Mr. President, I'd like to ask a question to, of you uh, to amplify the meaning of your statement. Am I to read from your statement? That you're, se you're seeking leave to, to to ask a question. To take note. Well. All of right, you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. D does it mean that your statement, in fact, means that you regard the word Carmen as synonymous with lying? <laughs> the answer to that is quite clearly no, and it's obviously no. So therefore, it is not, it's not an offensive <coughs> use of the, of I've, the language? I've made it quite clear. I suggest you go away, read the statement, and it will be quite clear I to you, I listened to it very carefully. That's the reason for the question, Mr President. Well, it is a nonsense question. Let Thank me you, tell Mr. You that. President. Senator Alston, are you seeking can I, leave? Can I have leave to? Is leave granted? Uh, leave is granted. Uh, All right. Well, can I say, can I say this, uh, Mr. President? Uh, as I recall it, uh, why we took exception uh, last week to your statement was that you said that a reference to a senator would be construed in a particular manner. Now, if you'd gone on and said. Uh, a reference which contains an adverse inference or imputation. Now, this looks very important because uh, I have heard this president on a number of occasions get to his feet and lecture Order. us about, about the Order. standing of politicians being held in very low esteem. And I simply want to say this. If you want a, a real understanding Order. of why that might be the case, you ought to reflect on the fact that we are, like any other citizens, uh, when an issue is put to us which we think is exaggerated, or where we think the logic does not follow, or where we take a point of order and we ask for a ruling, we normally expect that there will be some logic in the answer. Now, if you simply say, in answer to a point of order on relevance, I rule that that is not irrelevant, or I, I, I put down your point of order, without giving any reasons, without, uh, in a sense, engaging the questioner, as your two predecessors have done in this place, and I've, uh, I've served under both uh, Senators um, uh, Doug McClelland and Kerry Sybra, and each of those presidents were conspicuous by their willingness to respond constructively to points of order. Now, we didn't expect them to give us uh, 51 per cent, the other side 49, and indeed we'd probably have settled, we'd probably have settled for 70-30. 
But what I do say is that they were able to control this chamber because Order. of their willingness Order. to provide answers that made some sense. And if you are simply going to dismissively ignore points of order or, or, uh, or give answers to questions which suggest that you're not serious about the content of your answers, then you will get what you expect, what others would expect. And I simply say to you, this was yet another example of a situation in which the words you used were so general that they invited people to take issue with them. And if you, if you now, on reflection, uh, appreciate what I'm putting to you, what you should have said and what you should say now is that where it is clear from the use of an expression that it is simply a subterfuge for inferring improper conduct, we can appreciate that proposition. But that's not what you said the other day, and you ought to think carefully about the way in which you respond to points of order on this side of the chamber. Senator, contribute very Senator, briefly to this debate. Senator when you Evans, made, Mr. President, a perfectly Ms. simple, Ms. straightforward. Ms. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator, when you've made, as you have, a perfectly simple, straightforward, and self-evidently compelling statement, you should not have to defend yourself from that sort of second-rate attack, which would be out of place in Senator Malston's more natural forum, the Bundura Magistrates' Court, or wherever it is that he cut his teeth and where he still ought to be cutting them, if that's the quality of his performance. The point, Mr Order. President, as you are acutely aware and is perfectly evident in the terms of your statement, everything that is said in this place has a context, and what determines whether or not it's colourable or unparliamentary or not is the context. And When you responded as you did the other day, you were responding to someone's name being used in a particular context which unequivocally conveyed imputations of an unhappy kind which were manifestly unparliamentary. It was in that context that you, of course, responded at the time. It's not necessary to spell out every detail of an innuendo or an imputation when it's supremely self-evident to all those within your hearing as to what that innuendo or imputation is. You did not do so on that occasion because it was unnecessary. In the terms of the statement you have just put down, you have made perfectly clear that it's the context that counts. You've said that very, very clearly in that statement. I'm one of the uh, persons who uh, bore your wrath the other day when I joined in the debate using exactly the same utterly adolescent and discredited technique which was initiated on the other side, and you, uh, you slapped me down accordingly, but it's perfectly appropriate for you to do so. The terms of your statement are perfectly clear. Let's have no more of this nonsense. You don't need to defend yourself. It's self-evidently a uh, compelling statement. Senator Crichton-Brown, you, you don't need to seek leave because Senator Newman actually moved a, a motion. So. I, thought she, I, th I thought you sought leave to ask a question. No, well, she sought leave to, to take note of the answer, and I, uh, that, that has to be. Uh, okay. She moved, sorry, to take note of the answer. Thanks, Mr. President. Look, uh, uh, I, I, in part, ask you a question, but I also, in part, make an observation. My understanding is that your ruling is not based on a particular name or an inference that that particular person has a reputation for telling untruths, but that. It is, it is a set of words used in the context of challenging somebody else's veracity that leads you to the conclusion that they're implying the name used is the substitution for, for telling the truth or, or claiming an untruth. For instance, it's not a question of somebody having a reputation. There are people in the chamber, in my view, who, who don't have a reputation but deserve one. It might well be that the name Carmen could be substituted for Sue, but I take it that what you're saying is that no name, no name is quarantined from your ruling. You are simply saying that if a name in the context is put in such a way as to draw the conclusion in the mind of a reasonable person that the inference is that, those, that, that a lie is to be told then that is to be ruled um, out of order. And that's what you're saying, sir, with respect. I thoroughly agree. I've never supported the use of the word lie in any context, notwithstanding the precedent set by my dear friend Bill Sneddon in the other place and then stared down by, by the then leader of the opposition or then leader of, no, the then uh, shadow minister for uh, industrial relations, R.G. Hawke, later to be a prime minister. I've always taken the view that it's an unparliamentary language and ought not be allowed, and there ought to be, ought to be no way that any word which implies or 
implicitly suggests a lie ought to be accepted. And I, I hope I say that in the context as one that's had my share of criticism from my own side for being fair and, and, and impartial. <coughs> Senator Betts. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, during the debate that's uh, taken place, I've had the opportunity to read page 232 of Odgers, to which you refer, and uh, you are quite correct, uh, and indeed Senator Crichton Brown is quite correct, that it is for the chair to judge whether that implication is present in any particular instance. But might I suggest to you, sir, that you create a very dangerous precedent for yourself and the other chairs uh, in this Senate, because if for example, during the course of an answer or a debate, a minister or person on the other side is having a difficulty recalling, for example, and somebody on this side were to suggest that that is akin to Carmen Lawrence, people in the chair may well feel that they have to rule that out of order. Because as soon as you suggest that a name becomes synonymous with a lie, you, all, you then take away the possibility of using that name in the context of somebody having a bad memory, somebody being unable to recall. And whilst I agree with the general thrust of uh, your ruling as to the general implication, as soon as you make that ruling, sir, you and all the other people that occupy the chair in this chamber will have to exercise their mind on every single occasion as to whether or not uh, the name Carmen Lawrence is unparliamentary in that particular circumstance. And uh, therefore, sir, it is not appropriate to say that the use of Carmen Lawrence as an interjection is disorderly. It's got to be in the context, and as a result, the chair will now have to consider on each and every occasion whether or not whatever the name being used is uh, reflecting of a uh, lie, of bad memory or incapacity to recall. And I just suggest uh, to you that that creates a very difficult precedent uh, for you and uh, your successors and those who uh, take uh, the position of a temporary chair uh, in this place. <coughs> Senator Heron. President, I, th I thank you for your response to my letter. I do not believe that it answers the question that I posed in that letter, and I will be studying your response carefully, and uh, I expect to be writing to you again for further reconsideration. In, in very brief response, because I, sorry, Senator Ian MacDonald. President, I'm not sure whether I should speak on the motion to take note or uh, uh, in some other way, but uh, Mr. President, I haven't read your statement. Unfortunately, I wasn't aware you were going to be making it. Uh, my staff tells me that my name appeared perhaps uh, more frequently in your statement than any others, and that seems to be part of, part of uh, uh, something that's been happening in this chamber in uh, uh, recent times. Uh, so I haven't had the opportunity of uh, uh, fully reading what you've said, but I did, uh, as I got back to my ho office, um, uh, hear you say in relation to my comment, uh, which I've just got Hansard to look at, and which uh, I said, uh, coming from Senator Evan, coming from the leader of the party that seems the greatest mob of liars in history, that's a bit rich. You said ought to withdraw that. Uh, the Hansard records me then saying, as, what did I say? And you said, uh, according to Hansard, unless I misheard you, you call the other side uh, uh, house of the house liars. And then uh, I'm recorded as saying what I said is allowed. As I recall your statement, and you might uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you then went and said there was a great deal of noise coming from this side, which Senator Macdonald was uh, part of, and most of it isn't recorded. Now, if you did say that, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Uh, President, uh, that, is totally un that, that is totally untruthful, and I demand from you an apology. You might recall, Mr. President, that I was standing on my feet trying to ask my supplementary. There was noise. Uh, it wasn't from me. And I'm not being sensitive about this, but your statement does mention me so many times that I, uh, you know, I happen to just get the feeling that uh, you know, perhaps I should be a little bit sensitive about uh, these things. Now, I wasn't speaking at that time. I was standing here. There may have been other noise. But the imputation from your uh, uh, 
uh, statement, as I, as I recall what you said, and I haven't uh, had the opportunity of reading it, as I say, because it hasn't been published, and uh, I wasn't told that you were going to be making this statement. But as I recall, the imputation was that I was shouting at you at that particular time. Now, I may have been shouting at you at other times, but on that time, uh, uh, that is uh, incorrect. And if that was the imputation in your statement, then I ask you to apologise and correct it. Well, very briefly, in response, I did quite clearly define the reasons last week for the decision that I'd taken, and I repeated that, repeated that definition, having considered it in the statement that I've just made. And I suggest that all senators read it. On Senator Betts's point, it's not a problem, Senator, in my opinion. Your, your contribution was constructive, but I don't think it's a problem. The context is the thing that's important, and it's quite clear to me that some contexts are, in, uh, are breaking that Rule 193 when they substitute the, for the word liar the word of a person, and they're clearly, uh, they're clearly designed to flout that uh, standing order. There are others where it's equally clearly not the case. And as in all things, context is important and the judgment of the chair must come to bear. On uh, Senator Macdonald's point, the statement that I did make, Senator, is that in the noise which followed interject interjections by Senator Macdonald and others, most of which are not recorded in Hansard, persuaded me that the Senator Macdonald had not said what in fact he had said and recorded in Hansard and therefore did not persist with the requirement of withdrawal. There were a number of interjections which were trying to clarify the issue of what you'd said. And as for um, picking you out, I'd, uh, I'd deny that, but uh, I suggest that you might look carefully at your own record uh, and that might, uh, might settle things. You say interjections by we, Senator Macdonald and others, most of which are not recorded. You've already spoken to this uh, resolution. Oh, so you're stopping you, me speaking? No, if you want to seek leave, you can seek leave. You seek leave, leave to leave. query the leave statement is, you've just made. Leave, leave granted, leave's granted. Thank you, Mr President. You're saying interjections by Senator Macdonald and, and others, uh, mm. so, so you say now. Um, and uh, that suggests that I was uh, interjecting uh, quite uh, a lot while you were speaking. What I'm saying to you, Mr Chairman, is that is simply not correct. And I think if you uh, get a uh, copy of the, uh, of the television uh, tape, uh, you'll see that that's uh, correct. I mean, I don't know what it uh, says, but I was standing here trying to ask the question. Now, I'm not unduly sensitive about this, Mr Chairman, but you've mentioned me so many times. Uh, sorry? Order. Not all about anything else. Yeah. Yes, thank, thank you, Gary. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, Mr. President, uh, I, I just, uh, I, I would, what I have said, uh, which you might call as an interjection, is recorded in the Senate, and uh, the suggestion that you make, uh, I think, is uh, unfair. But, and, and I don't accuse you of this, but uh, you know, there's obviously an orchestrated t campaign by Gary and, and the rest of his team, and I would hate you to be drawn into that campaign in the way you responded here. Well, that, it, in, in direct response to that, it was my clear recollection and the recollection of the clerks who advised me. Senator... Point of order. Point of order, order. Mr President. Uh, Senator in, Alston. in the course of Senator Macdonald's remarks, he said quite clearly that he was taking exception to uh, your criticism of him on that particular occasion. And he went on to say, uh, I might have uh, been guilty of um, uh, loud interjections on other occasions, but I wasn't on this occasion. That was the thrust of his remarks. And he invited you to respond to that. And your response to it was effectively, uh, well, look at your own track record. Now, I interpret that as meaning simply I'm not prepared to even argue about what you said on this particular or did on this particular occasion, but because of other events, therefore you're guilty on this occasion. That is, that is precisely the sort of faulty logic that causes us to erupt. Because if you want to say to him, you're wrong, I have a clear recollection and I disagree with you, or let's agree to disagree, or I can't remember, but that's how it seemed to me, I'd understand all of that. But to simply say, when he goes out of his way to say, look, I might have on other occasions, but I didn't hear, and you effectively saying, I don't care about what you did on this occasion, you've done it in the past, that, that breaks all the norms of uh, presumptions of innocence or any other uh, way in which people respond to arguments. And that is why, that is why we do have uh, difficulties with your rulings, because you don't address the issues. You very quickly resort to ad hominem attacks, as that was. Uh, you rely on uh, 
what you call the context of a, an answer to justify uh, what are meandering and irrelevant answers in, on many occasions, in our view, and you never deal with the issues themselves. Well, in, in brief response to that, I made it clear that it was my understanding that uh, Senator Macdonald, along with others, was interjecting, and that was the recollection of the clerks. I'll go back to that and have a look at it. The more general comment was in relation to the more general concern that Senator Macdonald had, and I made that with no malice, and I don't bear any malice to anybody. The, motion, the question is that the motion that, of uh, Senator Newman to take note of that uh, answer be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against, no. Are there any other motions to take note of answers? Senator O'Chee. Sorry, Senator, Senator Crane. Point. Mr. President, Abetz, can you just clarify order. for us whether the taking note of your answer is proposed to be taken out of the 30 minutes or not? No. No, thank you. No. Senator Crane. Thank you, um, Mr. President. I uh, rise to take note of the answer by uh, Senator Evans to Senator Hill's uh, question today, and the substance of that question was to get a response from the government with regard to uh, the fear and loathing campaign, uh, which is outlined in a document from the South Australian United Trades and Labor Council, uh, which was leaked or fell off the back of a truck last week. And I think, uh, Mr President, dealing with this, it highlights well, what has just occurred in this place highlights the type of tactics that are being used now in the parliamentary scene emanating from the Labor Party, which create a situation whereby there is a reaction from this side of politics uh, to the um, dishonesty that has been perpetrated into politics today. And we read through this particular document which uh, we have here, and we find uh, such comments. There are sp specific federal campaigns which unions, the ACTU, the UTLC, are involved in. They mentioned Western Australia, they mentioned uh, CRA um, and others. And we further go into, into this particular document where it also makes reference to running a fear and loathing campaign on individual contracts that we must define the scope of the message very clearly and stick to it. It's nothing to do with the merit of the case that the Labor Party might have to run or the merit of the case that we might have to run. It is to totally run a dishonest, uh, deliberately dishonest campaign with regard to what exists. And we look further into the document here, and uh, it says the initial idea is to play on the mood of tired of change, uncertain, etc. Hidden cameras in the boss's office, as boss threatening workers with new contracts or else. Details of contract are to be out of focus. That's what is in this particular document. And it makes one wonder in terms of the answer to the question, uh, a question of mine last week from Senator Evans himself, when he said the problem with CRA was that they offered too large a carrots. In fact, I'll quote uh, the exact words, initially through the offering of large-sized carrots. That's what the minister said last week. Yet here we have in terms of this particular campaign, and on that, that occasion Senator Evans was absolutely accurate. But we have been confronted with this campaign, uh, this fear and loathing campaign, which is uh, based on the total misrepresentation of what the truths are and the facts of a particular matter is. And it's quite shameful, uh, in my view, in terms of what uh, the South Australian Trades and Labor Council is doing, or the West Australian Labor Council, or even the backing that is coming from this particular government in terms of that campaign. It's time that they came clean on their particular campaigns, were honest about what the situations were, and not have this fear and loathing campaign which exists. And I hope that some of them just had a look yesterday on the Sunday program at the interviews that were done up at Hammersley, a subsidiary of CRA. And I just want to quote, as I remember, they're not the exact words, but they spoke to a contract worker. And what did he say? No longer do we leave our brains on the gatepost as we go to work. They spoke to a unionist. It has been good for us, no strikes, uh, no injury free time or no injuries, record free injury time I should say, and more money. That was from the unionist who said we don't want to go onto the contract, but we work here and it's good for us. And as we work work through this whole process of what's uh, happening in this campaign, first of all in Western Australia, we also see here in today's Newcastle Herald where the uh, coal strike has reached 105 days at Vickery. One has to put to the government how many times has the uh, 
AIRC ordered them back to work, as Senator Evans sitting across there knows, on a significant number of times. But the government has been absolutely quiet, not a squeak out of them in terms of saying, hey boys, it's about time you uh, obeyed the rules of the particular umpire. So I'm bringing this uh, point to the uh, attention of the Senate, and uh, I have to conclude by saying, Madam Deputy President, I think this is probably the lowest that the Labor Party, in conjunction with the union movement, has stepped in terms of dealing with a particular political situation. And I think this campaign, this proposed campaign, should be condemned totally outright. And it's about time the Labor Party became a little bit honest about what they're doing and got back to dealing with issues on their merit. The question is that the Senate take note of the answer. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator O'Chee. Madam Deputy President, I move that the Senate take note of the answer given to me by Senator Evans today in relation in answer to my question. And in so doing, it is worth noting, Madam Acting Deputy President, that Mr Campbell is a member of the government that gave us the racial hatred bill, that Mr Campbell is a member Mr Campbell, Mr Graham Campbell, is a member of the government which, which has berated the opposition that Mr Graham Campbell is a member of the same government that on Thursday tried an appalling stunt in which they attempted to rewrite history over the White Australia policy, which their government invented. And, Madam Deputy President, Mr Campbell is somebody who has consistently and willfully singled out different ethnic groups in this country for his own bile, bigotry and hatred. And it's about time that in the 1990s the Prime Minister showed just the tiniest touch of leadership about the way in which the Australian Labor Party is run. In answer to my question today, Senator Evans said, how we deal with these things is none of your business. It is our business. Mr Graham Campbell went to the Australians against further immigration to spread not only bigotry and hatred, but also, Madam Deputy President, to ask them for their preferences for the Labor Party. And what did Mr Campbell say to Australians against further immigration? He said, there are other people in the Labor Party just like me, and that's why you should give us your preferences. That is the attitude. One or two. Who are the others, Senator Evans? Who are the others? No, in the federal parliamentary party, Senator Evans. And the bigotry, the bigotry that we have received from the other side on these matters is thoroughly unacceptable. It is our business that the standards that people expect of members of parliament are adhered to. It is our business, it is the business of every single member of parliament to fight against hatred and intolerance. And that's what we on this side of the chamber seek to do. What Mr Graham Campbell did was an insult to every ethnic Greek, ethnic Italian, ethnic Chinese, ethnic Indian, ethnic Yugoslav in this country, an insult to everybody who is not Anglo-Celtic. Because in Mr Campbell's view of the world, you're not a real Australian unless you're Anglo-Celtic. Not even Anglo, well, Anglo-Celtic is what he said, Senator Bell. And what that says to probably half the population of this country is that they can never truly be Australian. And it's always been my understanding that being Australian was a thing which was inclusive, not exclusive. That a person was a good Australian based on the quality of their character, not the colour of their skin. And yet Mr Campbell wishes to continue with this and the Prime Minister, through his silence, gives tacit support to the bigotry which we have received from Mr Graham Campbell. That is what disturbs me. It is our business. And I don't care what the Prime Minister says to Mr Graham Campbell behind closed doors. What the Australian public demands of the Prime Minister is that in public he stands up against intolerance, stands up against hatred and stands up against Mr Graham Campbell. But the Prime Minister is too weak and too cowardly to do it. 
The Prime Order Minister Senator. will not make a stand Order against... Order, Senator. I think you should withdraw that imputation against... The Prime I Minister. withdraw, Madam Acting Deputy President. The Prime Minister is too weak and too lacking in moral fortitude to stand up against Mr Campbell and his ilk. The Prime Minister is quite happy to have Mr Campbell go and canvass preferences for the Labor Party, but he won't stand up against him on a matter of principle. And it is quite clear that Mr Keating would rather tolerate Mr Campbell's presence in the parliamentary Labor Party than stand up for principle and for what is right and decent in this country. And that is why Mr Campbell should go, and if Mr Campbell doesn't go, Mr Keating himself should tender his resignation to the Australian people as somebody unfit to hold the high office which he currently occupies. question is, same matter, Senator Vanessa. Madam Vanessa. Deputy President, uh, I like to address uh, this question somewhat also, and I was very disappointed uh, to, see, to hear Mr Campbell say what he did uh, last Saturday in Sydney. The point I really want to take up is that uh, he said that the real Australia was Anglo-Celtic. And uh, I take exceptional offence to that. I think uh, Senator O'Chi did point that one out, because uh, he, perhaps he was right in saying it was Anglo-Celtic. It was, was past tense, but it certainly is not now, and I take great exception. Because if I may put, look, point to the Italian community, I believe that between first, second and third generation, there could be up to 15 per cent influence in Australia. And uh, even if they've got that 15 per cent, or even less than 15 per cent, I think for the numbers they've had more influence in Australia, in industry, in the building industry, in the farming industry, even in politics these days. I'm not talking about myself. There is, there is another one in Perth, Italian, that's a member of the WA State Parliament and a minister. And there's other various ones around Australia that I believe have, has contributed to Australia. And by the same definition, even Senator Schott probably is not a real Australian. And, uh, you know, I think he ought to be right, Mr Campbell, for that. But having said that, and the question was asked, why will uh, the, uh, the fourth generation? I didn't quite get to that. Well, if you get the fourth generation German, even they might have half the influence the Italians have got. <laughs> but, but the point is, the question was asked, why will no, uh, the Prime Minister not call uh, for uh, disendorsement of the Labor candidate for the next election? I am sure that he won't call for his disendorsement because the Prime Minister knows that Mr Campbell would probably still win it, uh, win it as an independent. It would be more likely to be won by the Liberal Party should he be disendorsed, but uh, Mr Campbell would have a fair sort of chance of being re-elected, and I know the Prime Minister is not going to uh, uh, take, that, uh, take that chance. But I'm just wondering, Madam Deputy President, if the agenda doesn't go a bit beyond that. I'm hoping I could be wrong in saying what I'm going to say now, but is it the agenda of this government to have a Mr Campbell there happily uh, letting the media call him irrelevant or whatever they like to think about him because they don't think he's really irrelevant in Kalgoorlie, I'm afraid to say. Kalgoorlie is my, my own seat, uh, the electorate that I am in. They don't really think he's irrelevant in Kalgoorlie, but I'm wondering if the government is really happy to have him there and then go out and canvass these issues that uh, if there is Australians, uh, you know, there are some Australians that think that the, the Labor's immigration policy is not what they want, whether they can see Graham Campbell or Mr Graham Campbell as a saviour for their thoughts. And perhaps that's why the Prime Minister is not happy or not prepared to call for this endorsement. I hasten again to say I hope I am wrong in that matter, but while Mr Campbell is there and Mr Keating hasn't said anything yet about him to my knowledge, I know Senator Evans uh, said what he said at this question time, but the Prime Minister to my knowledge has said nothing. Perhaps he's happy to leave him there and hoping that, uh, and he did ask for those preferences that come from uh, Australians against further immigration. 
So it is up to the Prime Minister now to rule out what I've said and also do something about Mr Campbell. Question is that the Senate take note of the answer. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Abetz. Yeah, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I wish to take note of the answer or move to take note of the answer given by Senator Crowley earlier today. This is now the second occasion on which uh, Senator Crowley has used a question from the Labor Party to try to demonise the Lions Forum. And, uh, the, purpose that, the reason I get up today is simply to set the record straight. It is unfortunate that we need to set the record straight, but to uh, simply outline yet again what the Lions Forum is all about. It's a group of members and senators of the Federal, Liberal and National Parties that have adopted the following statement as its motto, the foundation of a nation's greatness is in the homes of its people. And uh, those sentiments are accepted by myself and all other members of the Lions Forum. As their contribution to the International Year of the Family, the Lions Forum embarked upon hearings throughout the Commonwealth of Australia. Such luminaries as now Senator Jacinta Collins, while she was uh, representing the Shop Distributives Union, in fact made a contribution to the hearing. What the document Empowering Australian Families, published by the Lions Forum, did was to set out in summary form a whole host of submissions put to them. The only submissions that they adopted are in fact, Madam Deputy President, shown on the Roman numeral page 7 executive summary. There is no mention whatsoever, Madam Deputy President, of a French quotient system to which uh, Senator Crowley referred to in the Lions Forum recommendations. The French quotient system to which uh, Senator Crowley referred is part of a section in this report entitled Macroeconomic Reform. And there were some other things mentioned under that heading, Madam Deputy President, such things as Julian Disney, who made the following comment. There can be little doubt that at present many one-income families are treated unfairly under the taxation system by comparison with two-income families. And this is after a decade or more of Labor government having control of the, the tax system and uh, the Prime Minister, Mr Keating, having his hands on the economic levers. And under the uh, taxation system, uh, the following example was mentioned. Our current taxation system is one which is based on the income of the individual and it does not recognise the differences in individuals' capacities to pay tax. For example, a single person with no dependents earning $30,000 per annum pays the same amount of tax as a married person who is the sole breadwinner for a family with two children who earns $30,000 per annum. This system is of clear disadvantage to the person who is married with two children, as that person has three dependents, compared with the individual who supports only her or himself. The married person with the children has a different capacity to pay tax, which the individual-based taxation system fails to recognise. The report then, in dealing with that problem, Madam Deputy President, outlines some uh, proposals, and one which was put before the Lions Forum was the French quotient system. Nowhere in the report does the Lions Forum adopt the French quotient system. I must say, reading it, Madam Deputy President, it would sound a very nice and fair system, but given our current uh, economic structure and taxation burden, uh, uh, I doubt that we could necessarily implement that uh, system in Australia. But uh, one thing that uh, has to be recognised is that at least the Lions Forum has acknowledged the very real disadvantage of single income families where the need of children and spouse are required to be met, something that Senator Crowley never seems to accept. This government, after 12 years, 13 years in office, has not addressed those very real problems that are hurt, hurting the battlers within the community. Can I say, possibly more in sorrow rather than in anger to Senator Crowley, 
instead of trying to develop maps to find for men to find their ways around supermarkets, she ought to try to find a map that will show her the way to the truth. The question is that the Senate take note of the answer. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Petitions. Senator Campbell. I wanted to move to take note of a question, uh, an answer given by Senator Evans uh, to a question I asked him in relation to youth unemployment. Madam Deputy President, I must say that I am incredulous at the response not only to my uh, question today from Senator Evans, representing the Prime Minister in this place, but also to the answer he provided uh, to a question uh, I gave him, I think it was last, uh, was the 22nd of uh, November 1995, where I also asked him um, about youth unemployment and youth suicide and the, this government's lack of attention, uh, and if, if indeed not just a lack of attention but a lack of uh, action on these matters, um, wherein Senator Evans uh, said, said in the chamber that day, that was back on the 22nd of November, um, that he didn't have any information on that, um, and he'd, he'd give me an instant answer. Now, I just I put that in context, Madam Deputy President. This is a government that, whenever you ask them about youth issues, or whenever they make a statement about youth issues publicly, they say these are a matter of incredible moment for the government that they're giving the you know the highest level of consideration uh, to these matters. Um, and of course, when the Prime Minister's representative in the Senate is asked a question about youth unemployment or youth suicide, he's unable to answer. He doesn't have a brief. Now, I put it to you that that is an incredible indictment upon this government. I mean, we have an enormously high—and the, the rate is 29 per cent. And you find, um, when Senator Schott answered a, a question on this matter today, um, in fact, virtually word for word giving the information that Senator Evans has uh, given to me uh, in his subsequent answer. Um, that, that they go through the, st the statistical reasons why it's 29 per cent and almost say that it's not a bad thing. I mean, he didn't say that. They're saying, uh, and I'll quote from Senator Evans' answer to my question, and I think if you check against the Hansard, um, you'll find it's virtually verbatim from the brief that Senator Schott was reading from during the same question time today. Uh, and I quote, in terms of Senator Campbell's claim that youth unemployment is 29 per cent, this is the rate for 15 to 19-year-olds looking for full-time work seasonally adjusted. Well, that's what it is. That's what the youth unemployment rate is. I, I continue to quote, the official unemployment rate for 19, 15 to 19-year-olds as measured by the Australian Bureau of Statistics is 19.6 per cent, October 1995 original data. In May 1994, when the government announced Working Nation, the full-time unemployment rate for 15 to 19-year-olds was 32.6 per cent, seasonally adjusted while the unemployment rate for 15 to 19-year-olds was 23.2 per cent, original data. So, I mean, I'm sure that statement, and I read it only particularly for the benefit of uh, younger people who are listening to this debate at the moment, what does that mean to you? I bet most of them have no contemplation. The reality is Australia has a youth unemployment crisis, yet this government contents itself to say, well, look, we've got Working Nation uh, and we, uh, we're very concerned about it. But the reality, of course, is very different. The youth unemployment rate is actually going up. And if you look at general unemployment—and I was reading a Business Review Weekly article um, on, on Thursday night on the aeroplane and saw that they did a Business Review Weekly—and this relates to the question I asked today—did an analysis of all of the unemployment rates in most of the Western nations, the OECD nations. And only two nations had unemployment rates that were actually going up. That is, we're getting higher unemployment in Australia and also in Germany. Every other nation in the Western world has unemployment going down. We've got it going up. And the point I was trying to get to in my question to the Leader of the Government, who clearly didn't want to answer the question, was why are we going to achieve a 5 per cent unemployment rate by the year 2000 unless there's a change of policies, unless there's a change of government, I put it to you. And of course he said he didn't indicate any policy change. He just said, we'll go along the way we're going. We'll have high interest rates, we'll have high inflation, but somehow miraculously we'll have this reduction uh, of unemployment from close to nine per cent down to five per cent. And I think the most remarkable thing that's happened today is in this report that Simon Crean's brought out, the Minister for Employment and Training, has brought out is that they're now predicting unemployment in the year two thousand and five will be four per cent. So just as unemployment starts going up, they've said, yes, we'll still achieve 5 per cent, even though growth's gone down in the year 2000, 
But don't worry, in the year 2005 it'll be even better. It'll only be 4 per cent. And I put it to the minister, the next time unemployment goes up, what he's likely to do is actually say in the year 2010 it'll only be 3 per cent. And, and I tell you what, by the time we get to year 2020, it's going to be nirvana. You kids up there in the gallery, look forward to the year 2020 because it'll be negative 2 per cent unemployment. On the way this government's going, on its reports, on what it says to the people, we're really looking good on employment, even though it's going up at the moment, even though the trend for the Labor government is increasing levels of unemployment. Don't Order, worry, Senator. in the year 2010, time, she'll be time right. has expired. The question is, the Senate take note of the answer. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Petitions? The clerk. Petitions have been lodged for presentation by honourable senators as follows. By Senators Brownhill and Childs, from 117 and 107 petitioners, respectively requesting that the Senate convey to the French Parliament the Australian community's outrage at the French government's decision to resume nuclear testing in the South Pacific. By Senators Denman and Reynolds from 67 and 71 petitioners respectively, requesting that the Senate disallow the public service regulation removing the right of appeal against higher duties of 12 months or less duration. By Senator Bell from 103 petitioners, requesting that the Senate take action to protect all Australia's remaining natural heritage forests and implement sustainable plantation forestry practices. By Senator Bourne from 74 petitioners, requesting that the Senate call on the government to take action against the continued denial of human rights to the people of East Timor. By Senator Brownhill from 172 petitioners, requesting that the Senate support United Nations resolutions calling for a nuclear non-proliferation treaty and support the cessation of uranium exports to France. The terms of the petitions will be incorporated in Hansard. Are there any notices of motions? Senator Brownhill. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that the Senate notes that despite worldwide condemnation of its actions, that France has detonated the fourth nuclear device at Moro Atoll, notes that this is not just governments and politicians that have expressed anger at the test, but people of all ages, notes that the students at Melville High School in Kempsey, New South Wales, and Coffs Harbour Students Association, in the electorate of Mr Gary Neal, the member for Cowper, have not only circulated petitions for presentation to the Senate, but have also provided 105 paper cranes to the Senate and ask that these cranes remind the Senate of previous nuclear testing atrocities. Senator Ferguson. President, I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that the time for the presentation of the report of the Economics References Committee on the proposed Eastlink high voltage power line be extended to the 22nd of December 1995. Senator Bowen. Madam uh, Deputy President, I give notice on the next day of sitting I shall move the Senate. I, sh I shall move that one. The Environment, Recreation, Communications and the Arts Reference Committee, consistent with exi its existing heavy workload and while recognising the priority given by the Senate to the committee's current significant and comprehensive marine pollution inquiry which should not be delayed or diminished by other inquiries, undertake a preliminary inquiry by way of request A to the Minerals Council of Australia to make a written and, if the committee considers it necessary, an oral submission to it by not later than the 16th of February 1996 on the implementation of the Senate urgency motion of the 19th of September 1995, namely, quotes, the need for governments to work together with mining companies and the mining industry to avoid the death of wildlife, risk to groundwater and destruction of native vegetation caused by the toxic tailings dam of the gold mining industry, and b to the parliamentary library to submit a detailed background paper on the matter. Two, the submissions are to be made public unless the committee resolves otherwise. Three, in the light of these submissions, the committee is to report on or before the 16th of March 1996 whether it recommends that the Senate should refer to it for inquiry and report, the matters contained in Senator Chamaret's Business of the Senate Notice of Motion No. 1 of the 27th of November 1995 relating to the management of gold mine effluent. Sen um, Senator Sharp. Thank you, Madam De uh, Deputy President. I give notice on the next day of sitting I shall move five separate motions to introduce the following bills. Family law or family law Family Law Reform Bill No. 2, 1995, Primary Industries and Energy Legislation Amendment Bill No. 3, 1995, Sydney 2000 Games, Indusia and Images Protection Bill 1995, 
Australian Sports Drug Agency Amendment Bill 1995, Tr Trade Practices Amendment Better Business Conduct Bill 1995. Senator the Woodley. The full text of the notices have been handed to the clerk. Senator Woodley. Thank you, uh, <coughs> Madam Deputy President. I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that the Senate 1 notes the terrible suffering of civilians because of the armed struggle between government forces and the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam LTTE, in Sri Lanka. 2. Calls on the Australian Government to approach the Government of Sri Lanka to accept an Australian delegation to visit Sri Lanka. The delegation should comprise members of parliament and representatives of concerned groups in Australia, including the churches. Three, notes that the purpose of the delegation would be to hear evidence of atrocities committed by either side, to hear proposals for a political sol solution to the situation, and to ascertain the kind of humanitarian aid Australia could supply to those in desperate need in Sri Lanka. And four, urges the Australian government to approach the United Nations and the Commonwealth to become involved in a long-term solution to the problems in Sri Lanka. Senator Panizza. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. On behalf of Senator Reid, I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that the time for the presentation of the report of the Senate House Committee on the Future Treatment and Use of Old Parliament House be extended to the last day of 1996 winter sittings. Senator Shaw. Long extension. The, uh, Madam Deputy President, I'm sorry about that comment. I realise it's your, your resolution. Um, I give notice that on the next day sitting I shall move that the order of the Senate agreed to on the 29th of November 1994 relating to the consideration of bills not apply to the Student and Youth Assistance Amendments Budget Measures Bill 1995. Senator Shamarit. Madam Pres Deputy President, on the next day of sitting I shall move that the Senate uh, notes 1. The recent history of activities of Australian mining companies overseas and mining companies with Australian part ownership involved in overseas mining operations which abrogate environmental responsibility and human rights. 2. Major examples of this trend include Australian company BHP's operations in the Octeti mine in Papua New Guinea, CRA subsidiary Bougainville Copper's history of mining operations in Bougainville, and Freeport McMoran's mine in West Papua, which is 18 per cent owned by Australian company CRA. Three, together these companies have been accused of interfering with a country's laws to deny local people rightful compensation for environmental damage, the deaths of 5,000 civilians during the long six-year war on Bougainville and the deaths of 37 West Papuan villagers, and calls on the government to four, establish and implement legal codes of conduct for mining companies operating overseas in terms of enforceable legal, international, environmental and human rights standards. Senator Boswell. Madam uh, Deputy President, I give notice on the next day of sitting I shall move that there be laid on the table by the Commonwealth Ombudsman on or before the 29th of November 1995 the draft report on the investigation of the complaint by Mrs Anne Garms. Senator Marquette. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that the Senate 1 notes that over 200 representatives of community radio and TV stations around Australia attended the Community Broadcasting Associations of Australia annual conference, Our Vision, Our Voice, held in Melbourne over this weekend. Two, notes that the Minister for Arts and Communications, the Honourable Michael Lee's comments at the conference, that there are now over 130 licensed community stations that continue to empower and entertain audiences. Three, recognises the importance of the community broadcasting sector in providing an independent alternative communication mechanism so critical for the healthy function of a democracy. Four, recognises the substantial role played by community broadcasting in ensuring a diversification of uh, voice in Australia's media. Five, recognises the great benefit to society obtained by the community broadcasting sector, providing for the active participation by that community in its management, development and operations. And six, calls on the government to actively pursue a strategy for ensuring that it provides a climate in which the community broadcasting sector can continue to grow and diversify in the face of the growing concentration of the mainstream media. Senator Panetta. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. On behalf of Senator Reid, I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move 
that the time for the presentation of the report of the Senate House Committee on Future Treatment. I think that one's been done, no, Senator. Yeah, I've got the wrong one. Uh, yeah, I've got another one. Anyhow, uh, we'll skip that one there. Uh, on behalf of Senator Brownhill, I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move the time for the presentation of the report of the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport References Committee be extended as follows. One Landcare Policy and Program in Australia, 30th of June 96, and value adding in agricultural production, 30th of June 1996. Senator Shamaru. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that the Senate one notes that this week is AIDS Awareness Week, which is an opportunity to promote the issues surrounding HIV AIDS, including education, prevention, supportive care and anti-discrimination. Two, affirms the strength and determination of people living with HIV AIDS and the enormous community support to combat this devastating pandemic. Three, supports the federal government for its continued commitment to a comprehensive national HIV AIDS strategy. And four, calls on the government to improve on this commitment by making urgent reforms to the approval and funding of HIV AIDS treatments in Australia, including approvals for combination therapy and funding for viral load testing. Senator Woodley. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. <coughs> I give notice that on the next day of sitting, Senator Kerno, Kerno shall move that the Senate A welcomes the announcement of the Prime Minister, Mr Keating, of the establishment of the Canberra Commission on the Elimination of Nuclear Weapons. B. Congratulates all members of this commission who have agreed to be involved in, with this initiative and for their personal commitment in working towards the goal of eliminating the world stockpile of nuclear weapons. C. Expresses support for the notion, as now argued by a number of countries, including Australia, before the International Court of Justice that by their very nature nuclear weapons breach the fundamental principles of humanity and are therefore illegal, and D urges all nuclear weapon states in particular to cooperate with the Commission and to support its investigations as it prepares a report in the lead-up to the next year's United Nations General Assembly. Are there, are there any further notices? Senator Panuccio. Mr Acting Deputy President, on behalf of Senator Ellison, I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move the time for the presentation of the report of the Legal and Constitutional Reference Committee be extended as follows. One, a system of national indicators and benchmarks for citizens' rights and obligations, sixth day of sitting of 96 sittings. Two, the payment of a minister's legal costs in respect of terms of reference, F and G, a sixth day of sitting of 1996. Senator and thank you, Mr Deputy President. Uh, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the leave of absence uh, for Senator Gibson. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Mr Deputy President, I move the leave of absence be granted to Senator Gibson for the period 27th of November, 27th of November to the 1st of December 1995 on account of ill health. Is, uh, the question is the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Are there any, are there any further notices of motion? There be no further notices. I shall now proceed to the placing of businesses that desire to postpone or rearrange the business. Uh, Senator Wood, uh, the Honourable the Minister. Uh, Deputy President, I seek leave to uh, act. Deputy President, I seek leave to move a motion to enable six government business orders of the day to be taken together for their remaining stages. Is leave granted? There being no objection, I call the minister. Mr. De Acting Deputy President, I move that one, the government business of the day, order of the day number four, Social Security and Veterans Affairs Legislation Amendment Bill 1995, government business order of the day number five, Employment Services Amendment Bill 1995, and the Social Security Legislation Amendment. Career Pension and Other Measures Bill 1995 may be taken together for their remaining stages. And two, Government Business Order of the Day number six, Excise Tariff Amendment Bill number two, 1995. Government Business Order of the Day number seven, Customs Tariff Bill 1995. And Customs Tariff Legislation Amendment Bill 1995 may be taken together for their remaining stages. 
question is that motion be agreed to? Those that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. S S Senator Burns. Mr. Acting President, on behalf of Senator Wheelwright, I seek leave to move a motion to enable the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters to hold a private meeting over the lunch period tomorrow. Ms. Leave granted. There being no objection, I call Senator Burns. Acting President, I move that the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters be authorised to hold a private meeting during the sitting of the Senate on 28 November 1995 from 12.45 p.m. to 2 p.m. to consider matters relating to the committee's inquiry into push polling and defamation. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Woodley. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I move that business of the Senate notice of motion number two standing in the name of Senator Bourne and notice of motion number three standing in the name of Senator Lees be deferred until Wednesday the 29th of November. Question is the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary no. I think the ayes have it. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. Are there any formal motions? The Honourable Minister, Senator Faulkner. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I ask that Government Business Notice of Motion No. 1 be taken as formal. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, I call the Minister. Mr President, I move uh, Government Business Notice of Motion No. 1. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Shamaret. Um, thank you, Mr President. Um, I ask that uh, general business notice of motion number 1939, standing in my name, relating to the introduction of the Native Forest Protection Bill 1995, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, I call Sen Senator Shamaret. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy, Deputy President, I move that the following bill be introduced, a bill for an act to protect Australia's native forests, entitled Native Forest Protection Bill 1995. Well, the question is that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Shamaru. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. A bill for an act to protect Australia's native forests. Senator Shamaret. I move that um, this bill now be read a second time. I would like to just make a brief statement before seeking to incorporate the full speech in Hansard. I don't want to abuse the agreement that the Senate has granted me to introduce this bill, but I'd like to just make a very brief comment merely to say that this bill follows on the extensive work of the conservation movement in preparing the necessary criteria to protect forests of high conservation value. The government has overwhelming public support to act to save the forests, and there is no doubt that the Commonwealth has the necessary constitutional power to protect our forests, and the only impediment is political. This bill sets out to amend the Export Control Act in such a way that would phase out the export of wood chips from native forests, prohibit logging in defined categories of native forests on public land immediately, prohibit the export of wood chips from defined categories of native forests immediately, and implement a transitional strategy for the wood products industry. This bill is step one in a positive, proactive, holistic strategy to save our wonderful, precious native forests, and the onus is now on the government to act. I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Would somebody like to move the adjournment? Debate, debate be adjourned. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The country no. I think the ayes have it. Are there any further formal notices of motion? The Honourable Minister, Senator Faulkner. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to amend Government Business Notice of Motion No. 2 prior to moving the notice as a formal motion. Is leave granted? There being no objection, I call Senator Faulkner. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President. I amend the notice by deleting the reference um, to the Student and Youth Assistant Amendment Budget Measures Bill 1995 and move the motion as amended. The question is that the motion as amended be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Are there any further formal notices of motion?
You might have some there for Senator Watson. Yes, Senator Watson. Uh, Mr Deputy President, on behalf of Senator Watson, I ask that general business notices of motion number 1946, 1942 and 1944 be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, I could... No, well, I presume it's uh, in order to put the three together, all in Watson's, Senator Watson's name, number 1946, and number 1942, and number 1944. Is there any objection? <coughs> there being no objection, I call Senator Panetta. I formally move the motions standing in uh, Senator Watson's name. The question is the motions be agreed to. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. We shall move to the presentation of other documents. Uh, my running sheet says you have something, Minister. The Honourable the Minister. Yes, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, I present a proposal by the National Capital Planning Authority to install additional lightning, lighting to the car parks associated with the Treasury Building at Parks ACT, <laughs> together with be a relief to them, won't it? Uh, together with related correspondence and uh, seek leave to give notice uh, of motion relating to the proposal. Is, is leave granted? There being no objection, leave this granted. Mr Acting Deputy President, I give notice on the next day of sitting I shall move that in accordance with section 5 of the Parliament Act 1974, the Senate approves the proposal by the National Capital Planning Authority to instil additional lighting to the car parks associated with the Treasury Building Parks ACT. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I present Cor Agenda to the 1995-96 Portfolio Additional Estimate Statements for the Industrial Relations and Social Security Portfolios. I shall now proceed to reports from committees. Senator Reid. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, on behalf of <clears throat> the Joint Committee on the National Capital and External Territories, I present the report of the Committee on Draft Amendment No. 14, Broadacre Areas, to the National Capital Plan, together with submissions and transcript of evidence, and seek leave to move a motion in relation to the report. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I call Senator Reid. Mr President, I move that the Senate take note of the report, and I'm pleased to present it to the Senate. It came about when, on the, 14th, uh, the 10th of November 1994, the Honourable Brian Howe MP, the then Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Housing and Regional Development, invited the committee to inquire into and report on what is known as Draft Amendment No. 14 to the National Capital Plan. This seeks to expand the range of permitted land uses from the current, quote, offensive and hazardous industries, quote, to just the more general industries, covering four sites identified as A, B, C and D. The area lies within broadacre areas of the National Capital Plan. It is bounded by Oaks Estate, the ACT New South Wales border, Canberra Avenue and the Malonglo River Corridor, and it in fact includes the sites currently occupied by the Canberra Abattoir and the Canberra Tannery. The committee conducted an on-site inspection of the area on the 27th of February 1995, took evidence from key interested parties at public hearings on the 27th of February and the 6th of March, and written submissions were also received and considered by the committee. It all took somewhat longer than anticipated, and for the first time that I can recall, there is a dissenting report associated with this. And the matter was debated by great length, as you would know, Mr Acting Deputy President, by the committee, and a number of contentious issues were discussed. 
The inquiry highlighted some of the difficulties in looking at land use purposes operating under two planning regimes in the national capital. In the ACT, both Commonwealth and ACT legislation operates. There are two plans known as the National Capital Plan and the Territory Plan, which are the responsibility of the National Capital Planning Authority and the ACT Planning Authority, respectively. I guess it's inevitable that from time to time there will be differences in the plans and there will be issues that will need to be considered. And I note, Mr Acting uh, Deputy President, that just recently the Chief Minister of the ACT Government and the Minister, Mr Howe, established a committee to jointly look at aspects relating to planning. I haven't seen the specific sort of terms of reference, but I, th I think any who, anyone who's been involved in this area would recognise the areas that would be being looked at and discussed. The reason that the committee received this reference was that there was an anomaly between the National Capital Plan and the Territory Plan. The National Capital Plan only permitted hazardous and offensive industries on the sites while the Territory Plan permitted industries for all but one site within the draft amendment area. However, the Territory Plan has no effect if it is inconsistent with the National Capital Plan. The impetus for Draft Amendment 14 was an application by the lessee for, uh, or the proprietor of the Canberra Abattoir to vary its lease in that it wished to close the abattoir and seek to redevelop some of the land into an industrial estate, comprising, I think, some 50 blocks. Draft Amendment 14 does not in itself um, result in an automatic change in land use on the abattoir site, as there are mandatory processes required also by the ACT government before any change in land use or any development application can be approved. The amendment raised several important issues which are dealt with in the report, and the committee considered the extent of the area of the sites A, B, C and D. Some of the issues were the impact on nearby residents, the need for an adequate buffer zone to allow screening from any development in the area and Canberra Avenue, the concerns of the Queanbeyan City Council, the need to reduce anomalies between the National Capital Plan and the Territory Plan and it led the committee to conclude that it was appropriate to vary the plan in relation to sites A, B and D, but excluding site C. And consequently, the committee recommends that draft amendment 14, as originally proposed, be not agreed to, but that the variation relate to the sites A, B and D. And the reasons for this is set out in the report. I wish to thank the staff involved with this inquiry, which, as I said, took much longer than expected, in particular Meg Crooks, the secretary to the committee, and all others who have worked with us. But it's necessary also to comment a little on the arguments that took place and the, um, the reasons that some members of the committee came to a different point of view. It is my view that what we have done enables a lessee to be innovative, to show initiative, to show some entrepreneurship in relation to their activities in the Australian Capital Territory. It is my view that the alternate proposal, which other members of the committee preferred, would in fact lead, lead to a situation of stifling initiative, stifling entrepreneurship and discouraging business from being involved in the ACT. I believe any person has the right to consider redeveloping, reassessing what they are doing and into some, in a, into some other activity. To suggest that it's all over then. The, a person who has a lease in Canberra, if they did not wish to proceed with what they were doing at the present time, should only be able to get rid of it by surrendering, surrendering it, I think would have a quite devastating effect on the morale of the business community and people generally in the Australian Capital Territory. There is no doubt that there is a betterment tax paid if you seek to change the purpose of the lease which you presently occupy and want to do something else. Um, it will be assessed and taxed at an appropriate rate and that tax will be paid. And I understand that that is also a matter being reviewed. 
uh, by the ACT government. But to suggest that on the only course that this particular company could follow would be to give back the abattoir to the ACT government and hope to be recompensed for it and that any further development might be done by somebody else or by the ACT government is not the sort of society that I would want to live in. It is not the message that I would want to give to people here. I would hope that we would live in a society where people would be innovative and show entrepreneurship to develop and to create other jobs and other opportunities rather than send the message that that is not the way we do things in the ACT. The proposal will mean that a part of the land that we looked at will be able to be redeveloped as an industry uh, area as opposed to its present definition of a hazardous industry area and of course it will remain to be uh, determined presumably by the ACT government in the future what steps can be taken if any in relation to the rest of the site and what steps will be taken to meet some of the uh, objectives which were also referred to in terms of the need for an adequate buffer zone and taking into account the area from the point of view of residents. There was a difference of view on the committee as to how this should proceed and I've briefly outlined some of the points that we were considering in dealing with it and I recommend the report to the Senate that the amendment 14 be not proceeded with as put to us, but be proceeded with in relation to those areas identified as A, B and D. Um, Senator Colston. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. My only reason for speaking to this report is to outline that the so-called majority report was arrived at because of a farcical stacking of the committee, culminating in a vote which some members who did not have involvement in the inquiry before the final vote was taken, simply and blindly following their colleagues' votes. That final vote, incidentally, could have taken place earlier but was postponed when it became clear that the Chair and the Coalition did not have the numbers. Mr John Sharp MP, to my knowledge, had not attended one meeting of the committee during the 37th Parliament <coughs> until he was corralled by his Coalition colleagues to vote on the final draft. His total contribution to the committee in this parliament has therefore been about 10 minutes. I am not criticising Mr Sharp for his non-attendance. We all have competing demands on our time, and Mr Sharp obviously concluded that this committee could work well without his assistance. For him to appear at one single meeting of the committee, however, to vote on a closely divided committee issue could be regarded as transparent opportunism. <coughs> Senator Alan Ferguson was appointed to the committee to replace Senator Noel Crichton Brown on the 23rd of October 1995. On the same day, he, Senator Ferguson, voted on the report. I have no criticism of Senator Ferguson. He was apparently briefed by his coalition colleagues. But I do question the wisdom of voting on a proposal without hearing at least a majority of the evidence and attending the site inspection. My good friend and colleague, <coughs> the Honourable Leo Maclay, was unable to attend most meetings of the committee for this reference because of his onerous duties as Chief Whip, but came to the meeting to support his colleague, the Chairman, who, until Mr McClay's, McClay's arrival, was the only government member who supported what was to become the majority report. Thus, of the nine members who regularly attended the meeting and heard the evidence, five had signed what is a minority report. It was actually a majority of those who had a reasonable knowledge of what they were voting for. If committees are going to be run according to Tammany Hall rules, they will bring the committee system of this parliament into, into disrepute. Given the time, effort and expense put into this inquiry, I doubt that the minister can take much comfort from the fact that he asked the committee whether it wished to inquire into the proposed amendment to the National Capital Plan. I trust he will take into account the so-called minority report and the matters I have alluded to in my brief comment. Question is the Senate Senator Coates. Deputy President, uh, I uh, thank Senator Colston for his uh, putting those uh, uh, points on the record as far as the uh, the way the committee operated. I won't uh, go over those uh, that same uh, those same issues. Uh, 
except to say that uh, I too was very uh, disappointed about how the uh, uh, the whole uh, matter occurred, and to emphasise that uh, that there are uh, five members of the committee who have uh, signed uh, this uh, dissenting report, and that uh, that, as has been indicated by uh, Senator Colston, is uh, a clear majority of the committee members who, uh, who participated in the matter. I uh, am still upset about the whole, uh, the whole issue, and I, th and I think it's, uh, it's not just a matter of a, a slight difference of opinion about, uh, uh, about it. It was, gets to the very, uh, very basic issues that were concerned uh, with this reference. And uh, I also would urge the minister to take a particular note of the uh, alternative recommendations of the five committee members who uh, signed the, uh, the dissent. It's, uh, it's a, a, a brief uh, dissent, it only took uh, two, two pages to do it, but uh, it does set out the issues. Just in uh, correction of what Senator Reid said, and she, I think she said this was the first uh, dissent, uh, dissenting report on this committee. Um, that's not so because I put in a, a dissenting report myself uh, in relation to the, uh, uh, the uh, islands, uh, the uh, transport problems of, uh, of uh, Christmas, Cocos and, uh, and Norfolk Islands. But, but I guess I, I make that point if only to emphasise that it's a little different. One member of a committee putting in a, a point of view to, uh, uh, to indicate the, uh, the ideological difference that, uh, that there was compared to such a significant number of the committees as, uh, committee as there was in, the, in this case. In, in answer to Senator Reid's point about entrepreneurship uh, and uh, people ought to have the right to uh, seek a change of use of their, their lease, we're, here, we're not here talking about a minor change of use. We're not talking about somebody having a, 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 a lease over an area of a, a normal sort of block in Canberra and seeking to, uh, to change it from a uh, a car yard to, a, to uh, uh, some other industry or even to change it from uh, uh, one residence to, to four or something like that. We're talking about changing a substantial area that was uh, uh, set up as an abattoir. It was originally a Commonwealth abattoir. has been a private abattoir for uh, quite some years and changing that to be a, uh, uh, effectively a new industrial suburb for Canberra. And my point of view is that if that is to happen, it ought to be done by the proper planning processes. Now, this proposal wasn't dealt with in the normal course of uh, planning processes. It only arose because the current lessee, the uh, company Mulligans, who run the abattoir, wanted to close it down and concentrate their activities uh, in, uh, at another abattoir in Cowra. And it sought to, uh, to profit from the remainder of its lease term and any renewal by developing and subdividing the site as an industrial estate. Now, on the planning issue, quite apart from the correctness of the, uh, the uh, process, on the planning issue, it may be that there is a need for a new industrial suburb in Canberra. It may even be that this is the best place for it, though I have my doubts because of its uh, uh, closeness to the, uh, to, uh, the border and to Queanbeyan. But if this is to happen, it ought to happen by the uh, normal processes of looking at the overall uh, planning of Canberra and saying this is where uh, that, that there needs to be a new uh, industrial suburb, uh, that uh, Fishwick and Mitchell and so on don't, don't have, have enough room and we need a new uh, industrial suburb. But it shouldn't be done in this uh, uh, ad hoc uh, way. Um, perhaps if I just uh, read part of the, uh, the uh, dissenting report to, uh, to illustrate the point. We said, we also accept that in such circumstances a lessee should be able to seek to have its lease terminated and that there is value to the lessee in the remainder of its lease term. Now, of course, I should interpose that the, uh, uh, the company thought this was the only way 
that it could get value out of the remainder of its lease term because they were under a misapprehension about their entitlement to, uh, for the uh, lease to be terminated and for them to get, uh, to get compensation. So uh, it's not, uh, uh, but, but that wasn't so. We went on to say, however, we believe that the fairest way in which the lessee's needs and rights should be satisfied while ensuring that the community's rights are protected is for the lease to be terminated and the lessee to be appropriately compensated for the value of the remainder of the term of the lease based on its current use. That is, we weren't suggesting that they should uh, uh, lose any remaining value that they had in that lease. While recognising that there would be risks in its proposed investment as a developer and acknowledging that betterment would be payable to the ACT government, there is no justification for the present lessee potentially to profit from such a substantial change of use, nor for it automatically to become the developer of what would be effectively a new industrial suburb without competing for that right. And I guess this is why I'm a bit surprised with the, uh, the uh, opposition uh, attitude about, uh, about this matter, that I would have thought the, uh, uh, that the fair way of uh, ensuring that if there was to be this development that it be done in a, uh, a competitive way would be by, uh, by calling tenders for it and not just letting it be given to the, uh, to the lessee that happened to have had it for an entirely different reason. So the, the report goes on, the decentering report goes on. If in the proper planning processes it is determined that the area in question is the appropriate place for a new industrial suburb of the ACT, then that planning, subdivision and development should be by the ACT government, not by a private developer, unless, and I acknowledge this is an option, unless the government decided to contract out all or part of the process and call tenders for this task in the proper way. But of course that's uh, not what is being uh, proposed. Uh, the decision making about whether there should be a new industrial suburb, whether it should be in this area or elsewhere in the ACT Queenbean area, the size and nature of the industrial estate, its relation to Queenbean and the, uh, and the Oaks estate and other planning requirements would thereby be fully in the community's hands and not those of a single private company which happened to hold a lease for a quite different purpose and one for which it no longer wished to pursue. We reiterate that lessee should be treated fairly and that it should not suffer a loss in respect of the properly assessed value of the rest of its lease term. And then we go on to make some recommendations, the formal one that the amendment as proposed not be approved, that the suggested modified amendment not be approved, but to recommend that the company be advised that if it surrenders its lease or if the lease is compulsorily acquired, the company can be fairly compensated under ACT legislation. That was something we found out late in the, late in the process of this uh, inquiry. And then that the ACT government be requested to consider all the issues uh, raised in this report and in particular in this dissent and uh, advise the Commonwealth of its preferred use and then, if necessary, the Minister could uh, refer an appropriate amendment to the, uh, to the committee for consideration. I think uh, I emphasise that it's a an issue of uh, the proper planning for the ACT and b the, the question of process as to uh, uh, whether or not this uh, uh, existing lessee should uh, just have uh, the right to have such a substantial change of use and to uh, uh, potentially profit uh, so much from uh, developing a whole uh, industrial suburb. So I uh, once again express my uh, 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 anger about the whole, uh, the whole issue. I think it is, uh, if, if the majority report were to be uh, adopted, I think it would be uh, outrageous and uh, I really do urge the Minister to take particular note of these uh, serious issues that are involved and to uh, uh, adopt the uh, alternative recommendations of the, uh, the five committee members who signed this dissent. Senator Ian MacDonald. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, as a member of the uh, committee, I uh, support the uh, recommendations of the uh, uh, committee and uh, uh, concur with the remarks uh, made by uh, my colleague uh, in this chamber, Senator uh, uh, Margaret Reid. Uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, I didn't uh, really intend to uh, speak on this uh, report, um, as uh, uh, Senator Reid uh, more than more than adequately uh, uh, explained uh, the reasons of the uh, committee um, and uh, explained the uh, recommendations that the committee uh, has uh, made by a uh, fairly substantial uh, majority uh, to the minister. And I would urge uh, that the minister uh, does uh, heed the. Uh, uh, the recommendations of the uh, committee uh, and uh, acts accordingly. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, the reason I uh, came uh, just to make a very brief contribution to this debate was uh, uh, some of the matters that my uh, colleague uh, Senator Colston uh, 
uh, mentioned, and uh, I thought uh, perhaps I should just place on record that uh, uh, if he's suggesting uh, Tammany Hall tactics between uh, uh, Mr Leo Mackay and Mr Bob Chenoweth uh, uh, with members of the Liberal and National Parties, then it must be a funny sort of Tammany Hall. Um, and uh, the fact that uh, the decision was not in any way political is, uh, uh, is evidenced by the fact that, uh, as I say, there were those uh, sorts of uh, people joining forces believing that the uh, majority report was in fact the, the uh, correct one. Uh, Mr. Uh, Acting Deputy President, I know Senator Colston uh, as a former Deputy uh, President and as one who really does have uh, uh, an interest in the integrity uh, of the Senate and the Senate committee uh, system uh, uh, was measured in uh, what he says, but I thought it perhaps a little uh, below the belt that he was suggesting that just because some people hadn't been at all the committee hearings, then they, 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 that follows from that that they couldn't exercise a proper judgment on the uh, material that had been presented. And uh, whilst, uh, as Senator Colson did point out, some of my colleagues didn't attend uh, all of the meetings. I myself didn't uh, attend all of them, uh, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. But we are, and, and uh, Mr McClay, but Mr McClay was on the side of the majority. But he no doubt spoke with the, uh, with the chairman, Mr Chenow, and, um, and I can assure you that I and uh, others of my colleagues uh, spoke with uh, Senator Reid and Mr Brendan Nelson, uh, both of whom uh, attended, I think, uh, 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 Bre sorry, Brendan Smith, uh, Brendan Smith, uh, who attended uh, all of the uh, hearings as I, as I understand them, and, uh, and we're all uh, capable of reading the uh, Hansard and, uh, and digesting the evidence uh, that was given. And uh, whilst there were discussions on balance, uh, the majority came to the clear conclusion uh, that the uh, uh, recommendations uh, should be adopted. Uh, of those uh, on the uh, dissenting report, uh, perhaps some of them, uh, uh, most of them did attend most of the hearings. Uh, uh, but I will say that uh, most of them have also put their names to other reports when I can say that Mr Langmore and uh, Senator Bell, uh, and no reflection on them for the reason Senator Colston said they, uh, we all have lots of other things to do, but they haven't been as closely involved in other reports that this committee uh, has laid down. But I, make no, I don't say to them that because they weren't there, uh, their, their opinions and their view of the evidence isn't as good as uh, uh, anyone else's. So I, I just uh, wanted to make... Uh, uh, clear, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, that the uh, the majority or uh, well, the committee report, I should say, uh, is uh, uh, the report of uh, uh, quite obviously the majority. It's a considered opinion, one which uh, uh, we believe uh, uh, is the uh, uh, correct one to uh, uh, adopt. I might say that uh, whilst all members of the committee take a very close interest in the activities of this committee, um, three of the uh, persons on it. Uh, are, uh, have a uh, perhaps an even greater interest because they represent uh, the ACT in this parliament, and that's uh, Mr. Langmore, uh, Mr. Smith, and uh, Senator Reid. Although I've got my uh, protocol around the wrong around there, it should have been Senator Reid, uh, Mr. Langmore, and uh, Mr. Smith. Um, and uh, all three, of course, take uh, an even greater interest in what happens uh, in the community in which they live. And of course, it perhaps is uh, relevant that two of the three. Uh, uh, did uh, comprise the uh, majority uh, report. But I would certainly urge the uh, Minister certainly to read the uh, whole report, both the report and the dissenting one, but I think the Minister should, in considering the matter, be guided by the opinion of the committee report um, and not of uh, other secondary opinions. Uh, Senator Allison, I believe you have a... I'm oh, sorry. Oh, the question is... To, sorry. The question is to, um, the report be noted. noted? Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Burns. Mr Acting President, uh, I present uh, on behalf of uh, Senator Neal the Joint Statutory Committee, a report of the Joint Statutory Committee on Corporations and Securities, and I present a report on Section 1316 of the Corporations Law, together with submissions and the transcript of evidence received by the committee, and move that the report be printed. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. No seek leave to move a motion in relation to the report. Leave granted. Being no objection, leave is granted. I must take the President, I Burns. move that the Senate take note of the report. The question is that motion be agreed.
Yes, perhaps Senator Burns, you might like to, to seek leave to incorporate that uh, report and seek leave to continue. Incorporate right? the report. And seek Thank leave to continue. You, leave granted. Leave is granted. Uh, Senator Ellison. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I table the uh, the report, uh, the third report of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Native Title and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Land Fund in relation to the Committee Exchange with New Zealand, dated August 1995. Uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, uh, I'm I'm pleased to table this report on behalf of the Chairman, Senator Chris Evans, who unfortunately is. Uh, unable to be here today attending to very important matters dealing with uh, an addition, uh, an expected addition to his family. And uh, so therefore um, I table this report on his behalf. This report relates to a delegation to New Zealand by the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Native Title and uh, the visit was conducted from the 7th of August to the 10th of August this year. The members who visited New Zealand were Senator Chris Evans, the chairman. Senator Chamaret, uh, Mr Harry Quick, uh, the Committee Secretary Peter Grundy and myself. At the outset I wish to place on record the Committee's thanks to uh, Mr Peter Grundy, the Secretary, for his excellent work and valuable as assistance he rendered to Committee members during the course of the visit. I might also say that uh, the Committee worked very well together and uh, in fact enjoyed the benefit of each other's contribution uh, to the, the, the subject in question. The, visitor, uh, the visit to Mr Acting Deputy President uh, occurred at the invitation of the Speaker of the New Zealand House of Representatives, the Honourable Mr Peter Tapsell, and it took place under the Committee Exchange Program which exists between the two countries. Uh, this program involves a visit to Canberra each year by a committee of the New Zealand Parliament and a return visit later the same year by a committee of the Commonwealth Parliament. The, uh, by convention, the presiding officers of the dispatching parliament determine the topic and the committee to participate in each exchange, and the, this decision is usually taken in consultation. This year is the Maori language year, and uh, the Honourable Mr Peter Tapsell uh, indicated that indigenous land rights would be an appropriate topic. Accordingly, the presiding officers of the Commonwealth Parliament agreed that the joint committee should participate in the exchange. The committee is grateful that in a compact visit program over three and a half days there were several meetings with Maori. The visit began at Hamilton for that purpose. Our understanding of the settlement process in New Zealand was much, much enhanced through meeting with the Tanui and subsequently uh, with the Ngai Tahu representatives. It should be uh, recorded that the visit was very successful as an exchange between the Australian and New Zealand parliaments. The exchange was cordial, informative and stimulating. I might add, uh, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, that um, there are some aspects dealing with Indigenous land rights uh, which vary between New Zealand and Australia, in fact uh, markedly so. The first uh, point is that the significant proportion uh, of Maori in the New Zealand population those who identify as Maori make up 13 per cent of the New Zealand population, a figure in expected to increase to 15 per cent over the next 40 years. By the year 2031, the Maori population is projected to number about 672,000 or 54 uh, per cent, as I understand it, uh, 54 per cent larger than in 1991. This contrasts both in absolute figures and as a proportion with the Australian Indigenous community, which is believed to be less than 300,000, or in percentage terms, 1.6 per cent of the population. Another aspect which uh, was of interest in comparison was the concept of native title itself. In New Zealand, native title survived colonisation. Maori land, however, was significantly reduced over time through illegal confiscation and land sales. Importantly, in New Zealand, land, land rights have long been litigated on the basis of the 1840 Treaty of Waitangi. In Australia, native title was recognised for the first time in 1992 by the High Court 
and has survived colonisation only where it was not extinguished by land grants. Litigation on the basis of the Native Title Act has proceeded only since 1994. So therefore Probably New Zealand right, has had uh, over a hundred years more experience, you might say, in this area than Australia. The courts have often found in favour of Maori claims about breaches of the treaty, and success successful petitions have been made to the Privy Council. New Zealand Maori are in a strong position to assert their land rights as a consequence of the protection afforded by that treaty. The recent Tainui settlement had such a basis. By comparison, it was recognised by the Australian Parliament in debating the Native Title Act that Indigenous Australians would only have limited scope for the recognition of native title. The land fund was accordingly devised to ensure a more satisfactory level of restitution, particularly for those members of the Indigenous community who could not make any successful claim under native title. Thirdly, the options for litigation under the Waitangi Treaty depend in part on the fact that the treaty was nego negotiated with the British Crown. Under the Treaty of Waitangi Act, action concerning breaches of the treaty result in claims against the Crown. Private property is not subject to such claims, and claims cannot be brought against private individuals or organisations. The principle adopted in New Zealand is that past wrongs cannot be corrected by further unjust acts. This uh, situation contrasts with that prevailing in Australia, where, in, where except in those cases where native title has been extinguished by an inconsistent grant, native title may continue. Uh, types of holdings that are subject to a valid claim remain to be determined by the courts, uh, but nonetheless uh, a variety of uh, land holdings could be subject to native title claim, and it is not just the Crown against whom those claims are made. Uh, another aspect uh, which was of um, some interest uh, was the fact that under the Native Title Act, Indigenous Australians seek to establish ongoing connection with their country, justifying determinations of native title. The, the National Native Title Tribunal attempts to mediate agreements between the parties. If agreement cannot be reached, the matter is referred to the Federal Court for determination. In New Zealand, emphasis is placed on the breaches of the rights under the Waitangi Treaty. The Waitangi Tr Tribunal issues recommendatory reports. They can be utilised by the Office of Treaty Settlements, which then negotiates settlements for the Crown. And I might say that the, tr the committee had a most interesting uh, meeting with the Chief Judge of the Waitangi Tribunal, Chief Judge Edward Jury, um, an outstanding man who is not only a credit to his people but also to his country. And uh, the committee, I think, learned a great deal from him. Uh, another aspect which was of interest uh, was that New Zealand Maori placed very considerable significance on their insistence that the Crown apologise for breach of the treaty. The recent Tanui deed of settlement expressed the Crown's profound regret and apology and provided the recognition of the Waikato's principles. And that was first, uh, that land was taken, land should be returned, and secondly, that money with the acknowledgement by the Crown uh, of its uh, misdeed. Finally, uh, in relation to compensation, in Australia no limit has been placed on the amount of compensa compensation that may be payable to Indigenous people for the past extinguishment of native title. However, a land fund uh, of uh, well, Australia, Australia, I should say, has set up a land fund of some $1.4 billion, which will release $45 million per year through the Indigenous Land Corporation. In New Zealand, a fixed amount of $1 billion has been identified by the present government as the envelope within which all treaty claims should be settled. Uh, that uh, contrasts uh, quite, uh, quite significantly in relation to the Australian situation. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, I'd like to record the, the thanks of the committee uh, to the Speaker of the New Zealand House of Representatives uh, for introducing the committee to the House and inviting it to the Chamber for question time. I also wish to pay tribute to the hospitality of the Maori Affairs Committee and in particular uh, its chairman, Mr Koro Wataira, who uh, looked after us uh, very well indeed and in fact uh, I think was a source of, of great information to the committee. In fact, uh, without uh, uh, 
Koro Wataira, I think the committee would have been at a distinct disadvantage, and I'm, I'm sure uh, Senator Shamaret would agree with me in that regard. But uh, uh, all in all, uh, it was a most successful visit, and uh, I would commend to the Senate uh, the report in question. Senator Shamaret. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to uh, associate myself with the sentiments that have just been expressed uh, by Senator Ellison in relation to the, uh, the report of the Native Title uh, Committee exchange uh, with New Zealand of August 1995. Um, I was uh, delighted to be able to be part of uh, that visit, and um, I want to stress that as part of the role of the ongoing uh, Joint uh, Standing Committee on Native Title of this parliament, it's very vital that such visits occur. Not only was this New Zealand visit very important, so too will be uh, an examination of the progress uh, on Indigenous rights and native title issues in other countries, such as Canada and the United States. From a comparative point of view, uh, it was very useful to um, have meetings with uh, both the uh, committee and members of parliament of New Zealand and also to be out uh, in the, uh, the countryside and looking at some of the issues that are very relevant and very important uh, to Māori. The um, position I felt in looking at uh, the various um, ranges of issues in relation to native title was that New Zealand seems to be very much ahead of Australia in uh, quite a few regards, particularly in the sense of the Treaty of Waitangi, making it indisputable that uh, Māori have rights in, the, in their own country and that those rights deserve recognition. However, similar problems exist for them as uh, are experienced, no doubt, in all parts of the world, but particularly here in Australia. There seems to be a similar failure or delay and slowness of the government to recognise the rights that are indisputable by handing over Crown land and instead, there were indications that uh, instead of them being handed over to Māori, they were actually being um, given over to overseas interests and also, in some cases, being granted national park status as a way of eroding uh, the rights of Māori over their land and their, their um, ancestral land. The wonderful highlights of the visit uh, however, were the traditional welcomes at the beginning of almost every interview or engagement and the respect for Maori culture that was expressed by Pākehā. The bilingual, if not bicultural, aspects of discussions were very impressive and I think uh, it stands as an indictment really of uh, non-Aboriginal Australia that we haven't been able to uh, offer the same kind of respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities when we meet in their area. It was um, an extremely salutary experience to share in that um, acknowledgement of Indigenous rights by the bicultural way in which um, uh, issues were discussed and the use of language which under, underwrote that as well. And I'm just going to close these brief comments by something which I believe is one of the most impressive things. Um, about the visit to New Zealand. It summarises it really because it's at the beginning of the, um, the third report of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Native Title. <coughs> um, and it's this. It's a quote from Lord Norman B's instructions to Lieutenant Governor Hobson on the 14th of August 1839. And I wish that we could endorse the sentiments that were written here and say that we could fulfil it in our own approach with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I quote, All dealings with the Aborigines for their lands must be conducted on the same principles of sincerity, justice and good faith as must govern your transactions with them for the recognition of Her Majesty's sovereignty in the islands. Nor is this all. They must not be permitted to enter into any contracts in which they might be the ignorant and unintentional authors of injuries to themselves. You will not, for example, purchase from them any territory the retention of which by them would be essential or highly conducive to their own comfort, safety or subsistence. 
the acquisition of land by the Crown for the future settlement of British subjects must be confined to such districts as the natives can alienate without distress or serious inconvenience to themselves. To secure the observance of this rule will be one of the first duties of their official protector. I think just as those words stand as an indictment on all the dealings that have happened since 1839 uh, in New Zealand, they stand as an indictment to people all around the world in relation to the indigenous rights of the people of their own countries. And uh, I just want to add that this visit to New Zealand was uh, very useful in continuing an exchange uh, between the two countries that will be of, of certain benefit to us. And uh, I would uh, be very pleased to see that um, committee uh, come over and, and share with us in some of the struggles that we have in honouring the kinds of commitments that are illustrated um, in that quote. The question is the Senate take note of the report. All those in favour? Senator Burns. Uh, Mr Acting President, on behalf of Senator West, I present the report of the Community Affairs Legislation uh, Committee. I'll just finish moving the motion that I was about to remove uh, on, in relation to Senator Ellison's presentation. All those in favour say aye. All those against say no. The ayes have it. Senator Burns. Mr. Acting President, I, on behalf of Senator West, I present the report of the Community Affairs Legislation Committee on Social Security and Veterans Affairs Legislation Amendment Bill Number 1995, Bill 1995, together with the transcript of evidence and submissions received by the committee and moved that the report be printed. All, all those in favour say aye. All those against say no. The ayes have it. Senator Calvert. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to table the report of the Australian Parliamentary Delegation to Slovenia and the 94th Interparliamentary Conference and to make a short statement in relation to the report. Being no objection, leave is granted. Mr Acting Deputy President, I present the report of the Australian Parliamentary Delegation to Slovenia and the 94th Interparliamentary Conference, which was held in Bucharest between the 1st and 15th of October 1995. Um, the bilateral visit to Slovenia was headed by uh, Mr Leo uh, Clay, the uh, government whip, the former speaker, um, w w along with uh, Senator Denman and Senator Woods and myself, and the parliamentary sec the secretary of the delegation was Mr Peter Keel. And uh, we had a short delegation to, to visit a bilateral visit to Slovenia. You might ask where Slovenia is. I can just say that Slovenia is a very beautiful country, uh, about a third of the size of uh, Tasmania, a population of two million people, and it was part of the former Yugoslavia. It's bordered by uh, Italy, um, uh, Austria, uh, Croatia and Hungary, and it has a small portion uh, bordering on the uh, uh, Adriatic Sea. So uh, I must say, uh, before we left here, we, we had uh, we had a meeting with the Chargé d'Affaires here in Canberra, Mr Aljaz Gosnar, who uh, painted in glowing terms to us what he uh, believed we would enjoy uh, of this beautiful little country. And uh, I must say, uh, everything he said was, uh, I, I think, underrated, in fact. I think he was very, uh, uh, un uh, very, uh, well, he didn't really paint the, the true picture. He gave us a very uh, um, mild view of, of, of what this particular country was, was about. Um, we do uh, have reasonably but significantly growing trade with uh, Slovenia. Uh, our two-way trade now amounts to $48.7 million. Um, we have uh, some 30,000 Slovenian people living in Australia, and um, so, so it was important that uh, uh, this first ever uh, parliamentary delegation uh, to Slovenia um, went there. We, uh, we're very pleased to, to know that uh, Slovenia uh, supports our candidature for the uh, Security Council in, New, in the UN. Uh, we, on the other hand, were one of the first countries to recognise Slovenia when it became uh, a new nation after the uh, disintegration of former Yugoslavia. Uh, in Slovenia, they are currently caring for some 17,000 um, Muslim refugees from the war in, in, in the former Yugoslavia. And um, I must say, I think we're all impressed with the with the work ethic that uh, goes on in Slovenia. They, they, they uh, it really is a bustling, very small country, um, a Western European type country that uh, 
I, I would recommend, highly recommend anybody to visit. visit. And in fact, uh, I think we, as a delegation, formed the view that it would be a very good jumping off spot, uh, jumping off spot into, into central and, and northern and eastern Europe, because uh, it really is centrally placed. Uh, it is still part of the Eastern Bloc uh, in, in its territory. It's not part of the Euro European Union as yet. Uh, and uh, we, might, we were most impressed with the, their, their port of Copa. Uh, Copa uh, on the Adriatic is uh, very close by Trieste, for those people who mm -hmm. know where Trieste is. It's only an, uh, Slovenia is only an hour, well, close by Copa is only an hour from, from Venice. Um, but it's a very strategically located port and uh, a, a, a Slovi uh, an Australian of Slovenian descent um, is uh, organising a, um, what I would call a, a very uh, well-established uh, duty-free trade zone called Ton City, which uh, I believe would have very big advantages for business people uh, coming out of Australia and wanting to enter Europe um, through a shorter and easier route. As far as tourism is concerned, it was said to us on more than one occasion, and I know this uh, expression very well because it, it also uh, it also could be said of uh, Senator Denman's and my state. It's the best kept secret in Europe, uh, uh, Slovenia, just like Tasmania is the best kept secret in Australia. Um, it was it was a phrase that was uh, often used as we moved around the uh, around the uh, small. Uh, uh, country and uh, it, it certainly is a well kept secret um, the little the, uh, the capital Ljubljana has a, has a very be beautiful city Senator Burns I think mentioned to me before I went he'd been to Ljubljana um, it is the home of, uh, of an international wine show it's, uh, uh, its architecture is uh, very European uh, some of the a couple of the port cities or the fishing villages on the Adriatic, Pu Puran and Porto Rose, uh, are very uh, Venetian in their outlook and, and are very colourful. We believe that uh, we believe as a delegation that Slovenia can look forward very well to a, a very lucrative tourist industry and uh, and the I believe the relations uh, that we made with members of government and and uh, that followed on to the conference in Romania was very fruitful as far as Australia was concerned. Uh, as I said, we were only there for a short time. Uh, we moved on to the Inter-Parliamentary Conference in, uh, in Bucharest, in Romania, where we met up with our speaker who led the delegation. The Inter-Parliamentary Conference was a very important one. Um, I suppose from Australia's point of view, the most important part, of course, was the supplementary item that was, was co-sponsored by Chile and, uh, and New Zealand. And, um, uh, that uh, related what to the, uh, Chile, to the adoption of a comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty and its implications for uh, continued nuclear tests. Uh, it was interesting to note that when the the, uh, uh, the conference, which consisted consists of some 130 odd countries, uh, almost a thousand people involved, we had li very little uh, problem being accommodated because the headquarters for the uh, conference was the, was the former palace of uh, the, uh, well, the executed Kikescu, uh, former dictator of Romania. Um, I remember Senator Burns describing to me the size of this building, but unless you've seen it, it's very hard to realise just what a huge place it is. It's the second biggest building in the world, second only to the Pentagon. Uh, totally constructed out of marble, and uh, uh, it, 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 its opulence is, is unbelievable to behold. Um, there were some, something like 6,000 rooms in this particular place. Any one of them was, was bigger or bigger than the Great Hall here in Parliament House. Um, the numbers of chandeliers, we, we run out of uh, fingers to count all those. I, there were literally hundreds of chandeliers through every building. Um, a lot of it's not finished. It took 20 years to build. It took uh, 2 million people, 25% of the GDP for 20, of, of Romania for 20, uh, 20 odd years, and uh, 
for all that time there was no food in the shops and the people were struggling, so it's really no wonder that they, they, they took hold of their, uh, their uh, leader and, and executed him on TV <coughs> along with his wife. No doubt it'll go down as one of the seven wonders in the world in years to come, like the pyramids and everything else. Uh, the parliament looked like moving into it and, and probably quite a few other important buildings. And of course, a part of, a part of the whole complex is the, uh, is the great uh, Champs-Élysées type uh, promenade that stretches from the building right through uh, as far as you can see, although it just does get lost in the smog in Lower Bucharest. And at the other end, I've got something like that's a, almost a carbon copy of the, uh, of the uh, Arc de Triomphe. Uh, they call R R Bucharest the uh, Paris of the East. I think uh, Kestu tried to make it look like that, um, but in typical Eastern European fashion, a lot of the buildings are run down and, and a lot of the things don't work, including the water in my bedroom. Um, getting back to the important matter of uh, nuclear-free testing, the Senate would be pleased to, to know that the final uh, text of the uh, uh, adoption of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty and its implications for continued tests was finally carried uh, on a vote of uh, um, 800 and, well, I don't think that was the final, the final vote was 933 affirmative votes, uh, 65 uh, negative votes and 356 absten abstentions. Uh, it was quite interesting that uh, um, the leader of the French delegation made the point that uh, uh, th these are old tests, they should have been carried out four years previously and he concluded by saying that he'd swum in the lagoon where the test took place. The last time was only two weeks previously and that he had not become radioactive and I think we we thought that was uh, quite unusual. There were three other items of, of, of note that were debated during the uh, um, conference and for those people who are interested I, I uh, commend this report to them and, uh, and certainly I think you'll find it very interesting reading. question is, will the Senate take note of the report? Senator Denman. Thank you. I rise to associate myself with the comprehensive report given by Senator Calvert on the parliamentary delegation to Slovenia and the 94th International Parliamentary Conference to Bucharest. This was my first experience of the delegation, and I don't know what I expected. I think I thought it was going to be a bit of a holiday, but it wasn't. We worked long hours and we worked hard, and the delegation worked well together as a group. It was good. I was impressed with the dedication of the group to the things that we had to do too. Um, we cooperated well. There, were no, no, there was no friction between us as a group. The tasks that we were given were basically in Bucharest to support the New Zealand supplementary item on nuclear testing, um, along with Chile. We supported them, and that item got up. And it was a privilege to be part of the drafting committee when the issue of the nuclear testing in the Pacific arose. And there was great elation when that issue got up as an item on the agenda. Because of the commitments of the conference, I didn't have any time to see anything of Romania itself. But I'd just like to share with you very briefly two things that I did do. One was to visit an orphanage caring for children from birth to four years. And in this orphanage, there were 84 children. The children were cared for in groups of nine or 10 in three rooms per group. They were doing a superb job under very difficult circumstances. The rooms were brightly painted. One room was a bedroom, and two rooms were used as playrooms. And the children were happy, and they related well to the people looking after them. And because of the difficulty of the circumstances, it's a credit to the people of Romania to see what I saw there. The second visit I made was to a hospital caring for babies born with AIDS. And I, my interest in that was to see what the Romanian people were doing about educating the people of their country with regard to safe sex and needle exchange and the AIDS problem generally. Now, they are trying, 
they haven't by any means made an impact, but they have tried and are trying. They've got very limited resources and therefore they're not able to get the message they need to to those who most are at risk. The hospital I saw or the ward I saw was sponsored by the Americans, so the equipment in that was probably superior to any other in the hospitals in Bucharest, and even that was very basic. So that was a very moving experience, and I feel privileged to have been able to do that. I want to very briefly say thank you to the other delegates in the delegation. It was a tremendous experience for me, and a particular thanks to Peter Keel, the secretary. Thank you. Um, the question is the Senate take note of the report. All those in favour say aye. All those against say no. The ayes have it. Are there any documents to be presented? Documents are tabled in accordance with the list circulated to honour of the senators. I have received a message from His Excellency the Governor-General notifying, uh, notifying absence to the following law. Sydney Airport Curfew Act 1995. Assent. Business of the Senate notice of motion number one standing in the name of Senator Shamrit for a proposed reference to a committee. Um, I call your attention to the state of the house. Quorum required. Thank you. Ring the bells. Hey, what, what Quorum present. Senator Shamaret. Um, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Um, the reason why this um, motion is coming up for debate now is actually an inadvertent um, error on my part, um, because the opposition 
moved another motion that seemed to me to contradict this motion. I actually didn't seek to uh, uh, move that it be accepted as formal at the time of formality. Um, as it has come up, I would be delighted if um, we could simply vote to support it and move on without need to uh, debate it in any way, because it is a motion, it's a, it's a reference, uh, the opposition aren't, but the government is. Yes, they are. This is a reference to the Environment, Recreation, Communications and Art References Committee, Standing Committee, and I move it um, because the, um, the committee has seen the terms of reference. The, uh, the section that they disagreed with was actually the, um, the date, uh, which was November um, the 23rd, which was last week. So what I will do is I'll seek leave to amend it uh, to uh, the first day of uh, June sitting, and uh, and then, uh, or at least the last day of the of the, of the June sitting of, of 1996 of the Parliament, and uh, put it to the vote. Uh, it is, as I said, a reference that the committee has seen, and they accepted in principle the reference, but they disagreed with the time on that reference. Um, I don't think that will interfere with the opposition's plan to go ahead with the motion that they moved in the notice of motion this morning. It will simply add to it because it will put on the notice paper something that the Senate um, that is being referred to in the opposition's notice of motion. So, uh, without any more ado, I move the amendment of the date to that of the last sitting day in June 1996, in place of the. Uh, report on or before the 23rd of November 1995 and move the motion that has uh, been put. Leave granted to amend the motion to a further date. Being no objection, leave is granted. Now an amended form. If I can just clarify for the minister, the previous date in the motion was the 23rd of November 1995, which was last week. I have changed that to on or before the last sitting day of June 1996 to give the committee ample scope to report. I just want to move the adjournment of this debate. Uh, I move the adjournment. Debate be adjourned. That comes. The uh, question is, uh, the Minister's motion be agreed to. Those in favour say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. Government Business Order of the Day, Commonwealth Bank's sale bill 1995, se second reading, adjourned debate on the second reading and on the amendment moved there to by Senator Calvert. Senator Margetts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, um, I'm speaking today on the Commonwealth Bank sale bill, another asset sell-off. Seems like I'm speaking against these shoddy budget fiddling measures all the time these days. I can't imagine that this situation will continue, however, since this sale, because there's really very little left to sell aside from physical infrastructure. However, we're already moving towards the sale, the sale of our national highways. I note that this bill it's this bill that led uh, the leader of the government in the Senate, Senator Evans, to make statements to the effect that any negative mention of this sale of the Commonwealth Bank by the opposition was purely spite because the Labor Party did it and now there's almost nothing to distinguish the ALP from the coalition. Perhaps a more extreme statement than Senator Evans would have made on a more reflective moment, but he was on a roll and should, uh, sounded like a good political point at the time. Unfortunately, it probably also has more truth than most people would wish to acknowledge. Why bother about the Commonwealth Bank anyway? It is, after all, just another big bank, same nasty fees and charges on pensioners and so on. The reason we oppose the sale is primarily the principal and secondary. secondary because the Commonwealth Bank, in spite of its hard-nosed corporate image, does, still does reflect some obligation to community. But these will disappear. Unlike the Airports Act, there are no stipulation for community service obligation in this sale bill. The Commonwealth Bank was established in 1912, although the legislative basis was created the year before. It was an outgrowth of both the basic social philosophy of much of the labour movement and the specific 
economic disasters in private banking during the last decade of the 1800s. During that time, a policy of non-prudential lending coupled with speculation led to the collapse of many banks and an even greater number which closed their doors for some period. It was also a basic plank of the international labour social movement that the people should, through government, directly be able to control those activities in their lives which established the parameters under which they lived and where the nature of social infrastructure made it a natural monopoly. In particular, energy, water, communications, transport and banking were seen as essential areas to have under public control. In regard to banking in Australia, the Commonwealth Bank always operated on the principle that it was a public presence in a private banking environment, except for the brief period during the Chifley government when an attempt was made to nationalise all banks. Much of the push for nationalisation at that time was an outcome of the Great Depression. The speculation and non-prudential lending of the post-war 1920s led not only to the Great Depression, but ultimately to attempts to regulate much of the financial sector, including through, uh, through establishment of the International Monetary Fund, which originally was designed to combat speculation and regulate currency, a function almost opposite of what it does today. The Commonwealth Bank has been conceived as an agency to give a measure of stability to the financial sector, to assure certain practices and services are available and to promote the sort of development, um, development government as representatives of polity believe to be of value to Australia. It uh, has actually performed many of these functions. It helped form the commodities pools, the wheat and wool boards at a time when there was extreme uncertainty in the agricultural sector. The Commonwealth Development Bank provided finance, uh, financing for agriculture and industrial projects which otherwise may have gone unfunded. And here I'll digress to, the point, uh, to point out that the Japanese and other Asian tigers have also followed a program of intentionally and aggressively promoting certain types of development through direct intervention, rather than rely on market forces, which would have kept them as low-wage, high-labour content nations. The Reserve Bank was also formed out of the Commonwealth Bank. The Commonwealth Bank has also been directly involved in providing service to communities. Um, senators who have spent much time in rural areas, if you think for a moment, will realise how many small communities have only one bank. The Commonwealth Bank, even if it's only a passport agency at the local post office, there's a commitment to the community there that every community should have access to banking at some level. What other bank has such a commitment? A few of the state banks spring to mind as possible examples, but of course, state banks have virtually disappeared. With the decision to sell the Rural Industries Bank of Western Australia, now called Bank West, in a tribute to Professor Spooner, to the Scots. Unfortunately, since the 1950s, there's been a steady erosion of both the concept and practice of public banks as agents of development, regulation or social equity provision. We've seen the banks restructured, corporatised, turned into government business enterprises, turned into private companies in which government simply has a majority share. At each step of this process, the banks become less accountable to the public, and there is an increasing onus placed on government not to interfere with the normal commercial operations of these companies. This means that any ability to promote social goals is reduced while the ability of government to manage, in the absence of regulation, also disappears. Effectively, banks are turned from an agent of development and social service into just an in investment of public money. As unfortunate, in my opinion, as the recent trend has been, it doesn't alter the principle that the people should have the collective ability to direct, directly affect issues of finance, banking and fund provisions. For that reason alone, would not support selling off the Commonwealth Bank. The fact that it's operating as just another bank, imposing the same bad interest rates, the same fees and charges on small savers, and follows the same kind of investment policy, doesn't mean that the people, through government, should lose all ability to reclaim this asset as a functional tool of social reform and financial stability. But what that's uh, what selling off the bank would mean. While it's difficult for anyone in either big party to imagine not selling the bank, it's entirely inconceivable that there'd be a party in power in the near future who would establish a new government-owned national bank. The decision to sell is therefore functionally an irrevocable abandonment of the public right and power to directly participate in banking. 
It's far more than the simple sale of an asset. In principle, we cannot support it. In practice, the sale raises a number of questions. As I've noted, many rural communities are too small to attract any commercial bank to establish an outlet. So far, they've been serviced because either the state banks or the Commonwealth Bank have a social commitment to provide such services. There are examples of synergy here that I've noted before, where the cost of establishing any government agency or presence in a community may require substantial subsidy of its own. The common practice of multiple use the original one-stop shop has allowed a post office to act as agent for the range of services, including banking. And government departments can work together on the basis that they are owned and serve the people, so can engage, engage in cost savings and assuring public access across departments. The question that arises from the sale is what will happen in relation to these small communities? Will a private Commonwealth bank spend money to assure rural communities have access to banking? Will it put in the capital for very long distance computer lines or satellite, satellite downlinks in order to service a handful of customers? How will the, manage, the maintenance of these facilities be justified when the profit margins on an automatic telemachine in a city core or urban business services are so much better? My guess is that rural banking will go the way of so many other many rural services. They'll be shifted to regional centres requiring huge, unproductive and inefficient inputs of time and money and energy for rural people in order to raise productivity and efficiency for some. And those terms are in quotes of the banks, are in quotes of the banks. Of course, maybe everyone um, will join the internet, sponsored by Telstra and Bill Gates, and will do their banking online. And maybe trickle-down economics will make the world's rich poor. I doubt it. But I look forward to seeing what the changes will be for this service. It will also be interesting to see what happens in relation to postal agencies. All postal agencies in rural areas still act as agencies for the Commonwealth Bank. Will the post office continue to act as agents for the privatised Commonwealth Bank? Will they have a policy to act as agents for any bank that asks? Will this be a special sweetener in the Commonwealth Bank sale? Will they stop the service? What will they charge? Competitive rates? Who's going to buy the Commonwealth Bank? My guess is that there are several major international banks that would love to establish a presence in Australia, but have been constrained by the difficulty of breaking into such a market from scratch. But if they could take over or gain a controlling share of the Commonwealth Bank, they'd be in. And what, uh, but whose interests and decisions would their policies reflect? I note with some concern that when we propose to privatise even management of airports, there's a whole large bill setting out some of the regulations, obligations and so on, of the private sector that the private sector must operate under. Where we privatise the Commonwealth Bank, there's nothing. No community service obligations. Nothing. It's seen as inappropriate to impose those on a single bank. So any social function the Commonwealth Bank continues to perform is simply written off as collateral damage as expendable and unimportant in the push for privatisation. For this reason, as well as the principle, we cannot support the bill. Privatisation, like any asset, is always put forward as a huge win, a massive windfall for government and government revenue. Economically, this is quite incorrect. An asset is just that, an asset, something good we have, something we have put money into, usually for a purpose other than pure investment. The money from such a sale is not new money. It is, hopefully, the, at least the current market value of that asset. It's not a gain at all. As an asset, the value may also rise uh, in value. A business, as a form of asset, will also generate income. This is aside from the more obvious use value of a government-owned service provider. That income will be forgone. How many years? Just a few years down the track, we will be down in our budget figures because of this sale. No, the Greens won't support this bill. We believe the sale of the Commonwealth Bank will be a sad day for the people of Australia. Senator Harraday. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, the Commonwealth Bank sale marks the end of an historic era. In the 19th century, government saw the establishment of savings bank and the promotion of thrift as means for promoting the development of Australian colonies 
and ensuring that working people could build up a safety net against financial vicissitudes. Thus, the Savings Bank of New South Wales was uh, established in 1832. Government savings bonds were actually sold through the post office. Some of us uh, are old enough to remember that. It is perhaps a sign of the times that not only the Commonwealth Bank is being sold, but so also is the beautiful Savings Bank of New South Wales building in Barrack Street. Some will say that habits of thrift and prudence are old-fashioned and that we have no need of a government bank. I don't agree. At a time when Australia is dis-saving, as never before, when we are running record current account deficits and Australian domestic savings have plummeted uh, to almost nil. I think we should reconsider the virtues of the past era, era when governments thought they had a public duty to build for the future rather than to spend for the present. The sale of the Commonwealth Bank is both a symbol and the reality of what's wrong with much of the government's economic uh, policy in this country. We are engaged in both a sell-off and a sell-out, a sell-off of the family uh, silver and a sell-out of traditional Labor Party and Labor movement policies. And principle. When Andrew Fisher, when his Labor government established the Commonwealth Bank uh, just before the First World War, I think it was in uh, uh, the year 12, 1912, um, it was an act of a Labor government that believed in the dignity of the working man and uh, the working woman. The Labor governments of those times uh, believed in thrift and self-improvement. They believed that the working people should be encouraged to lift themselves up and not be turned into state welfare dependents. They valued cooperative and mutual self-help. Thus they believed in tax exemptions for credit unions, friendly societies and trustee savings banks. But this government's uh, philosophies are different. It doesn't believe in fostering collective self-help by working people. It has increased tax on credit unions and friendly societies. It is introducing tax legislation uh, which um, will facilitate the demutualisation of life assurance uh, societies so that these repositories of the people's savings will no longer be under the control of the worker shareholders and the member policy uh, uh, holders. It did nothing to defend the interests of members who were presented with a misleading and deceptive attempt to demutualise the NRMA in New South Wales. It is introducing penalties on friendly societies in the de new deeming rules for Social Security. This government apparently does not believe that working people should be empowered to save. They should be forced to save and have no say over where their savings go. I don't see any virtue in this uh, government's claiming working people should be forced to save when it's selling off assets in the greatest case of asset stripping since the disposal of the crown lands by the colonies in the 19th century. How can the government lecture working people on the need to save when it has taxed them into the ground and stripped them of any surplus income out of which they might have saved? How can this government talk about savings when it is investing so little in infrastructure that it has invented a new payroll tax called the superannuation levy designed to create a new pool of money 
to make up for its failure to, inve uh, to invest in, in, in infrastructure. I do not favour this bill. It seems to have been conceived as a last-minute headline-grabbing exercise uh, to claim a budget service, uh, surplus in the, in, in the Treasurer's uh, last budget speech. This sale does nothing to generate real budget surplus. About the only thing to be said for it is that uh, the bank will be rid of a shareholder that no longer believes in investing in anything. Uh, this uh, bill is an epitaph of, uh, which marks a loss of national vision. It tells us all that we no longer. Uh, it tells us uh, that uh, we all no longer have a government that believes in nation building, in saving for the future, in thrift eco or economy in government, which will sell anything to pay for its promises it cannot keep, and which believes that massaging the media on budget night is more important than genuine good government. Mr Acting Deputy President, I, uh, I, I say these uh, things with some feeling. As you know, I was uh, involved very strongly in the attempt uh, uh, to, to, to castrate uh, the uh, uh, Commonwealth Bank uh, uh, many years ago, an attempt that was uh, uh, proposed uh, by uh, a Conservative government. Um, and uh, You can uh, call me sentimental if you like uh, and not facing up to the real economic world. But, uh, uh, and you might say that I failed to recognise that the Commonwealth Bank is in fact operating just as another bank. Now, I don't fail to recognise that, but I had hoped that whilst ever uh, the Commonwealth was the majority shareholder in this enterprise, uh, that the principles upon which the ba bank was founded by uh, Andrew Fisher uh, might have been able to be enforced upon the bank and uh, might have prevailed. It is obvious that the representatives of the major shareholders, uh, namely the Commonwealth, have not uh, been able, uh, or well, they have been able, but they have not pursued these principles for a long, long time. True, uh, uh, well, I might just um, finally make mention of something that's just occurred to me, and that is that, um, it w w that I understood uh, uh, that at the time uh, of uh, the uh, sale of Commonwealth Bank shares, there was an undertaking given by the government uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, it would uh, retain the majority shareholding in the bank. Now, of course, that undertaking is uh, being undermined by this legislation. What of the people who have invested? Uh, who have become, uh, who have invested on the basis of that undertaking? Where are they? Was that a false? Uh, uh, yes. Was well, that a, 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 a false pros uh, prospective? Um, Mr. Uh, Acting Deputy President, again, um, well, I, I suppose I should apologise to the committee for for for. And, and particularly the government for the, some of the things that I, 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 I did say, uh, uh, because I said them with feeling. Uh, I, I, I tend not to uh, criticise in those terms uh, generally, but I feel very strongly about this, and everything that I've said in this speech I believe to be accurate. I do oppose most strongly uh, the uh, sale of the Commonwealth Bank. The question is of oh, Minister.
Thank you. I uh, thank honourable senators for the contribution of the debate, which has already been uh, very well uh, uh, canvassed in the public media about the various positions um, senators and the parties they represent are going to take in this debate. Um, it is the government's strong intention the sale of its 50.4 per cent of the Commonwealth Bank of Australia shareholding proceed as announced by the Treasurer on the 9th of May 1995. The government envisions the first, um, the first of possibly two public share offers um, and possible and a possible CBA buy bank of government shares, but before the 30th of June 1996. <coughs> the passage of this bill without amendment is fundamental as part of this process. Uh, the task force on asset sales is responsible for the physical sale process. Sale process issues are still being looked at uh, by the uh, task force, and, the, and if the bill passes the Senate without amendment, the process will continue without hindrance. The sale of the Commonwealth 50.4 per cent of the Commonwealth Bank a shareholding will not have an adverse impact on uh, on management services uh, in, in financial services in rural in rural areas. Pardon? Pardon? Well, the, the, the well, for all due respect, Senator Kerno, the, the, the advisers take notes of what various contributors make through the debate, so it's not possible to run out. Oh. Well, uh, they were still making notes, and uh, I was just listening to the, uh, to the contribution made by Senator Harradine, who uh, made an impassioned plea for the retention of the bank that went back to 1912. Uh, pardon? Oh, well, I'm, I, I, I apologise if, if, uh, if uh, you feel offended by that. Um, there, there are a wide range of delivery mechanisms uh, for financial services in rural areas, and they, they, these do include EFTPOS um, uh, facilities. Over, overall, uh, the government believes that this is an, obviously is an important measure, and we do want, we do want this bill carried before the end of this week, unamended. Uh, we do note that the opposition is supporting it. Uh, we do note that the minor parties are opposing it. Uh, I believe there are amendments being proposed by the Democrats in the... Uh Pardon? Well, well we are... We are at the, uh, there may be, in the past, uh, people uh, and have been debated in the party. That is very true. We don't hide the fact that there are a range of opinion. But the majority of the parliamentary Labor Party, uh, the, par the, par the majority of the parliamentary Labor Party, overwhelmingly supported this measure to, for the sale of the Commonwealth Bank. And I have to say, I have to say, uh, as a minister for small business, seeing many of the complaints in the small business community about the problems of access to finance, access to uh, borrowing, access to equity. That, and I, over the last two and three quarter years as a minister, I have, but the, the, I have to say that, and even with the Commonwealth Development Bank, I have raised on innumerable occasions issues on behalf of, of small business who've had uh, who've approached me. Well, uh, the the issue that you had with the Commonwealth Development Bank is that when the as a as a subsidiary of the Commonwealth Bank. Two, two, two things started to, were starting to occur. One, the other commercial banks would not refer business to the Commonwealth Development Bank because in the end they believed that would mean that the Commonwealth Trading Bank would uh, have an advantage in gathering business and uh, clients. And, uh, that, that, uh, and I have to say in discussions with the private banks uh, in one way or the other they basically conceded that point. Uh, so the Commonwealth Development Bank was not having referred to it, was not having referred to it, applications from people who had failed uh, from the commercial sector. Mm -hmm. Those commercial banks weren't referring it. People had to go off and make their own arrangements to approach the Commonwealth Development Bank, 
and, over one, and in many cases the Commonwealth Development Bank uh, found that once there was a sale, once uh, part of the Commonwealth, develop, uh, Commonwealth Bank itself was, became publicly owned, uh, private, uh, became a uh, listed company, shares were listed, that uh, they themselves were under pressure, of course, to perform and not unnecessarily affect the bottom line of the bank. So uh, those issues, if you're talking about effect in the small business community in the lending area, no, 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 all I can say is over a long period of time, apart from the Commonwealth Development Bank, which was consistently, overwhelmingly looking at funding in the farming area, in the rural area, uh, as far as funding for the broader base small business community, there were complaints, which I don't in any way blame the officers of the Commonwealth Development Bank, uh, but there were complaints uh, that they weren't uh, providing the level of capital that should have been that, uh, that people wanted. Overwhelmingly, on the trading side, the Commonwealth Bank had long since moved away, long before any sale of the shares, any sale of the shares first took place a few years ago, had long since moved away for any notion of the description that uh, uh, Senator Harrodin had put here, and others have mentioned, Senator Margetts, going back to the vision of King O'Malley in 1911-1912. The, um, well, I have to say, Senator, I have to say you then have to take a major decision that the government will intervene and underwrite uh, those applications for loans that are considered more risky because they won't get them from the private sector. And uh, I have to say, at the, uh, I have to say, as coming from the state of South Australia, uh, when uh, uh, when banks uh, have been asked to go out or been allowed to go out of South Australia and, Victor uh, and in Victoria uh, during the 80s, they made a number of catastrophic decisions, which, in the end, the taxpayer had to pick up the loss. In my state, to the tune of over three billion dollars, all done by an independent board appointed appointed by in accordance with the legislation which said that there had to be at arm's length from the government when that legislation was established the then State Bank uh, in, 90, in the early 1980s uh, at arm's length. So it was at arm's length, but in the end, when they made bad decisions on investment, uh, the, uh, the bottom line was the taxpayers of South Australia had to bail out the uh, State Bank of South Australia to the tune of three billion dollars. Now, well, in South Australia, we were damned if we did, and we damned if we didn't. The State Bank in South Australia, if there had been an attempt to have it run closely by Treasury and the State Treasurer, there would have been indications of government interference, political interference in the lending processes of that bank. The bank's legislation was established to make sure that that didn't occur. So the bank had an independent board that went off and did what it did. When it all lost, when it lost a large amount of money, the government still got the blame for it. Now, uh, of course, the Commonwealth Bank did suffer some losses during the late 80s, uh, but fortunately, nowhere near the losses of the other commercial banks. And thank goodness they didn't, because uh, uh, the taxpayers, in one form or another, may well have been asked to pick up the losses and guarantee the losses. Uh, and uh, I think at that stage there would have been a lot of uncomfortable people in this parliament. So when people stay in this chamber and in the parliament about the need for the Commonwealth Bank to be there to provide assistance as a people's bank uh, in the nature of an of a international, internationally competitive economy that we now have in Australia that is not just a closed economy and the Commonwealth Bank is not providing just housing loans. Uh, is not more. Is a lot more than just a housing society, a variation of a sophisticated housing society. Well, then you are in a quite different world, and uh, the government believes that uh, the process, the process that we are going through, is quite a reasonable one. And of course, it was debated vigorously in the Labor Party and in the community. But the Labor, the government, did decide to uh, take these measures, and uh, we commend the bill to the Senate. The question is, Senator Calvert's amendments be agreed to, uh, take, taken as a whole. All those in 
favour say aye. All those against say no. The noes have it. Senator Calvert's amendments. The noes have it. Second reading amendments. The question now is the bill be read a second time. All those in favour say aye. All those against, against say no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Ring the bells. Oh, snapping. Lock the doors. The question is that the Commonwealth Bank Sale Bill 1995 be read a second time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Jones, teller for the ayes, 
and Senator Bourne tell her for the noes. There being 33 ayes and 10 noes, the question is resolved in the affirmative. Honourable Senators, please resume your seats or leave the chamber. Would Honourable Senators please resume your seats or leave the chamber? Clerk. A bill for an act to facilitate the sale of the Commonwealth shares in the Commonwealth Bank and for leisure purposes. So I just say that this time. Order. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it's so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Kerno. Amendment uh, is to the schedule, uh, Mr. Chairman. And this amendment seeks, as I said in my second reading speech, it seeks to ensure that the Charter of the Commonwealth Development Bank cannot be bartered away between the Commonwealth Bank and future treasurers because, as they see it, there are some uh, uh, fiscal imperatives to, to produce so-called budget surpluses. This amendment seeks to minimise the number of losers from this inappropriate privatisation. It seeks to ensure that these losers do not include the rural and small business operators who make up the clientele of the Commonwealth Development Bank. The amendment makes it clear that prior to the sale of the Commonwealth Bank, the future role and funding of the Development Bank is finalised and in a written agreement. This agreement would incorporate the charter activities currently set out in sections 72, 73 and 74 of the Commonwealth Bank Act. The clause would require that the memorandum and articles 
of the Commonwealth Development Bank would require that the charter could not be altered without the approval of 95 per cent of shareholders' equity. The third part of the amendment then requires that the Commonwealth cannot sell its share below 5 per cent or agree to changes to the charter without a resolution of both Houses of Parliament. None of this ministerial whim. This will guarantee that before the Commonwealth Development Bank chain role changes, there must be a public debt. Through the parliament, the rural and small business sectors who rely heavily on the Development Bank, they will be able to have a say on the proposed changes, whether they should or should not be supported. And this, uh, this amendment is attempting to put into black letter law the first limb of what we just saw in the opposition's second reading amendment. It's an opportunity for the Senate to say to the government, listen, we're not buying these empty assurances. We are very dubious about commitments given that are later breached. We're no longer prepared to make a pyrrhic stand on the second reading and then hope, maybe, that the government gets the message. It doesn't work like that. It is quite clear that unless we guarantee the future of the Development Bank in black letter law, the Commonwealth Development Bank will cease to exist probably sooner rather than later. Now, the government assures us, don't worry, all will be well. The Development Bank Charter will be incorporated into a written legally enforceable agreement between the Minister and the Commonwealth Bank, and the agreement is already largely complete. Well, the first part of my amendment provides a legislative necessity for completing this process. But the agreement makes it clear that the Commonwealth Bank will only agree not to amend the Charter while there is an adequate subsidy in place. Now, I don't, as I said in the second reading remarks, I don't get the impression that the Commonwealth Bank is terribly keen on its charter business. Its annual report made that pretty clear when it said, the bank's objective remains to achieve a proper commercial balance between the consequences of the charter and the size of any subsidy received in support of it. Now, read carefully, that means that the Commonwealth Bank doesn't see any community service obligation to continue to provide lender of the last resort facility to rural and small business operators unless they can make good buck out of it or unless the government pays. Why should they? They're a private company and the shareholders will respect a return on their investment. But trying to place community service obligations into a contract is not as not preferable, not as preferable as placing them in legislation. And so this amendment is a compromise, leaves them in contract and in the memorandum and articles of association, but it makes it clear that the federal treasurer, as the minority shareholder, will take his instructions from parliament as to how he will act. The amendment also makes it abundantly clear, well in advance of the float, that the Commonwealth Bank will have to abide by the charter whether it likes it or not. And that way, they can discount the value of their shares according to the restriction if they need to. We've heard a little bit about community service obligations, not a lot, as I'm uh, finding myself saying more regularly here, that whole concept of the public interest is a dying concept in this brave new world. But the community service obligations of the Development Bank are very important, and they're too important just to be ditched out like this. The Commonwealth does have a vital role in rural finance, and the Democrats believe that we shouldn't lose that, especially now with the financial pressures that there are on, on that area in rural finance. And, despite uh, what Senator Schott said, I do think the Development Bank plays a vital role in small business finance. We've got a third of small businesses still reporting that they are constrained by finance, and the Development Bank has a continuing role to play in plugging that hole in our financial system. 
So the Democrats are of the very firm view that the development bank should not be sold. I mean, even and we've heard all this stuff today about how times change and you know there's no role left for government to have a bank to set standards of any sort. That's all gone. Well, even if there was an argument that the Commonwealth Bank as a whole is operating on a purely commercial basis with no real public interest constraint, the role of the development bank is different. It does have community service obligations and public interest constraints, and these are set out in section 72 to 4 of the Commonwealth Banks Act. And before we say that it's not fashionable or it's not appropriate, I think we should look at where else a public sector intervention role has been employed recently in legislation. The first thing I'd point to is the One Nation package in 1992 in the form of a $30 million capital injection and a continuing $20 million subsidy to ensure that financing projects which would not otherwise qualify for, insist, for assistance indeed do so. Working Nation committed a further $2 million for the development bank for the advertising of its services to the small business sector. So the government recognises the strategic importance of a body like the, uh, the development bank. It should stay in public hands. It's really regrettable that the government is so determined to sell it. And I'd point out to the opposition parties and to all of those who've, who've made the observation in the debate that um, you know, we can't incur these, these, uh, these liabilities. We can't, we can't expect um, privatised entities to have to carry any kind of community service obligation. Well, I'd point out to them that it is not unusual to make a privatisation of a public utility subject to that entity maintaining certain community service obligations. I'll give you some examples. Victoria, the Office of the Regulator General holding a watching brief over privatised utilities. In New South Wales, the sale of the State Bank of New South Wales was subject to the new owners agreeing to a long list of conditions about the carrying on of, in New, so of New South Wales business, the security of employees, maintaining a New South Wales emphasis, and so on. In, in this parliament, when we were debating the sale of the Moomba Sydney gas pipeline, that ended up being made subject to an access regime, and a string of conditions also exist in the Qantas sale, entrenching Australian control of the board. So what's the good old development bank done wrong? Why not? Why not add this to the development bank? Aren't the value of its community service obligations sufficiently important to rural producers and small business to preserve them? If the opposition is not prepared to sanction a community service obligation such as this being entrenched ahead of privatisation on the of the Commonwealth Bank, we have to ask the question, how are rural communities and consumers of Telstra, for example, supposed to believe that if you win government, go ahead and privatise Telstra, why, why can't we then um, why aren't we then entitled to believe that you will do away with the current Telstra community service obligations? I mean, if you won't support them now for the Commonwealth Development Bank, what makes it any different for Telstra? So I say to the opposition, but I say to the National Party in particular, we've heard much hand-wringing, much angst, we've seen the statements that have been made down in the other place, I say to them, a second reading amendment is not good enough. You profess to be very worried about the future of the development bank. Well, here's the solution. Let's put the whole role and the financing of the development bank into a disallowable regulation, that enshrining the charter. Let's guarantee a future for this lender of the last resort, commonly known and appreciated as the farmer's friend. Let's have an end for once to all this wailing and gnashing of teeth against a measure on the one hand and then a very convenient, quiet little voting for it on the other. So you're about to be tested, Senator McGuire and Senator Boswell, if you're listening, and other members of the National Party. It's not good enough.
to stand up and say how terrible it is and then vote for it. I commend this amendment to the Senate. Senator McGoran. Yes, uh, Mr Chairman, we, we, we will be, won't be voting for these amendments, and I, I share the Democrats' uh, concern about the Commonwealth Development Bank. I think we've made that clear in our second reading amendment. But we don't believe it's right that uh, by getting out of the Commonwealth Bank, the government's divesting itself of the Commonwealth Development Bank and the Commonwealth Bank, selling it and retaining an 8 per cent share, that you should come back in. Uh, the Treasurer comes back in with a disproportionate power, virtually coming back with the same power over the development bank as, uh, as the government held previously, and that just goes against the principle of privatisation. Um, we don't believe the Treasurer should have the same degree of involvement in the, in, in the development bank as uh, in a privatised Commonwealth bank as he did where the uh, Commonwealth was a major shareholder in the past. Um, and let's face it, the, the major concern we have about the Commonwealth Development Bank is the loss of the subsidy. And, I, and, and if the government of the day, whichever p political parties it may be, I mean, if that subsidy is there, it's open up front for everybody to see, well then they show the, 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 their true colours, whether in fact they are supporting the Development Bank and are supporting uh, small business and the rural sector through that. Not through some other deal through the back door as it has, has it may have been occurring in the past, with, with a subsidy which is open for everybody to see. Um, and that's, that was our concern, that the subsidy uh, by the government of the day is, is, is continues to be paid to the, to the uh, Commonwealth Development Bank. And it may be that the government of the day decides to, do, to, to assist um, small business and, uh, and uh, the rural sector in other ways. Uh, not just through the development bank. I mean, that's a decision for the government of the time. What we're here and on about today is a privatisation, the complete privatisation of the Commonwealth Bank, and uh, we're opposing uh, the Co uh, Democrats' amendments uh, purely and simply because we don't believe the Treasurer, as an 8% shareholder in, the, in this bank, should have the, the, the powers that, uh, that uh, the Democrats are proposing in this, uh, in this amendment. Senator Ratchie. Mr Acting Deputy President, I concur with the view that Senator Calvert has in relation to this bill. And let me explain why. If you take the route that is proposed by Senator Curnow, you do, as Senator Calvert has said, create an, a disproportionate power in favour of the Treasurer. Now, it's also an inflexible route for this. Well, I'm going to tell you about the farmer, Senator Curnow, if you will stop bleating. The reason, the reason being that a future government may choose to deal with this in an entirely different way. A future government may decide, for example, to leave the Commonwealth Development Bank in there and to take, to take the loan portfolio out of the assets to be privatised and to put it into a different entity. A future government may find different ways in which it wishes to assist small business, and the transfer of, those, of the loan portfolio out of the bank before it is sold might be the appropriate way to do that. By, you, by the amendment that Senator Curnow has put before the chamber, she denies a future government that opportunity, and that's why I think that the amendment is short-sighted. Now, Senator Curnow should understand that there are very real reasons why we on this side of the chamber do not concur with her, and not because we don't care about farmers. We can care about farmers a great degree more than some of the nonsense that has come out of the Democrats. But our concern is to do things the right way. And what Senator Curnow is doing, Mr Acting Deputy President, has the potential to reduce the attractiveness of the, uh, the, the remaining tranche of the Commonwealth Bank, because institutional investors will say of the bank, we have concerns as to how independent it can really be, because we're going to have this federal treasurer leading over the bank's shoulders at every opportunity, every time there's some political pressure. Now that is that is inappropriate, that is short-sighted, and it shows Senator Curnow does not understand the sensitivity of the market when you come to do these privatisations. I mean, the fact is, Mr. Acting Deputy President, that I do happen to know a little bit more about privatisations than the capital markets of Senator Curnow, and anything. Anything of this nature runs the risk of degrading the value of the remaining stake in the bank. Now, we see the best way, if it's to remain within the Commonwealth Bank, 
to be done by subsidy. And then, of course, good banking practice has to prevail. There is a subsidy and that meets, that meets the Commonwealth's obligations. But if you are to say, look, we want a private sector bank to receive a Commonwealth subsidy and, on top of the subsidy, ignore good banking practice for whatever reason, then people are going to say, people are going to say, we don't want to take a stake in this sort of bank. They're going to say, we believe this reduces the potential for profit and therefore we believe it reduces the value of the bank as a privatised entity. And, and, conflict between the government and, the and it creates conflict with the government of the day and nobody, nobody who's a banker wants to have a conflict with the government. In other words, you are saying to, to whoever buys a stake in the bank, look, come and put your money up, put your money into this bank, and I'm going to get onto that in a minute, Senator Kerner, put your money into this bank and just put your head on the chopping block for every argument with the treasurer of the day every time the political heat gets a little bit too much. And I don't think any sensible banker wants to put his money up in, in that regard. Now, Senator Kerno then says, where do the farmers come into this? As, as though, as though just cha chanting this mantra is going to achieve some sort of intelligent contribution to the debate. There are ways in which we can deal with the concerns that the farming sector has. And Senator Kerno, oh, I've just told you once already, Senator Kerno. Look, look, Senator Kerno, no, Senator Kerno, you weren't listening, and I'll repeat it for you. But quite frankly, my patience is wearing a little bit thin. I said that a future government may decide that the best way to deal with it is to transfer the loan portfolio out of the Commonwealth Bank prior to privatisation. Point of order. Do you think, Mr Chair, that we could direct the speaker's comments through the chair rather than a nasty mm. fight across the chamber? Uh, uh, well, Mr Acting Deputy President, I accept that, but I would also accept the fact that I have a right to speak without continual interjection from the far end of the chamber. Now, I, I, well, on the point of order, I think if there, if there were fewer interjections, I'm uh, sure that Senator Ochi would speak through the chair. Senator Ochi. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As I was saying, the, a future government may choose, for example, to take the loan portfolio out, to transfer the loan portfolio out of the Commonwealth Bank, in which case the, the named entity Commonwealth Development Bank won't actually have any loans to farmers anyway. That's what they did with the housing department. As Senator Calvert has said, that's, that's something that was done with housing loans. Yes, exactly. And that would be a perfectly feasible way to do it. But of course, those who just continually interject, what about the farmers, without actually listening to the answer that's already been given in relation to that point, show that they do not understand the slightest bit of banking practice. It is not the named entity with which we should have concern. It is the loans that that entity currently has on its books. And if at a future date, and remember this privatisation is not going to occur until after the election, if at a future date whichever government is in power chooses to take a different route in relation to the loan portfolio that is currently in the name of the Commonwealth Development Bank and it meets the concerns of the farming sector, well that's fine. We don't need to concern ourselves with the named entity anymore. It's the loans that are of more concern and we in the coalition just don't, do not accept the fact uh, that uh, this is, do not accept the assertion that this is the best way to deal with those concerns. We believe it to be short-sighted, we believe it to be inflexible and we believe that it shows the, the ignorance of banking practice by those who move this, this amendment. Senator Margetts. Mr Chair, um, I can understand the rationale behind uh, Senator Kerno's amendments. The problem that we see is that the government wants to have its cake and eat it too. I think it might end up not having it, not eating it, and it actually might seem a much simpler outcome. The government wants to sell the Commonwealth Development Bank along with the Commonwealth Bank. At the same time, it wants the programs and loans of the Development Bank to continue. It proposes to sell the bank with a guaranteed subsidy to assure this. If the government wants to keep the Development Bank going, I can't understand why it can't, as a majority owner of the Commonwealth Bank, sell the Development Bank to the Commonwealth. It would then administer the Development Bank in whatever way it likes and promote the policies it likes in the most direct manner would be ultimately accountable to Parliament. I don't actually see that as a bad thing. It makes far more sense than to sell the Development Bank along with the Commonwealth Bank, have the new owners of the Commonwealth Bank on sell the Development Bank and then have the government subsidise an unknown 
private sector owner to attempt to have an influence on its practice. Frankly, the latter course seems to be a virtual guarantee of a bad outcome. The government objective is to primarily sell the development bank. I guess uh, it can do so. Either it should have a vehicle for acting upon investment policy, or it should abandon it, or it should regulate that all banks have certain obligations. This creation of a hybrid private sector quasi-government business enterprise reminds me of nothing more than the government's attempt to create a private sector superannuation industry that it can run to accomplish its policy objectives outside of parliamentary scrutiny. It's bad practice and the success of such a strategy is extremely dubious. Uh, the Democrat amendments are substantive. They effectively say that the Commonwealth can't sell the Commonwealth Bank until 15 sitting days after it gets an agreement, including the whole raft of things that have been specified under their proposal section 3A. We have some problems with this amendment, as I mentioned. I understand the intent and appreciate what the, um, what's being trying to be done here, but I think the effect is to try to make the government, government's scheme work under their functions section in subsection A. They basically outcome a good intention for the development bank to continue as was originally intended, that is to provide funds for industry and primary producers, especially small business. But the test is in the opinion of the development bank, which would now be in private hands. Their opinion may vary significantly from that of government or parliament. In subsection B, it seeks to tie a private bank to accordance with policies approved by the Treasurer. In other words, it seeks to make a private bank exactly the sort of quasi-government business enterprise that I referred to above. There is no provision at all for such an organisation to report to Parliament, in spite of the fact it still gets government subsidy and no provision at all for the Treasurer to be accountable for the policies promoted or endorsed in regard to such a quasi-GBE. This is a dangerous precedent and the fact that um, Democrats have proposed a general definition of functions doesn't make it less dangerous, since it's clearly a definition subject uh, to interpretation that can't be questioned. The final section of con on um, contributions may also be a problem, and there is an undefined agreement for expenditure of Commonwealth money with no real mechanism for accountability of either the development bank or the minister. I'm sure that estimates would just show it as an expenditure for subsidy of share subscription as a public company rather than a true public sector company, the Development Bank, and wouldn't need to even give Parliament an annual report. In short, though, as I said, I appreciate the sense in which it's put forward and, as we all do feel, fairly desperate and depressed by this whole measure, um, we can't support the amendments. As I've indicated, if the Commonwealth wishes to assure loans are available for certain purposes, and to have some measure of control for such investments, then it should do so through a business it directly and accountably controls. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. I'd also like to weigh in on this debate in the committee stages ever so briefly. We have heard the full debate now on this uh, most important, important bill regarding the sale of the Commonwealth Bank, and uh, there's no doubt that the minor parties and Sen Senator Harradine have um, uh, been emotionally attached to this debate, particularly Sen Senator Kernow. Not only has she given a second reading address and a committee stage address, but uh, she's consistently been uh, interrupting the speakers along the way. Such is her emotion on this particular bill. But, um, uh, and, and in many respects, rightly so, that uh, there is a great deal of uh, uh, community attachment to the, to the Commonwealth Bank, given its origins and its ideals that go back to 1912. And just because Senator Schott, just because they're back to 1912, doesn't make them any lesser an ideal or uh, any more old-fashioned the origin at, at, at all. Uh, but um, so, you know, for all intents and purposes, we're quite aware that, that, that the Given whatever the, the perception of the Commonwealth Bank, real or not, probably not real, it is a very romanticised bank, and uh, we, we, we understand that, that, that. That we know the public attach themselves to to certain banks. Look at my state of Victoria, when the, when its state bank collapsed in 1990, and uh, was was ironically taken over by the Commonwealth Bank. But such was the attachment of, of uh, the local 
depositor or the local investor in, in their, what they considered their state bank, that they weren't willing to transfer their funds across to another bank, even though it was the Commonwealth Bank. They saw the Bank of Melbourne there as a great opportunity of keeping their money in the state as, as they saw it. So there, there is, and good, I'm glad there is, a sentimental attachment to, to the banking sector. That's part of the competitive nature. It's not, it's not, not all uh, as rational as uh, many from that side of the House would lead us to believe. Um, but but uh, ha having, having said that, uh, I have to again address the government's attitude on, on this particular bill. They only had one speaker, one speaker address this bill in the second reading stages, and I dare say we won't be getting any up during the, during the committee stages. And that was Senator Realwright, the new senator, virtually unknown to this chamber, virtually unknown to the public. They've, they've, uh, they've wheeled in Senator Wheelwright to, to, address, the, to address this bill. Now, now, given the emotion and the importance of this bill, as we say farewell, as we privatise common, Senator Boswell is, I'm sure, Senator Boswell is watching this debate line by line on, on his television set in his room. And uh, he holds the same sentiments as, as the coalition, and he knows all too well the origins not only of the Commonwealth Bank, which was a Labor Party initiative, but of its attachment, of its attachment, the Development Bank, which was uh, one of Artie Fadden's uh, uh, invent uh, not inventions. Um, it was Artie Fadden, the National Party leader, who established the Development Bank. Now, to, just to allow me to finish on the government. Now, this is very disappointing. Now, this chamber has every right to be emotional about this bill. Both sides of the House, I have no doubt, have mixed, mixed feelings about this, but the time has come to privatise the Commonwealth Bill. But where is the left wing of the party that have made the Commonwealth Bank, like the National Party would the Australian Wheat Board, they have made the Commonwealth Bank the cornerstone of, of their ideology and philosophy? Where is uh, Senator Carr, Senator Coates? Senator Colston and Senator Childs, the four big C's from the left. Where are they on this particular bill? Can't they even muster the slightest bit of emotion on this bill? We know which way they're going to vote, and we're not asking them to cross the floor with the Democrats, but can't they even just contribute a minute to this, to this debate? They were, they were rolled embarrassingly at budget time. They were caught by surprise. They were ambushed at budget time when this sale of the bill was dumped on their desk. But since then, they've now ha had time to at least find some form of words that won't sell the government out, but still they can have down on paper for their little socialist meetings down at the uh, Trades Hall to show that at least, at least they contributed something, something to this debate, that they just didn't roll over once and twice on, on this particular bill. That's where the real disappointment is, Senator Curnow, that they haven't got the courage to, to put, uh, put their view even in the most mildest form, and not even to wave goodbye to their final cornerstone, to which they built a whole socialist dream upon. It's, it's the end for them. And they won't even have the courage to even come in the chamber. They haven't even come into the chamber it to sit here. I see Senator Colton. It might, be, order, it might be better to get back to the amendment. Well, the, the, point is, uh, <laughs> minister, the point is, Minister, as I said, we're all entitled to our, uh, our uh, views on this particular bill. We won't be supporting Senator Curnow's uh, amendment. And it has to be asked, why didn't Senator Curnow support our second, second reading amendment? Well, why didn't you ask us to separate it for you? I never heard you. No. Well, look, Senator Curnow, you know, you're, as usual, you're splitting straws. There's the amendment for you to support. You had the numbers on that. It goes straight to the heart of the, of the Commonwealth Development Bank, a National Party initiative way back in, in 1960, just pre-Jack um, McEwen days, They're in fact seen as the golden era of the National Party. Now, look, the point is, Senator Kernow, you know, don't cry crocodile tears for the Commonwealth Bank. It was long lost when the first tranche was, um, right. was, was privatised. Order on my right and order on my far pocket, whatever it, it is. It, 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 it is critical that, uh, that the market remain 
competitive in the financial sector, or we will have a closed financial market, and the client, and, uh, and the consumer, and the depositor uh, will uh, will be the losers. And so, ironically, now we've reached this stage, the private, the full privatisation of the Commonwealth Bank will, in fact. Uh, um, add to the, the competitiveness of the market, that an unleashed Commonwealth Bank will be able to uh, take on the other top three banks. But at the moment, it's handicapped. So a, an unleashed Commonwealth Bank, in many respects, Senator Kernow, is going to add to the competitive nature of the financial sector. And it's also critical, it, it's, it's also critical that, uh, that the regionals and the small banks uh, be, be protected in some form or, or other, and that's been done by the Trade Practices Commission. The, the rise of the regional, regional banks ha have, uh, been, have created a tremendous amount of fresh and invigorating competition in the financial market against the top, the, the top four. Now, the Trade Practices Commission recently handed down a ruling that has set in place a, a, a competitive a competitive financial banking sector, and that is that in each state, each, uh, each, there, there must be at least one major regional. In Victoria, the Bank of Melbourne. In New South Wales, that would be the um, St George Bank. And uh, in Queensland, Bank of Queensland. Thank you, Senator, Senator O'Chi. Now, those banks are, are, are serious competitors against, against the top four banks. They've now joined the market, and indeed, uh, S Senator Kuno, that's that's where the real competition will come, and uh, real, not not from a government-owned Commonwealth Bank. Um, for for that reason, we we won't be supporting your your amendments in, in relation to uh, adding extra powers to to the Treasurer. We see it a, a different way that the the Treasurer's inter intervention powers will, in many respects, possibly stifle. The maximum return for, for sale of the, of the Commonwealth Bank. We're concerned about the subsidy, the subsidy route for the uh, Commonwealth Development Bank. Again, we ask the minister, when he addresses this chamber, what is the future of, of that subsidy? What is the future of the Commonwealth Development Bank? And uh, does, in fact, it have a future at all? The Honourable the Minister, Senator I'll just, just make one, one brief comment. No amount of bluster, whether from Senator O'Chi or Senator McGoram, can disguise the rationale, the mantra that we're hearing here. And that mantra is maximise the price and minimise the obligations, because that's what Bank, best banking practice requires. Now, I just don't think that farmers will place much store by the kind of alternative that Senator Roche raised this evening. They want someone, having looked at what they would see as banks' practice over the last couple of years, and we see banks closing down branches in rural communities all around Australia. That's what banks' best practice and good banking practice means these days. Maximise the profits, maximise the price and minimise the obligations. And uh, I just think it's a, a great pity that um, members of the National Party would try and dress up a debate in this way because they are deserting the farmers who have severe concerns about what the end of the Commonwealth Development Bank, as they have relied upon it, really means for them, and who's going to replace it? The Honourable Minister, Senator Shirt. No one else is speaking to the amendment. I'll respond on some of the points made. The community service obligation will continue as outlined in the Memorandum of Association of the CDB. The bank will continue to lend to small and medium sized businesses, including in the rural sector. The government will continue to pay a subsidy to the development bank accordingly. The Commonwealth has already provided a commitment that it will enter into a legally enforceable agreement with the CBA prior to the transfer time as defined in the legislation for the future operation of the CDB. The agreement will provide an undertaking by the CBA that it will not use its voting power to repeal or amend the CDB's charter, which will be, which will in, be included in the CDB's 
Memorandum of Association. The CDB's charter will not be changed. That is the charter currently in section 72 and 73 of the CBA Act 1959 and will, be, and will be in the CDB's Memorandum of Association. The shareholders agreement will also define the annual subsidy arrangements. The shareholding of the CDB will be owned 91.9 per cent by the CBA and 8.1 per cent by the Commonwealth of Australia. The proposed amendment fails to recognise this fact. The amendment should not be accepted as it may contravene corporations law. This, this, this amendment could raise a number of serious corporations law issues for the CDB, which is to become a public company under the corporations law. The amendment would remove the normal powers of the shareholders from the corporations law to the parliament. This is unacceptable given that the Commonwealth is only a small minority shareholder. So I think uh, dealing with the amendments moved by the Democrats, those, the, the government uh, uh, responds to those and explains why the amendment is unacceptable. My other concluding comment is that I did listen to some of the remarks of Senator O'Chi and Senator McGoran, and I must say that for a, a large part of their remarks, I thought they were actually supporting the Democrat amendment and had the same view of the Democrat, uh, Democrats, which, uh, so therefore, I think it's a bit cheeky, Senator McGoran, of you to say that there are people in the Labor Party who are embarrassed by this, uh, by this legislation, when in fact it is quite clear a large section, I think, of the National Party are embarrassed from it, probably because of the old saying in rural Australia or about the policies of the country party as it then was and now the National Party <coughs> is that it's basically about socialising your losses and capitalising your gains in economic policy in the rural areas of Australia. Uh, so I think it is a bit cheeky for you to uh, uh, make that uh, political, make that point. We are quite open about the fact that yes, there were people in the Labor Party and there are people in the Labor Party who are unhappy about this measure, but a substantial majority of the Labor Party supported it in the Parliamentary Labor Party as part of a budget measure, and uh, the legislation will be supported by the government, and I ask the amendment to be rejected. Senator McGowan. I just, I just want to put it to the Minister one, one more time, because, as I understand it, he told us uh, in relation to the subsidy that, uh, that, that it, its future will, will be announced in, in the, uh, the shareholders' agreement. I'm asking the minister, is there a future for the subsidy? Will the subsidy be maintained? The Honourable the Minister. I that the uh, subsidy will be defined in the shareholders' agreement, and the shareholders' agreement will be publicly uh, available before the sale. Well, the question. And on that, perhaps is, a, um, is there a process by which the subsidy would be withdrawn if it wasn't being used for the process specified? The Honourable the Minister will be continued to be provided so long as the Commonwealth Development Bank. Uh, continues to provide the service uh, that, uh, uh, that is in the memorandum and in the agreement. The question is, Senator Ricketts. So in that sense, what is the process of accountability by which the minister makes a decision about whether or not the subsidy continues and whether the bank's actually, uh, well, it's actually doing it? Subsidy, it will be an appropriation in the, in the annual budget and it will be debated in the parliament. Senator Herodin. Uh, an appropriation, uh, it will be debated in the parliament. So are you suggesting that it will be done in a separate measure uh, in the way that the uh, Senate uh, uh, could uh, amend? The Honourable well, Minister. The, 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 uh, the, uh, um, the, the subsidy will be obviously uh, debated in the, and prepared as, by government as part of the budget process and therefore will be put to the parliament and it will be uh, in, the, uh, in the normal measures. Now you're asking whether it's in the appropriation bill or a specific separate measure I think you're asking. That, um <coughs> 
It will be, I, I think I'd have to say on the advice I've got so far, it will be in the uh, portfolio outlay and it will be in, therefore in the, I understand it, that means it probably will be in the, I would imagine, in the appropriation bill. Senator Haraday. Suggesting that it will be in the, um, uh, the uh, uh, supply bill, uh, the ordinary annual services uh, bill, tacked on to that, are you suggesting? Yeah. Minister. Uh, well, um, I just simply raise the point that uh, uh, that uh, tie, that I, I don't think, um, frankly, I, I doubt. Well, I take your word for it that that's what the government intends, but uh, I would seriously suggest that the government reconsider that intention because what, it will fall. <coughs> it would uh, fall foul of uh, uh, of um, uh, the um, uh, well. It would uh, present serious difficulties uh, for the. Um, Senate in exercising its powers, although I don't think in the long run the, if the uh, Senate would uh, Senator, I quibble. Well, it's been pointed out to me, of course, at the moment we are providing an annual subsidy to the CDB of $20 million. And that is in the portfolio allocation uh, through the, in the Treasury line and the Treasury Department uh, because they're responsible for the Commonwealth Bank, the Treasurer responsible for Commonwealth Bank to the Parliament. And that will be the normal process will continue. Senator Haraday. Uh, the, the point being that uh, we're talking about the sale of the Commonwealth Development. No, I know, I know. But <laughs> it's one thing to provide a subsidy of $20 million, I think was the amount last year, <coughs> uh, for um, uh, the uh, banks, uh, for the bank, because it had the community obligation and the uh, and uh, it had uh, presumably the uh, uh, the government looking over its uh, shoulder to ensure that the community obligation um, was observed. It's another thing entirely uh, for, uh, uh, for for the government to act to act in a similar fashion uh, when um, the bank is is privatised and. Um, and uh, this uh, obligation is simply uh, a part of an agreement. Now, all I'm asking you is, uh, well, what I'm pointing out to you as well, is what happens uh, in future years in respect of that particular agreement? What happens in future years? Minister? So I'm advised, I'll just point out to you, is that the present, sh the, in the, uh, as I pointed out, that the uh, shareholding for the CDB will be 91.9 per cent by the CBA and 8.1 by the Commonwealth. I'm advised that is the existing shareholding structure of the Commonwealth Development Bank. That is not changing. So that and the subsidy that they were getting is the arrangement of the subsidy continuum. Now the amount obviously may well uh, change from time to time uh, and will be debated uh, in the parliament uh, as part of the uh, budget appropriation. So we're not selling the Commonwealth Development Bank, we're not changing the existing structure in shareholding arrangements of the Commonwealth Development Bank. So I think that ought to be put on the record and made that quite clear. And the subsidy arrangement of how it is presently being provided on an annual basis is in the appropriation bill. Uh, the outlays for uh, coming uh, when it's uh, printed in the appropriation, the budget, the outlays uh, for the Treasury Department uh, or the minute for the Treasurer is responsible for the Treasury Department and for the Commonwealth Development Bank. Can I just uh, uh, point out uh, to, to the committee uh, that um, it's not the same shareholding arrangement. It is not the same shareholding arrangement. What you have is 91 per cent uh, uh, owned um, uh, by the Commonwealth Trading Bank, which in turn is majority owned by the Commonwealth. I mean, you cannot get up here and say it is the same ownership because, uh, in other words, uh, that the Commonwealth don't have the same say and muscle over what happens. <coughs> so, really, it's not appropriate for you to get up here and suggest that. Uh, suggest that please. 
No, I accept that point, Senator Haraldine, that uh, because the Commonwealth, uh, the Commonwealth, uh, uh, the CDB, the Commonwealth Development Bank will be owned 91.9 by this Commonwealth Bank. Is, now that the Commonwealth Bank is totally sold off, that uh, therefore that public sh that uh, that percentage 91.9 now is diff got a different combination because it's partly uh, owned by the private sector and partly owned by the, the Commonwealth. I accept that. But I have pointed out the agreement for the operation of the Commonwealth Development Bank will be a shareholders agreement and a memorandum of understanding and that will be made public so that the way the subsidy will work will be publicly transparent. Now, obviously someone may disagree with it, but it will be publicly transparent. And each year there will be, a, there will be obviously a line in the outlays for the Treasury Department or for the Treasurer's Department saying what the subsidy is for the Commonwealth Development Bank. Now, I know the point you may well make, well, if it's in the appropriation, it's a bit hard to get up and move an amendment, etc., in view of is this changing the budget and so on or the, and stopping supply, etc., etc. But I'm sure a public debate about the size or the lack of size of or how it's being used of the subsidy would create more than a passing interest in the community so any government who tried to be a bit slippery about it, to use that term, would have to take their chances of uh, the public uh, opium of not being able to, of not being able to justify what they did. And I think that public transparency is the major protection. And in view of the fact that there is a lot of interest on all sides of this of this chamber, no matter how people are voting here, and we've had an example uh, of some members of the National Party. Uh, yes, all right, and I'm, so I'm sure that if, uh, knowing full well that if the clients of the Commonwealth Development Bank, and there's overwhelmingly, they are in the rural sector at the moment, knowing how well farmers organise through their organisations, I'm sure they'd be rolling stuff down here pretty quick if they thought the Commonwealth Development Bank was being got at because the subsidy had changed adversely, or the memorandum or the shareholders agreement was being undermined in some way. There would be a very public debate about it. That transparency is the major protection for the long term from all sides of politics. The question is the amendment moved by Senator Kerno be agreed to. The, those of that opinion will say aye. The contrary, no. no. I think the noes have it. No. Is a division required? Division is required. Ring the bells.
lock the door. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Kerno be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I point Senator Bourne teller for the ayes, Senator Rauchi teller for the noes. Order the result of the division being ayes 7 and noes 30. The question is resolved in the negative. Would honourable senators please resume their seats? The question before the chair is that the bill stand as printed. Aye. That, uh, if, you, if you just hold on a moment, Senator Harrington. Senator Harrington, if you could just hold on a moment, I'll wait till there's a, a, a little bit more silence. Senator Haradine. Um, could I just uh, ask the minister, in respect of the subsidy uh, for the new CDB, um, uh, 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 newly owned CDB, um, what uh, appropriation, what number appropriation bill is uh, that uh, to be included in? Could he, if he can't say now, could he ta please take I'll that take on? The question is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. And run the bill. Order. The uh, chairman of committee, temporary chairman of committee, Senator Colston, reports that the committee has considered the Commonwealth Bank Sale Bill 1995. And agreed it without amendments. The adopted. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Move the bill be now read a third time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. A bill for an act to facilitate the sale of the Commonwealth shares in the Commonwealth Bank and for related purposes. Government business order of the day number two. International Shipping Australian Resident Seafarers Grounds Bill 1995. Second reading adjourned debate. Senator Margaret. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, the Greens WA welcome this initiative to promote Australian shipping and Australian crews and will be supporting the passage of this bill. I understand that both the Australian Ship Owners Association and the Maritime Union also support this bill. Many people will be aware of the ongoing concern that I have had in relation to Australian shipping and in particular to the industrial relations, transport policy and environmental concerns. It is absolutely vital for this island continent that we have a viable and safe Australian-owned 
or controlled shipping industry, and this government should be committed to ensuring this aim. Unfortunately, this initiative is one of the few positive policy decisions that have emanated from the Minister of Transport in relation to Australian shipping whilst I've been a senator in this parliament. In fact, the broad thrust of the government's economic and trade policies to promote international free trade and competitiveness at any cost has in fact acted against the interests of the Australian shipping industry. I can't afford to accept the international trend to lower standards in safety and labour standards all in the name of international competitiveness. We've seen many examples in recent years of the potentially disastrous effects of a major shipping accident on the fragile ecosystems of our large coastline. I trust that this bill, which will assist ship owners in maintaining Australian crews on Australian flag shipping, will pass. We'll see some more positive initiatives from this government to protect the Australian shipping industry and the Australian Maritime Union. Senator. I haven't got a list here. Senator Tierney? Oh, that's oh, the um, Well, I thank the senators for the contribution to the second reading speech and uh, commend the second reading to, the, uh, to the, uh, the bill to the parliament. We'll take a vote on it, may as well. It's not going to be divided, are we? Yes, Oh, are we? Mm. Well, the question, the question is the bill be now read a second time. Those that opinion say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. No. I think the ayes have it. Division is required. Division is required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is that the International Shipping Australian Resident Seafarers Grants Bill 1995 be read a second time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Jones, teller for the ayes, and Senator O'Chee, teller for the noes. There being 30 ayes and 26 noes, the question is resolved in the affirmative. Clark. A bill for an act to make provision for the payment of grants to employers of Australian resident seafarers on certain Australian operated ships. Pursuant to order, the sitting of the Senate is suspended till 8 p.m.
we already done it as a whole. No, 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 we we can start in committee. Okay, we just start in committee. Uh, is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it's so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Tierney. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, the Coalition will be supporting this bill. And the purpose of the bill <coughs> is to give effect to the following 1995-96 budget initiatives announced uh, in May this year. The cessation of the uh, gifted and talented children's scheme resulted in a saving of 1.1 uh, million during the 1996 uh, calendar year. The cessation of the uh, gender equity program resulted in a saving of 1. Uh, Five million. Mm. And the cessation of the Order. rural uh, hostels uh, program resulted uh, in the savings of. Order, Senator Tinney. Um, we're addressing the International Shipping Grants Bill. I thought we'd finish that bill. Not so. Um, the, <laughs> that being the case, I put the question. The question is the bill stand as printed. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The question is the bill now be reported. All those in favour say aye. All those against say no. The ayes have it. Uh, the temporary chairman of the committee, Senator McGoran, reports that the committee has considered the International Shipping Australian Resident Seafarers Grants Bill 1995 and agreed to it without amendments. Be adopted. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. And the bill be uh, the bill now be read a third time. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye, against say no. I think the ayes have it. A bill for an act to make provision for the payment of grants to employers of Australian resident seafarers on certain Australian owned ships. <laughs> Government Business Order of the Day number three, States Grants Primary and Secondary Education Assistance Amendment Bill number two, 1995, second reading, adjourned debate. Senator Tierney. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. The Coalition will be um, supporting the bill, and the purpose of the bill is to give effect to the following 1995-96 budget initiatives announced in May this year. Firstly, the cessation of the Gifted and Talented Children's Scheme, resulting in a saving of $1.1 million during the 1996 uh, calendar year. Secondly, the cessation of the Gender Equity Program, resulting in a saving of $1.5 million a year and the cessation of the Rural Hostels Program, resulting in a, in a saving of $1.1 million a year. The uh, commencement of transitional support in non-government schools to assist with disabilities to make the transition to mainstream school education or pursue further training or employment, and this program involves an expenditure additional expenditure of $3.2 million in the calendar year 1996, and five, the extension of the early literacy program leading to the expenditure of an additional $8.9 million. The Coalition will not be opposing the measures in this bill. In taking this position, the Coalition is not giving its imprimatur to the decisions made by the government which are included in the bill. Indeed, in office, the Coalition may well look again at some of these decisions. The government's actions in the 1995-96 budget means that no new grants will be provided in the 1996 for key programs in primary and secondary schools. The program to improve the learning experience of girls, the special project for non-government rural uh, schools and hostels, and the ending of the program to assist gifted and talented children these decisions are all very short-sighted and educationally unsound. However, it is clearly unreasonable to ask the Coalition to act as a de facto government in this instance and make judgments about expenditure priorities to this level of detail when it does not have the advantage of the advice and perspective of the government's many public servants. It is for this reason that the Coalition will establish a commission of audit immediately following the next election. After 13 years of Labor government and Labor expenditure, it is not only necessary but vital for Australia that we make a very detailed and critical look at how and where the Commonwealth government spends the people's uh, resources. 
This bill provides funds to extend a number of programs introduced by the government over recent years. It also withdraws funding from a number of other programs. Where the government has withdrawn funding from the program, I would welcome the government explaining to the Senate on what efficiency and effectiveness grounds the decisions for withdrawing funding has been made. If efficiency and effectiveness were not grounds for withdrawing funds, the question needs to be raised as to why funding was provided in the first place, what performance measures were established for the programs and what evaluations were conducted of these programs. These are not merely academic questions. Under the government's own reform of the public service, uh, performance measures should have applied to these programs and should have been on the basis of evaluation of these performance measures that the government would have made these decisions to withdraw funds. The coalition would welcome the government advising the Senate on these matters. The decision in the bills to withdraw funding for the three programs that I mentioned earlier were the decisions of the Labor cabinet, a Labor government, advised by a public service, but with responsibility resting entirely with the Labor Party, its ministers and its parliamentary representatives. The coalition wants the government to be judged by the Australian people on this sort of record. Its record will now include withdrawal of funding from the Gifted and Talented Children's Program, from the Disadvantaged Program and the Isolated Girls, and for access to school schemes for isolated children from rural communities. And let the government uh, defend its record. The coalition will not be opposing these measures in the state government grants bill. Senator Bell. Well, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, uh, we've been <coughs> told in uh, some detail by Senator Tierney what the, the uh, provisions of the bill, the bill are, and uh, uh, there's no way uh, I can disagree with his description. It is accurate and uh, quite succinct. But uh, I'm a little concerned about the, the uh, circulate Circu well, the circle that he drew in uh, attempting to uh, explain where the coalition uh, was, was getting any logic from its position. It went something along the lines that we heard before the 1993 election. We're not going to oppose this, but in government, we're, uh, when we get into government, we're going to have another look at it. And I really think that that, that leaves most people in Australia are somewhat confused, if not concerned, that <coughs> you're either supporting a bill for the reasons that it deserves to be supported, or you're not uh, fully enough informed about an issue to adopt a position which is uh, a position you'll continue to have next year. And um, as far as the Democrats are concerned, we think it is much more honest to, uh, to state the position and, uh, and then to stick by that position. We, ha we had this sort of argument, I, I seem to recall it, with uh, the pensioner shares issue, which pursued us in this place for some time. And I seem to recall it uh, being trotted out in a number of other issues as well. Not prepared to oppose it, but prepared to suggest that somehow or other it will be a priority uh, for, a, uh, for a different government, if that's the case. Um, we're told here that this, uh, we were told in the um, second reading speech by the minister that the initiatives which are, uh, the, uh, the elements uh, of programs which are to be cut by this, uh, this bill are elements which uh, are described in the second reading speech, which I must say occupies one page of the Hansard uh, the, the, uh, for the Minister in introducing it. But we're told that these initiatives have either served their purpose or are now more appropriately the responsibility of other bodies. Now, um, the, um, the previous speaker, Senator Tierney, um, participated in, as a matter of fact, uh, was quite a keen participant with myself in uh, an inquiry conducted by the Senate uh, Committee on uh, Education, Employment and Training, inquiring into state-federal financial relationships. 
And as chair of that committee's references uh, committee, uh, Senator Tierney has also chaired inquiries into uh, various aspects of education uh, which on which state and federal financial relationships impinge strongly. And uh, with myself, Senator Tierney has heard witnesses from all around Australia who are concerned about the way education is heading in Australia. And he, with me, has heard a great number of witnesses suggest that uh, they're concerned about the way that state education departments are taking opportunities to uh, substitute, to use federal money to meet the obligations that the state departments have and to uh, abrogate their own responsibility and not properly fund ed uh, state education. And, and Senator Tierney says, says, by way of interjection, that this is something which is very difficult to measure. But what he has heard with me, time after time after time, has been witnesses who, are, who have said that tied grants at least identify the end purpose of the money and at least can be evaluated as to whether the money has been spent on that which it was intended to be spent on. And here we have three programs which have had uh, which have been identifiable, which have uh, had a priority attached to them, and which the electorate at large can see whether the money has been spent in that area. And our concern, as far as the Democrats uh, are concerned, is that we, uh, we see this government and the state governments making arrangements, whether they be at ministerial councils or whether they be at uh, COAG meetings, uh, making arrangements on uh, how the, uh, the federal state uh, financial arrangements will be, uh, will be arrived at, about uh, where the spending priorities will be, and those arrangements are then brought into here for what is best described as ratification and what uh, sometimes is more accurately described as rubber stamping. Because we have had, and on the last occasion I recall it was uh, Minister Cook suggested with one of these uh, concoctions. It wasn't in the education area, but was, it was in an area where it was uh, suggested that this chamber shouldn't amend, modify, change, challenge, or even look carefully at something because it was subject to, and I think uh, Senator Cook's phrase was, the weight of agreement of all the states of Australia and the federal government. The implication was, who the heck are we to put up our hand and say, excuse me? Now, uh, that is, of course, uh, uh, making the role of this place and the role of the federal parliament into one which is certainly not designed to be. And uh, so, so the, the people of Australia are not silly. They recognise the threat to their own sovereignty, their own uh, demo democratic processes. They recognise the threat that this, um, this sort of arrangement uh, brings about. I'm not suggesting for one moment that this is a bill which has uh, been through that sort of process. But in um, removing three specific programs, it, uh, it, it is heading towards a trend which is uh, not a trend which has been supported by those very people who have uh, made their, um, brought their evidence to committees on which uh, I've shared the uh, inquiry table with Senator Tierney. And, um, there are people uh, who are concerned about this trend and who would, would, uh, would like us to do something about its continuation. As a matter of fact, I received a, uh, a letter today from the National Association for Rural Student Accommodation Incorporated, and uh, it was dated the 22nd of November this year. So it is current and it is a, a concern which is held by, by this group. And uh, I'll only read the, uh, the first part just to, uh, to enable the Senate to, uh, to understand the, uh, the direction of the concerns. It is a little too detailed to take any further. It was addressed to me and it, it, uh, it, uh, it reads, we ask, Dear Senator, we ask that you make urgent representation on our behalf in support of the inclusive submission of the Commonwealth Government presented to Ross Free, Minister for Schools, Vocational Education and Training, seeking his urgent consideration of funding to the association 
uh, from January 1996 to enable uh, the association to undertake an ambitious three-year program of information, training and communication support and professional development for the rural student hostel industry. Now, um, this group is doing this at a time when the government is, uh, is writing with these concerns at a time when the government is uh, uh, making uh, cuts to a program which is directly associated to uh, associated with this group's concerns. And uh, it, it may well be that the association is uh, doing a, a post-stable door operation here, but it may also well be that uh, this is uh, reflective of the, uh, the government saying that such a, an initiative is more, now more appropriately the responsibility of another body. I don't know. I haven't had time to go into the details, but I, I hope that the government is uh, informed and that the minister does minister free does pay attention to uh, to the concerns of this group i uh, i hope the government isn't cutting a program which is uh, which is in the interests of the group that is written to me um, the uh, the other parts of the bill which deserve comment of course are those which uh, again senator Tierney has mentioned but uh, which makes it very hard to uh, adopt a position which totally opposes this, uh, th this, these provisions because um, the government uh, is, is expending more money in the areas of disabilities integration and the extension of early literacy. And uh, they are significant amounts and uh, they are worthy of support and even congratulation. Um, the, uh, the problem is that all of these uh, things have been lumped into in together and the concerns that we may have about the uh, gifted and talented, the, uh, the, uh, the gender issues and the rural hostels, um, that these have been cut while the others have been expanded. Now, uh, my simple position on those is that uh, the, uh, the entire funding of education in Australia uh, is seen as a problem area by the number of people who have uh, made submissions to and have appeared as witnesses at a number of inquiries and uh, committee hearings that I've been uh, that I've attended, as well as communicating um, in person with me, so that we see uh, a. Uh, a collection of their uh, concerns being represented by the trend to uh, fund education on, either under general purpose grants or in a, in a manner uh, which removes the capacity of this chamber and this parliament in general uh, to amend, to oppose, to comment, to modify. Uh, we see those processes taking place in another forum, not a representative forum, a forum which is exclusive and one in which negotiations can take place uh, without being influenced by the parliamentary process. That is of great concern to us. We feel, uh, because the coalition will not oppose this, we feel uh, cheated of the capacity to, uh, to exercise any democratic change. And because uh, the government has bundled these uh, provisions together in the one bill, we feel um, also cheated of the opportunity to uh, to make a significant uh, stand about them. So we are frustrated by this, and I use this opportunity to express that frustration. I um, I don't promise that the Democrats will uh, will, will grant passage to this this uh, concoction. Um, I'll listen to the debate. Minister. Uh, I th thank uh, those senators that have made a, a contribution on this uh, important uh, piece of legislation and uh, commend the bill to the Senate. The question is the bill will now be read a second time. Those in favour say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. A bill for an act to amend the state's grants, primary and secondary education assistance bill 1992. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole 
There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that this bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The chairman of the committee, Senator Reid, reports that the committee has considered the States Grants Primary and Secondary Education Assistance Amendment Bill No. 2, 1995, without amendments. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I move the report of the committee be adopted. The question is the report of the committee be adopted. Those in favour say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Mr Acting Deputy President, I move that the bill be now read a third time. The question is this motion be agreed to. Those in favour say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the state's grants primary and secondary education assistance act 1992. Uh, Minister. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I move that intervening business be postponed until after consideration of the following government business orders of the day. Number six, excise tariff amendment bill number two. 1995, number seven, Customs Tariff Bill 1995, and Customs Tariff Legislation Amendment Bill 1995. Question is: This motion be agreed to? Those in favour say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Clerk. Government business order of the day: Excise Tariff Amendment Bill number two, 1995, and two associated bills. Second reading. Adjourned debate. Senator Power. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, we're debating. Uh, the uh, Customs Tariff Bill and Associated Bills, the Customs uh, Excise Tariff Amendment Bill, Customs Tariff Amendment Bill. And I think I'll address first of all the, we're debating these cognately, the Customs Tariff Bill. And the purpose of this bill is to redraft and consolidate the Customs Tariff Act 1987 and to incorporate the harmonised commodity description <coughs> and coding system classification modifications. This system, Mr Acting Deputy President, was developed in 1988 as a classification system for administering imports and exports and for collecting foreign trade data. The system was established by the Customs Cooperation Council, which is an international body to which Australia is a member. The harmonised system is now known as the Harmonised Description and Coding System and is the international tariff system sponsored by the World Customs Organisation in Brussels. The new system will replace the former outdated one by providing a universal six-digit code, removing old domestic subheadings and the archaic tailored Australian tariff. Once implemented, the universal classification and coding system will be of assistance to international trade. The universal code is essential in the modern world of the global economy, where a countless number of goods are being traded internationally at all times. The new system will incorporate new products that have come onto the international trade market in recent years. Value-added, technically advanced products and components emerge without a suitable separate tariff classification to cater for them, which leads to the introduction of these new classifications. Australia is adopting the classification changes as agreed and will be adding 200 national tariff splits to maintain its tariff program. The harmonised system is essential to the collection and quantification of foreign trades as statistics. And this is essential for Australia to monitor trends in world trade so that we can develop essential mercantile strategies. There is a new item 17 of the bill tightening the eligibility definition in respect to goods that are exported from Australia and may be altered overseas. This is where Australian industry sends materials overseas <coughs> to be enhanced using relatively cheap foreign labour and then to enjoy a duty-free return to Australia. This item introduces a more surgical definition which will discover, discourage labour going overseas for Australian products. The bill provides for the duty-free importation <coughs> of goods which are replaced under a safety recall. This covers goods which have been sent to consumers to compensate them for a product they have already purchased which has a design fault or safety concern. It also allows for duty-free goods which are part of a repair process to replace goods exported from Australia for repair or renovation. The main body of the bill is a technical implementation of a more updated system to administer imports and exports in Australian customs and to collect statistics on foreign trade. This in effect constitutes a con consolidation of the original Act. The new provision in this legislation 
are reasonable additions in the interests of Australian labour, industry and consumers. And the Coalition supports the implementation of a new tariff classification regime in order that Australia can become a cooperative and efficient player in world trade. We must not jeopardise the Australia's ability to meet its international agreements, especially in respect to trade, and must maintain our reputation as a facilitator of trade. It is a pity, Mr Acting Deputy President, the Labor Party continues to tarnish its image on this front with its multiple failures in the realm of microeconomic reform. The Customs Tariff Legislation Amendment Bill contains five schedule of amendments to enact a range of changes to the Customs Tariff Act 1987. The main purpose of the bill is to increase the excise on light fuel oil. This provision is in Schedule 4, and Schedule 4 amends the Customs Tariff Act 1987, which has effect from July 1, 1995. It is the schedule has produced the statutory enforcements of the Customs Tariff proposal already tabled in Parliament, which proposed an increase in the excise of light fuel oil as defined in the bill. The increase will bring the rate of excise on light fuel up, oil up to the same rate as diesel fuel. There have been operators who have shifted to using light fuel oil to take advantage of the reduced excise. The bill contains other amendments to the Customs Tariff Act 1987. Schedule 1 amends the Act, having effect from 17 March 1995. And this amendment follows an Industry Commission report which required into the Customs Commercial Tariff and bylaw system in 1990-91. This amendment will change the tariff treatment of textiles used in manufacture, repair and maintenance of aircraft. Textiles used in the manufacture, repair and maintenance of aircraft are subject to a concessional rate of duty of 2 per cent. This amendment will remove the concession given to textiles and goods made of textiles and goods for use in the servicing of aircraft. <coughs> the tariff rate of these textiles will be the conventional rate of duty of all above 10 per cent. The materials, which include generic items such as seat fabrics, will be subject to the normal tariff rates that apply to textiles. Schedule 2 amends the Tariff Act having 1987 having effect from 1 April 1995. This is intended to restore the intended level of assistance to blood packs and blood pack systems such that it, it does not face an immediate removal of the 10 per cent tariff. This amendment is a result of a classification challenge to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. As the blood, blood packs industry stands, having operated so far under tariff protection, it would be uh, effectively decimated by the instantaneous and comprehensive remo removal of tariff assistance. The industry should be allowed to move in consonance with the overall tariff reduction phase down. Schedule 3 amends the Customs Tariff Act, having effect on 10 May 1995. On 13 December 1994, there was a joint ministerial statement announcing a package of measures that were aimed at facilitating adjustment by the Australian tobacco industry towards international competitiveness. These measures were in response to the Industry Commission Report No. 39 of June 1994, Tobacco Growing and Manufacturing Industries. In, in this package was the removal of customs duty from tobacco leaf, manufactured tobacco and tobacco products from 1 January 1995. The Customs Tariff Amendment Act No. 2 1995 instituted amendments to make imported unmanufactured tobacco and tobacco products free of customs duty. This was done in order that our local tobacco growing industry would contract with exposure to international competition. This was desirable in, fact in the face of industry commission report. And the IC report advised that tobacco products was a marabund industry and had existed in an artificial environment created by the Tobacco Industry Stabilisation Scheme and the Local Leaf Content Scheme. The removal of customs duty from leaf and tobacco products was a concession that the tobacco industry agreed to in return for a contribution from the state and Commonwealth governments for uh, financial assistance and an ad valorem tariff and long term contractual obligations from the cigarette manufacturers. This amendment will increase the duty on imported manufactured tobacco and tobacco products by 10 per cent. The increase in duty on tobacco products is also consonant with the coalition policy of dissuading people from smoking. The Excise Tariff Amendment Bill No. 2, 1995, will incorporate Excise Tariff Proposals 1, 2 and 3 
of 1995 into the Tariff Act and will enact changes to the excise treatment of condensate and top crude petroleum. The bill has many provisions. The microbreweries, this bill removes the excise, rate of excise applicable to beer produced from microbreweries and U breweries from indexation. Microbreweries and U brews are prepared home brewing kits which allow people to brew their own beer. When this category of beer was made excisable in April 1994, the applicable rate of excise was not intended to be subject to indexation. And this section removes the rate of excise on these products from indexation. The excise on manufactured tobacco and tobacco products. The bill raises the rate of excise duty on manufactured tobacco and tobacco products by 10 per cent. This rise in excise on tobacco products is confluent with the Coalition's health policy in regards to tobacco. The, uh, the, physical there's the, the amendments to the physical characteristics of fuel oil to effectively exclude light fuel oil. Light fuel oil will become excisable, the same as diesel fuel oil. This addresses the issue of transport industries using light fuel as an alternative. Mr Acting Deputy President, the aviation amendments are the ones I now wish to direct my attention to. And I will be foreshadowing in the committee stage of the bill a request for amendments to the, uh, to the uh, aviation gasoline in respect of the charge being made on airline services. The, um, in, in the budget, the government increased the duty on aviation gasoline, Avgas, by 1.84 cents a litre and increased the duty on aviation turbine fuel, or Avtur, by 0.883 cents per litre. So the uh, Avgas, of course, is the fuel used in piston engine propeller aircraft, the ones most used by the general aviation industry. Avtur is used in jet aircraft and in turbine powered propeller aircraft. The duty rate on Avgas is now 19.652 cents per litre. <coughs> the duty rate on Avtur is much lower, 2.451 cents per litre. The Avtur duty is much lower because most of the duty on Avgas, about 17 cents per litre, is, signed, is assigned to Air Services Australia to pay for air traffic services used by Avgas powered aircraft. Avtur operators, the jet aircraft, pay for the air traffic services they use through a system of charges, in other words, a user pays approach. Both Avgas and Avcur users pay the same 2.45 cents a litre for air safety regulation. In July 1st, on July 1st, the Civil Aviation Authority was divided, of course, into two organisations. The Civil Aviation Safety Authority, or CASA, which is responsible for air safety regulation, and Air Services Australia is responsible for managing the air traffic control and other allied systems, firefighting and so on. CASA's 1995 budget was $86.3 million, a figure that was substantially higher than the CAA's aviation safety regulation budget for 1994-95 of $61.5 million. In 1994-95, the safety regulation duties on the two fuels generated $24.3 million. The 0.883 cents per litre increase in the duties is forecast to raise an additional $22.5 million, increasing CASA's revenue from the fuel duties to $46.8 million, approximately 43.5 of the total, or 93 per cent, would be generated by the duty <coughs> on aviation turbine fuel used by jet aircraft. The Coalition recognised the need for an increase in CASA's funding to pay for safety. We will not be opposing the increase on duty on Avtur, nor will we be opposing the 0.883 cents per litre in the air safety component of our gas. As I pointed out, however, most of the Revenue generated by Avgas is allocated to funding airway services used by Avgas operators. Earlier this year, the CIA recommended a 3.4 cents per litre increase in the airway services of the component, which was rejected by the, <coughs> the uh, government following a lot of industry concerns. 
The, uh, instead, it announced it would increase the component by 0.964 cents per litre. This would raise an additional 1.1 million a year. I have indicated that I will be moving an amendment, and in fact a request, to reverse this increase in the airway services component of the duty. The Coalition believes it is a request. For, just, uh, for the Minister's interest, I have found out just in the recent half an hour it must be a request under the Constitution. <laughs> uh, the reason being, Minister, is that apparently— okay. um, The Coalition believes it is inequitable to recover with a fuel duty the cost of providing air services, airway services to general aviation. <laughs> Many, in fact most general aviation operators and private pilots use the airway system only rarely but still have to pay thousands of dollars a year in duty. For example, agricultural operators are now paying the government an average of $7,800 per plane for services which they never use, unless they happen to have converted their aircraft to AV2, in which case they don't pay at all. The uh, government has conceded that the current funding system is unfair. Air Services Australia is currently conducting a review of the services it provides to general aviation, and this will include a review of the way the cost of service is allocated. Mr Acting Deputy President, we in the Coalition do not believe that there is any justification for increasing the airways component of the avgas duty while that review is being conducted. There is no justification, we believe, at this stage of making the present unfair system evenly, even more unfair. Uh, the dashing Senator Spindler. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. The Senate is debating the Customs Tariff Legislation Amendment Bill 1995 and the Excise Tariff Amendment Bill No. 2 1995. And the importance the Democrats attach to these bills, Mr Acting Deputy President, may be gauged by my attire tonight, <laughs> and uh, I, I have some, uh, some difficulty in understanding why the minister can't match it, because these bills are extremely important, um, and Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, and uh, I, I, I shall deal with some of the more significant aspects of the bill. Uh, Schedule 1 of the Customs Tariff Legislation Amendment Bill 1995 alters the treatment of textiles used in the manufacture, repair and maintenance of aircraft. Currently, textiles used in the manufacture, repair and maintenance of aircraft are subject to a concessional rate of duty of 2 per cent only. The amendment in Schedule 1 of the bill will remove the concession available for textiles and uh, used in the servicing of aircraft and which are used in the manufacture, repair or maintenance of aircraft. Such materials, which include generic items such as seat fabric, will be subject to the normal tariff regime applying to textiles. Schedule 3 of that bill increases the rate of duty on imports of manufactured tobacco and tobacco products by approximately 10 per cent. And the Democrats, Mr. Acting Deputy President, support the use of higher taxes to discourage the consumption of products that are known to have contributed to the deaths of tens of thousands of Australians. Schedule 4 contains a number of amendments. The first changes to the definition of fuel oil so that light fuel oils attract the same rate of duty as diesel fuel oil. The second amendment will increase the price of aviation gas by 0.883 cents per litre of aviation kerosene and by 1.847 cents per litre on aviation gasoline. The Coalition, however, are unhappy, I understand, about this increase in the price of Avgas, and they argue that it is inequitable to use fuel duties to recover the cost of providing airways services to general aviation, particularly when some rural operators do not even, do not even enter into controlled airspace. The Democrats certainly uh, believe that there is uh, a point in this argument and have, a con have great concern for the costs that are loaded onto people in country areas who are struggling to make ends meet. The government has acknowledged the potential problems with such a pricing structure 
and has stated that new charging arrangements are being considered by Air Services Australia. Government appears to be saying, as Acting Deputy President, allow us to increase the price of fuel and we'll deal with the distributive effects later. On balance, however, the Democrats believe that the Coalition's view is the better one and we will be supporting their amendment. Now, it is my understanding uh, that the government uh, uh, wishes to ensure that this amendment is not retrospective and that the collected uh, funds uh, so far uh, remain uh, in uh, the government's hands. Um, I, I certainly would uh, support any amendment which would uh, ensure that uh, uh, the, am the amendment of the coalition doesn't have uh, retrospective effect. The Senate is also debating excise tariff amendment bill number 2995 and schedule two of that bill increases the rate of excise on manufactured tobacco and tobacco products by 10 percent. Consistent with our position on the previous bill, the Democrats will not be opposing this aspect of the bill and indeed we welcome it. Schedule three measure, mirrors the provision in the previous bill. Item one of schedule three of the bill changes the definition of fuel oil in the Excise Tariff Act 1921. It changes the definition of fuel oil so that light fuel attract fuel oils attract the same rate of excise as diesel fuel oil. In addition, Schedule 4 proposes to implement changes in the excise treatment of condensate and topped crude petroleum oil, uh, topped crude oil. Uh, Second Deputy President, we have heard from uh, a number of sectors in industry, particularly uh, rail transport and uh, some tourism operators who say that they will be hard hit uh, by this uh, redefinition of light fuel oil. But the facts of the matter are that uh, a lot of uses uh, of light fuel oil were only suddenly found to be appropriate uh, when it was found that money could be saved um, compared with ordinary diesel fuel oil and in many areas it was not the appropriate fuel to be used. If there are good and sound arguments uh, for reducing the cost of uh, diesel fuel for some operations, then that should become the subject of exemptions. And I can see the minister going pale at that. But, uh, <laughs> and I know it is an issue uh, that has been a very live issue for quite some years now, and we're only just now moving towards a uh, a tightening up of the regime so that the revenue losses through the diesel fuel rebate, uh, excise rebate, are not uh, uh, getting out of hand. Uh, but that, I believe, is the best way of dealing if there is an argument that uh, certain uses in industry should be supported by a reduction in, in energy costs. Um, with that one exception, then, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, that I foreshadowed, uh, concerning the amendment by the uh, opposition, the Democrats will be supporting these bills. Senator Margetts. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I'm rising to speak um, on the customs tariff bill because it's being debated cognately with the excise tariff amendment bill number two. I won't make, waste much time on this. I know the Coalition have indicated support of the bill, so there's not a great deal of a point, but I'll just put a few things on the record. I think this is a classic example of what should not be occurring in the Senate. Here we have a 946-page bill. It's just passed in the House a little over a month ago and dropped into the Senate. The government considers it so little problem that it made it cognate with two other bills. All three have spent almost no time in the other place. The other two are being introduced in the Senate today. So much for scrutiny. We're told that the Customs Bill doesn't require scrutiny because it's basically a technical reclassification. This isn't so. If it were, the speed with which this is moving through the Parliament might be acceptable. It is not. The changes in this bill, perhaps Minister, um, through you, Mr Chair, if you listen, you might just find out what the bill is about. The changes in this bill are not just technical reclassification. They are substantive changes that will incur 
um, costs of hundreds of millions of dollars. These changes are simply buried in this tome. If they were presented on their own in a separate bill, we all know they'd probably be debated substantially. They will not be, because no one can cope with ploughing through 950 pages to figure out what's going on and then consult with the community and so on. They'd rather preserve the myth that this is just a technical bill. I note on page 129 of this bill that there's an introdu introduction of a definition, a definition that never existed on the prior act, in the prior acts. It's not obvious. There's nowhere a mention that there is this new definition. What the definition does is to reclassify diesel fuel oil. It will impose hundreds of millions of dollars of extra cost mainly on our nation's railroads. Of course, the railroads are owned by the state, mainly the state governments, but don't simply expect this to be a transferred cost from state grants back to the Commonwealth as a fuel tax. We all know the cost will be transferred to the users of the railroads, mainly primary industry. It will increase the cost of fuel by about 26 cents per litre. Now I note that in the explanatory memorandum there is no mention of this change, a change involving the imposition of hundreds of millions of dollars on wheat farmers and other primary producers. It wasn't worth a mention. In fact, there is no mention of the chapter it occurs in. The Exmo on page 9 goes from chapter 26 to chapter 28. Changes to the definition of dental floss are considered important, but not a change that will impose about $260 million on farmers. Significant damage to the competition position, competitive position of rail. The minister asked what the point of this discussion. I would think if we were pointing out that buried in this tome are significant changes which the government has actually put in such a way as to not get a debate, the point is this is why, Minister, we are here in the Senate. I ask if this change was left out in the mention of the explanatory memorandum, what other changes, significant changes, are buried in this bill? Who has examined it in detail against the previous legislation, the bill as at 1989, with all its subsequent amendments? Maybe there are changes here to building tiles. Has anyone checked? Maybe there are changes to luxury cars. Who knows? Government knows, but it's obvious from, from the fuel oil issue it's not willing to tell. I think it's a disgrace that the Senate should pass this bill unexamined, and I firmly believe that it's not been adequately examined. We have no idea of what the impact of this bill is likely to be. One thing is clear, it goes far beyond simple harmonisation of standards. I could uh, go on about the importance of rail or the impact of fuel oil changes to rural communities. It's been said before, and if you want to know more, consult Hansard. I'll say a few things about the supposed environmental benefits of this measure the government is trying to sneak through. Firstly, I'd like to say this will do very little to improve the environment. What's being done is to reclassify some fuel oil as industrial diesel. This means that petroleum companies may now sell the same fuel as industrial diesel to all buyers, where before they were selling a higher grade of fuel and only to those who bought fuel oil could get this grade. Secondly, the evidence of engineers in New South Wales and Western Australian rail services are that railroad engin engines can be and have been designed so they can use fuel oil more efficiently than industrial diesel oil. They have done particulate testing and emission testing and it runs cleaner. There are engineering efficiencies gained in the way the fuel fires. So for rail applications, current fuel oil is the cleaner fuel. I won't go any further, but I'll say that this issue and all the other issues in this bill are not being adequately exam examined or debated. The government should be ashamed of itself for this. It's a shameful thing to undermine the scrutiny of legislation. The coalition should be ashamed of itself for allowing this pile of unscrutinised legislation to, to slip through the Senate with no justification other than the invocation of the magic words World Trade Organisation Obligation. Given your disdain of international treaties, I'm always irritated when uh, we count out of that one. What you really have, what you really have, um, have is disdain for international environmental and human rights standards. Trade treaties that give power to global corporations are quite quite different. I'm disgusted at this bill and the fact that it will pass here virtually without question. Minister. 
I was going to say we should thank the senators for their contribution, but after Senator Mark Getz's contribution, I'm not quite sure that I could say that, Senator. Can I deal with your comments first about the Customs Tariff Bill 1995? You, got in, you came in here in your remarks and said, because this is a thick bill, that uh, there was some swifty being pulled by the government. That is just not right. This bill does not change any level of tariff amount paid anywhere. This bill has been out, this document has been available to the industry, to that large class of people called consultants, advisors, lobbyists, etc., who uh, live on this, this material. I've been told by my advisors they have received no complaint that any tariff has been increased or changed surreptitiously. Well, changes the excise. Is it? Page one. Well, this is. Well, as I say, uh, that whoever said that to you has not. No one has told us. No one has put it to us. Uh, and I look at page 129, and I don't know which level here in the definitions you've got, where the only one on that whole page that I can see that actually talks about a tariff is uh, a descri description at the bottom of the page, and I hope I've got this right. It says, coal gas, water gas, producer gas, and similar gases, other than petroleum gases and other gaseous hydrocarbons, 5%, or DCS free. Now, all the rest are listed as free. At the top of the page. But she says one twenty nine. It's changed the customs tariff legislation bill as carried forward in twelve months time. The definition of crude oil or top crude oil is in the Legislation bill. The, the definition yes. is in the customs, the, the customs Tariff Legislation Bill of 129. For purposes, well, I'll just for the purposes of the fit. Well, the, that doesn't change. The definition is legislated as from the 1st of July this year, and those changes are then carried forward into those 12 months. But when it does come in, it doesn't change the tariff. No, no. This doesn't come into, I'm advised, that this additional load at the top, which you referred to, the definition, doesn't come into effect till July of next year and does not change the tariff level. That's what I'm advised. No, but that is, that is the fuel oil, uh, like fuel, which is in another bill. You've got this, I have to say, I think, Senator Margetts, and I'm very cautious of saying this because I accept the fact that three cognate debates, three different tariff, uh, tariff bill and two customs excise bills can lead to some confusion. However, I believe you've got this confused with a light fuel oil bill, which is in the other bill. Well, well, I don't think that is right. We have not had that raised with us by the industry, and I have to say, I would have thought the industry would come and see us first before anybody else, including, I'm not in any way denigrating the position of the Greens, but I would have thought in this, in this issue of definitions, they would come and see customs, and I'm advised by customs, but nobody has raised this query of a definition. So, all I can go on. I would have presumed if someone has a concern about a definition accidentally leading to an increase in tariff or an increase in excise, it would have been raised. And I have to say, though I've only had three and three quarter years experience as customs minister, the ability of this industry to jump up and down within 10 seconds and raise issues when they see uh, a tariff being changed or an excise level being changed is pretty remarkable because there are a level of people out there who make their living out of in determining the definitions in these sorts of documents. This is a harmonisation process we were required, uh, we went through as part of our international obligations. It does not change any level of tariff. We've changed the definitions. 
That is true, but the level of tariff has not been changed. So it is not, cha it is not changing the revenue base. I think you've confused like fuel oil in another bill with what's in here. So, um, uh, and I, I must say, Mr. Uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, I accept the fact that this is complicated, that this is detailed legislation, but that anything with listing a tariff is detailed, and no person humanly is going to remember all of that, uh, even if you sat down and read the lot. I accept all of that, but we have had no. But do people do go through it in those areas that they're concerned about? They have not raised it with us. And I've just checked with the advisers before, and I've said, have we had any complaints anywhere on this bill, this 946-page uh, bill? Not one complaint or query. But, well, you've raised one, but it hasn't been raised with us. And if you want to say to uh, whoever your person is who's spoken to you about it, Senator Mark Getz, we're more than happy to discuss it with them, but pl so please send it to us. Uh, yes, but you, you've raised what I'm saying is the industry itself. What I'm surprised at, I'm in no way denigrating your status as a senator, but we've had no complaint from industry, and this is where we always usually get them. I'm not saying that in areas dealing with light fuel oil uh, and have gas, but people haven't raised issues with us, but they haven't raised it. On the, which is uh, listed number, the bill number seven on the list, Customs Tariff Bill 95. No, no, this, this has been out since uh, the budget. How long has this been out? How long has this was tabled in September. If I can do a bit of clarification here, which I think, Senator, if that's okay with you. The, um, what Senator Mar gets refers to is certainly in the Customs Tariff Bill, but in fact, what it is in both the other two bills that we're debating, the excise one and the customs one, that same definition is in both of those, and that's what you're referring to, not the customs tariff bill, which doesn't really relate, but the, the uh, definitions that are in both the excise bill and the customs tariff. They're identical definitions as in the uh, customs tariff bill. Minister. And I've just been advised well, that this, uh, the amend the, um, these, uh, this amendment was drafted in consultation with industry and the oil companies. Uh, to make sure we got it correct, and it has been available since September. It's now late November, so uh, I have to say, in that period of nearly three months, knowing this industry, if people had a complaint, they'd be battering on the door pretty quickly. Uh, can I? I note from the comments, other than Senator Margetts, the only other in all of these three bills taken together, the. Um, the uh, only query or amendment has come is about the AVGAS uh, level, and I've just spoken privately and haven't had a chance to speak to Senator Margetts. Amendment moved by the opposition. I'll be uh, I've said to both Senator Spinner and Senator Parra that uh, we'd be willing to look at a further amendment that if uh, the money we've already collected we can keep uh, and uh, so that we're not paying it back because administratively it will be difficult to hunt it all down and get it back. We would keep that money, but for the future, for the uh, uh, in the amendment, that the existing rate would maintain, and I think this is probably a reasonable comp compromise. I accept the fact that overall this is about a million dollars worth of revenue. It ain't going to send the budget spinning madly into deficit or whatever, compared with some of the other things that the Senate has done. Uh, so I'm happy to put that as an amendment, and I'll. I, we've got a, it's now with the clerk, assistant clerk, and it's now being run off and circulated. But the intent will be what we've already collected, which will have been from from the first of July. From the first of July, at that rate, as proposed, we would keep as revenue, so we don't have to refund it because the administration of refunding is difficult. But from as from today, or from tomorrow, uh, the old rate would maintain. So if uh, uh, with that, I think that's a reasonable compromise. Uh, for all the other, I note, I have to say, I note that the Senate, or in the speeches from the other parties, that uh, the issue of, in particular, the Senate has accepted the changes to light fuel oil, uh, and I, I thank the parties for accepting that measure. I have to say that if it hadn't been accepted, and uh, the differential between uh, uh, light fuel oil at six cents a litre compared with diesel fuel at, 20, at 32 cents, if that had maintained, within two or three years, 
uh, we would have had a massive leakage of revenue, probably approaching a billion dollars, because the uh, once technically people were out there explaining how you put certain filters on such things as interstate diesel trucks, the trucking industry, that you could use diesel at six cents a litre, everyone would have been swapping over. As of four or five months ago, one of the major oil companies was preparing a major marketing campaign to convince people to swap to light fuel oil, which they would produce, explain to people at all levels with diesel engines how you put the filters on so you could use it, and, you, and we would have ended up with, a, as I say, an estimated around a billion dollars of lost revenue, which would have meant a, a significant change in taxation somewhere else to make up the lost revenue. So I appreciate the fact that uh, it appears that the Senate, the other parties, will support the government on this measure. I accept the fact that uh, there will be some momentary agitation and uh, irritation in a couple of areas where uh, people have, uh, over the last year or so, moved into using light fuel oil such as in some tourist boats in, the, uh, in North Queensland, uh, but that has only been in the last year or so, and that they will suffer a cost, uh, pay extra cost compared with what they, have been, what they would have expected. I'm told that some of their marketing and costs of tickets for, on their boats have been set at the rate as though it had been the cost of, of running the whole service at six cents a litre. I also accept the fact that uh, railways in Australia, who were overwhelmingly the ones who had moved into this into this, into this and using light fuel oil, and their complaint is that they had not been eligible for diesel fuel rebate, even though they run on, private, on their own rail tracks and so on, uh, and that this itself was probably costing us already close to $100 million in loss of revenue. Uh, well, certainly the railways will complain, I should imagine, uh, but they haven't complained as much. Uh, I'm not trying to encourage them either, uh, but they haven't complained as much as uh, uh, the some other operators. So I appreciate the Senate support for this uh, in in that area. I think I won't go through all the other measures; they're all outlined in the second reading speech. But I thank the Senate for uh, their support. And I just wondered if we got the amendment yet? Pardon? Have you got a you got a draft? Is that okay? I'm Okay, is that? I don't know. Can we show Senator Mark Getz and Senator Spindler? I just want them to have. Can they read it? I just want them to have a look at it. This is the government amendment to split the revenue. Just give us a minute, because I'll save a bit of time. Your time's up, Minister. Uh, Senator, uh, Senator Mark Getz, just uh, your back to your... Your time's up. Oh, I'm sorry. The question is the bill has been now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Excise Tariff Amendment Bill No. 2, 1995. Customs Tariff Bill 1995. Customs Tariff Legislation Amendment Bill 1995. <laughs> Um, firstly, we'll deal with the Act to impose duties of customs to repeal the Customs Tariff Act 1995. Is it the wish of the committee that it be taken as a whole? Yes. There being no objection, it is so ordered. Senator Perra. Thank you, Madam uh, Chairman. Um, have we got the amendment to the exercise? There's no amendment, I understand, to this bill. But just the custom. The the haven't got the exercise. No. Bill 1995. This is not the one. We're, I, I, we're just dealing with the Customs Tariff Bill 1995, not the Excise Tariff Bill. We're dealing with it as a whole. The question is that the bill stand is printed. Senator Margetts? Whilst all the rest is being sorted out in this abysmal way, um, I could uh, allow the minister, I know he was uh, dying to give me some further information because I feel that the kind of information that's been given so far has been inadequate. It has been admitted there will be a change 
in definition, which will be effective from next year. There is a revenue implication and there is an implication in terms of the price of fuels that are now going to be defined as something else. So whilst it may be true that excise hasn't changed on those fuels, the fact that a fuel that used to be defined as one thing is now defined as something else means that, in effect, the people using those fuels will have a different rate. Now, Minister, I'm asking you to clarify that so the rest of everybody can understand what the implications are. Well, I, uh, Senator Margetts, the definition that is in this bill, the Customs Tariff Bill, is there because elsewhere, as Senator Parra pointed out, that, um, that we put the new definition in the other bills. Yes, so that the thing is, the reason it's in this bill is for consistency's sake because elsewhere we're amending the Customs Tariff Legislation Amendment Bill to put the new definition in and to have it consistent. But it's not the change in tariff excise in this bill is only because we've amended another bill, or if it's carried by the Senate, which looks like it will be. Senator Maggots. That is not the question that I'm asking, Minister. I'm asking you to actually tell the Senate, or tell me, uh, through you, Madam Chair, the implications for the cost of people who've had their definition changed on them and the revenue implications of this change. This, Senator Marquette, this is the definition for light fuel oil. And I've just outlined, and I'll say it again, the, by the change, the definition of light fuel, the technical definition of light fuel, to make sure it applies properly to what we want to stop an emerging loophole means that the excise rate will go from six cents a litre to 32 cents a litre, which is the diesel. Yeah, yeah, six cents to 32 cents a litre, which is a 26 cents a litre increase. It's been brought to the same level as the diesel, as diesel fuel excise. Now, that is, we made that very clear that that's what we were doing, and to make sure that we close the loophole, we had to put this definition in, and that's the definition. So we haven't, what can I just say, we have made no attempt to hide the fact that we are closing a loophole by increasing the excise level for light fuel as it was being used by trains, by uh, trucks who could put the filters on, and most of them could if they chose to do that, would have to pay the same level of diesel which they normally used. Uh, so that there'd be no loophole and that we wouldn't lose in two or three years possibly up to a billion dollars worth of revenue. Senator Muggets. Thank you, Madam Chair. Now perhaps the minister can tell me which kind of people will be affected and what the revenue implications are for this um, change from six cents to 36 cents a litre. Senator Shaw. Six cents to 32 cents a litre. The, the, uh, well, for example, the trains of Australia, the state rail systems, will have to pay 30, as I understand it, 32 cents a litre compared with six cents a litre. Because initially, going back a few years, they applied for diesel. Senator Perry? Addressing in response to Senator Mark gets the wrong the wrong bill. Yes, well. This bill is the custom tariff bill. And the questions that Senator Mark gets should be asking are on the customs tariff legislation amendment bill and the excise bill. I accept Senator Parra's correction that uh, we're now are now debating the other bill, but I explain, initially I explained why the description went in the, tariff, the, uh, the uh, customs tariff bill from the customs tariff legislation amendment bill. There are three bills, and I understood that the customs tariff act 1995 is the one that we're dealing yes. with at the present time, and we. Um, the question is that this bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. We should now deal with the Excise Tariff Act, um, Excise Tariff Amendment Act Number 2, 1995. Is it the wish of the committee that this be taken as a whole? I wonder if we could address the Customs Tariff Legislation Amendment Bill first because we have the amendment to that and we don't have it to the excise bill. If it's the wish of the committee that we deal with the Custom Tariff Legislation Amendment Act 1995, nothing is impossible. Senator Perra. 
Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. The, uh, ca the opposition initially had a request for an amendment to the Customs Tariff Legislation Amendment Bill, and the reason for that was as explained in the second reading speech, but also as referred to by the Minister. And the reason for this request was that it was felt that it was unfair, inequitable and unjust to actually require the general aviation industry, which uses Avgas, to pay for air services Australia type charges when they in the main didn't use them. Now we have in fact before us two bills which require two amendments. The one I'm addressing now is the Customs Tariff Legislation Amendment Bill, and the one that will come later with a very similar amendment is the Excise uh, Tariff Amendment Bill. As the Minister indicated, thank you. I've got that one. Uh, as the Minister indicated, oh, the reason for the two, of course, is that where there is an increase in excise on a locally produced abgas, there has been a, an amendment to the charge. And of course, in some places, and I think notably the Northern Territory, in fact, this abgas is imported from places like Singapore, and there has to be an equivalent increase in the customs tariff, and they have to they equal one another. But the um, I did initially circulate an amendment in my name, which has now been amended on the customs tariff legislation amendment bill, which reflects the proposal put to the opposition and the Democrats by the minister. And the proposal put was that the government would agree to our amendment, in other words, to reduce the, uh, the tariff on, uh, on Avgas by 0.883 cents a litre, I think, if I'm correct, um, to reduce that so that the, the general aviation industry using aviation gasoline would not be required to make that contribution to the um, to the airline services type services. Now, this means that, uh, in view of that ar arrangement between the minister and the opposition, that the government will now agree to that amendment, provided it applies from tomorrow. So the um, the um, Amendment circulated in my name still has exactly the same figures in it in respect of the the um, the Avgas uh, tariff, but applicable from the 28th of November, which means there has been or will be a reduction uh, as of, as of tomorrow. Now the purpose the minister has put this to us on the basis that this uh, tariff has been collected now since July 1. <coughs> and the, uh, the ex no, this is tariff, the first one. <laughs> it's easy to get confused. Um, that this will uh, apply, it has already applied from July 1, and just the logistics of going back and paying back some of those charges are such that uh, it would be uh, cleaner if the amendments as proposed by the opposition, supported by the Democrats, applied from tomorrow. So I would like to move. Madam Chair, the, um, the amended request circulating in my name, and just to make sure it's all clear, that after Schedule 6, page 13, add the following schedule, Schedule 7, and the effect of that is to uh, omit the amount of money that's now currently charged and substitute for that 0.18116 cents per litre. Yes, yeah, cents per litre, and that this would take effect from November the 28th, 1995. I won't read it in detail, but that's the thrust of the amendment, which I believe will be accepted by the government. The question is that the amended request circulated by Senator Perra be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The, bill be agreed to, subject to request. the question is that the bill be agreed to subject to the request. Those of that opinion say aye. Senator Margetts. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Whilst I was uh, asked virtually to sit down, having asked my questions, because as it was pointed out, the questions that I referred to related to a definition that was in all three, all three bills, then the questions related to 
all three bills, and my questions were in fact relevant to all three bills. You can't say these definitions are in all three bills and then say I'm asking the wrong questions on the wrong bills because they happen to be a change that's been introduced in all three because there's a requirement. Now, to, in, to carry on from where I was trying to ask my questions when I was rudely interrupted, what minister are the revenue implications of increasing uh, this oil from six cents to 32 cents a litre for such people as train users? Uh, we estimate that uh, uh, the, revenue sa the revenue saved uh, from what uh, would have the, the, the revenue saved or the increased revenue, whichever way you want to put it, we estimate at the moment to be around $100 million. Uh, overwhelmingly, as I'm advised from train use at the moment, uh, but increasing examples were occurring uh, up that uh, the road transport industry would be switching over and other similar users. We understand that since we announced this in the budget as a budget measure, those uh, attempts and further examples of promoting the substitution of light fuel oil for diesel oil have basically stopped uh, and haven't been proceeded with. The industry has accepted that, uh, the, uh, that this measure would mean they wouldn't be able to proceed with it. And uh, uh, that, I think, overall, Senator Ma gets, is the revenue implication is it's, we, are, we, will, we will actually collect about $100 million that we wouldn't have collected, mainly from the train industry or state the rail industry, as I understand it. But what we are doing, and this is more important, this is even more important, we were stopping the trend towards wholesale substitution of light fuel oil for diesel which we estimate and the excise level collected on diesel was over a billion dollars and the much of this would have been put greatly at risk the way the industry was starting to promote the substitution of light fuel oil by putting certain types of filters on diesel engines. Senator Maggots. I would therefore ask, Minister, in um, deference to, the, to notes about we would have been lobbied if people had realised if there was any major changes. The fact that this wasn't highlighted in the XMO, do you think this might have had something to do with whether or not you were lobbied on this issue? Senator say that we were spoken to uh, and people did query us about the light fuel oil change. Uh, I have to say they didn't query us about the general definitions of the new tariff descriptions in here. But no, no, it was put in this bill and in the other bill the definition about light fuel oil and what we were doing. For consistency, we put it in this bill only after we amended these two bills. We were spoken to. We were lobbied. I have questions in Senate estimates straight after the budget, I think, from some senators from Queensland about uh, uh, the use of the, in the tourist industry, the tourist boats that go out to the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, they had switched over to light fuel oil in the last year or so. They wrote in, they lobbied about the impact on them. So yes, in, this ca in that case, we did get lobbying and we have not, been, uh, we have not denied that. And back in the estimates hearing back in uh, May, June, this was certainly raised with us, but we explained uh, that uh, the overall revenue implications, if it wasn't closed, were quite horrendous to the government. The question is that the bill be agreed to subject to the request. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Um, we proceed to um, Excise Tariff Amendment Act No. 2 of 1995. The question is that the bill be taken as a whole, there being no objection. Senator Perra. Thank you, Madam Chair. The, um Amendments to be moved by the opposition, which is a, an amended request from the original request, incorporates the, um, the uh, reduction in the excise on Avgas and uh, is a mirror image of what we've put in in respect of the Customs Tariff Act or bill and uh, simply means that the reduction that the general aviation industry will pay for Avgas 0.883 cents a litre will apply from November the 28th, which is tomorrow, rather than being retrospective to July 1. I won't repeat the reasons as to why we've moved these amendments, except to say that 
because the, uh, the, the increase in customs tariff uh, is, is mirrored by, a, a or the decrease is mirrored by the decrease in the excise tariff, simply one taking account of locally produced avgas and the other one imported avgas. The question is that the amended request moved by Senator Perra be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that Excise Tariff Amendment Act No. 2, 1995, be agreed to, subject to request. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the three bills be reported to with requests. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Chairman of the Committee, Senator Reid, reports that the Committee has considered the Customs Tariff Legislation Amendment Bill and two related bills and agreed to them with two requests. The Honourable Minister. I move that the report be adopted. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Honourable Minister. And I, I move that the Customs Tariff Legislation Amendment Bill be read a, a third time. The question is that this bill be. Sorry, Customs Tariff Bill be read a third time. Sorry. The Customs Tariff Bill be read a third time. The question is that this bill be now read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Customs Tariff Bill 1995. Government Business Order of the Day, Social Security and Veterans Affairs Legislation Amendment Bill 1995 and two associated bills. Second reading, adjourned debate. Senator Knowles. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, today we are debating three bills, the Social Security and Veterans Affairs Legislation Amendment Bill 1995, the Social Security Legislation Amendment, Carer Pension and Other Measures Bill 1995, and the Employment Services Amendment Bill 1995. And these bills, of course, are being dealt with cognately. The first two bills contain in the main budget measures, but there are a number of non-budget measures to be dealt with also. The bills are long and complex and range over many issues. In a cognate debate, quite frankly, it is not possible to cover all the issues. This raises concern about the way in which these bills have been handled and the complexity that becomes apparent day by day in relation to Social Security law. Uh, the first bill, the Social Security and Veterans Affairs Legislation Amendment Bill 1995, contains some 229 pages. And the second bill contains some 167 pages, including the explanatory memorandum the two Social Security bills alone contain over 741 pages and over 40 amendments. The law contained in, this, in these bills is, of course, complex. It adds to legislation that is already exceedingly complex, and the government does not help itself by providing inadequate time for consideration of bills of this sort. And almost weekly, one sees comments from independent observers such as the Ombudsman and the Auditor General about the complexity of Social Security legislation. And the welfare rights movement has also put on record over a long period its concern about the complexity of the Social Security system. Therefore, if we as legislators have difficulty in getting on top of this legislation, what hope has the man in the street of keeping up with and understanding changes to Social Security legislation as well? It is not consistent with efficient and effective government to introduce bills with more than 40 amendments so late in the parliamentary session. Time should be allowed and time is certainly required to constructively study and comment on changes and to consult with interested parties. 
and both the function of the parliament and the opposition's responsibility to act as a check on the government is undermined by this government's inability to manage its legislative program. So the first bill that I wish to discuss tonight, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, is the Social Security Legislation Amendment Bill, the, the care and pension and other measurement measures. Um, this bill amends the Social Security Act 1991, the Data Matching Program, Assistance and Tax Act 1990, the Child Care Act 1972, the Income Tax Assessment Act 1936, and the Farm Household Support Act 1992. It contains a large number of significant measures. Uh, Schedule 1 amends the Social Security Act 1991 to provide a fairer and more lenient legislative and administrative regime for persons who leave Australia without a departure certificate. Schedule 2 makes amendments to the Child Care Act 1972 to enable the collection of tax file numbers from recipients of child care assistance and to the Data Matching Act to repeal the Sunset Clause, replace annual reporting to Parliament with a requirement to report every three years and authorise the provision of the date of a person's most recent ATO assessment to the Data Matching Agency. Uh, Schedule 3 contains six amendments to the waiver provisions of the Social Security Act 1991, the principal act, of course, to provide more consistency and flexibility. Schedule 4 contains amendments to increase rent assistance thresholds by a further $5 per fortnight to coincide with the March 1996 CPI increases to these thresholds. In addition, the maximum rates of rent assistance for families will increase by $5 per fortnight, with effect Im immediately following the March 1996 CPI increase to these rates. Schedule 5 amends the Social Security Act to enable the rent assistance savings provisions to be phased out more quickly and to ensure that the operation of those savings provisions is not affected by proposed amendments to the Veterans Affairs rent assistance saving provisions. Schedule 6, this measure replaces um, rent assistance for people residing in nursing homes and hostels with a new residential care allowance, the rate threshold, indexation and all other arrangements for the new allowance will be the same as for the rent assistance currently being paid to these people. Schedule 7 amends the Social Security Act 1991 to provide that persons who leave their homes to receive or give community-based care are immediately entitled to rent assistance. Schedule 8 amendment extends to the two-year exemption period for former house homeowners who include persons who receive or give community-based care or are in residential care. Schedule 9 contains measures which will enable the carer pension to be paid for 14 weeks after caring ceases due to the permanent institu institutionalisation of the person receiving care. And Schedule 10 extends qualification for carer pensions to include situation, situations where a person cares for a non-pensioner. It is pro proposed to pay a carer pension to a person in situations where the care receiver is not in receipt of a social security pension or benefit or a service pension. In order to ensure that the carer pension correctly targets those in need of financial assistance, it is proposed to apply an assets and income test model on the family payment as assets and income test to the care order. receiver. Order. Order. Point of order. I've watched you chair the Senate over very many years, and at the risk of indulgence, um, I would have thought, I don't need to quote the standing order for you, that Senator Knowles has been here 10 years, you would have thought she could have either learnt to have read a speech without looking like she's read a speech, or learnt to write a speech so she doesn't need to read somebody else's speech. Now, I'm quite certain that you will say that she's, she's observing copious notes. You and I both know, in fact, of course, she's reading every single word that's been written by her research officer. I just say that if the standing order is not to be in some vague way abided by, might I suggest, sir, that you report to the president and suggest that the standing order be uh, rescinded? Uh, the Deputy Minister. President, Senator Knowles, in effect, is fulfilling the role of a shadow minister here, and I suspect also the role of someone who is absent for good reason. Therefore, I say to Senator Crichton Brown that in delivering a speech on behalf of the whole opposition, she is entitled to the precision of a written speech, 
because every word she said, I suppose you could say, could be taken down and used in evidence against her. It, to my mind, in this occasion, it's the equivalent of a second reading speech by a minister. This is the official response of the opposition. It will be for later speakers to stray and thrust and parry in the debate, but Sen what Senator Knowles is doing is adequately putting down the position of the opposition. And uh, I think that's quite in order in this occasion. It's a tradition of this House. Point, uh, Deputy President, the same point of order. Uh, my, view, my view is that um, whoever responds ought to be able to respond in an intelligent way of their own volition without having to be riveted to every single word that's been written by somebody else. Oh. I, I suggest, with respect, we incorporate both speeches. We incorporate, through you, Mr. Acting Deputy President, we incorporate Senator Ray's speech if he happens to be the minister on, on the second reading. We ought to change the standing orders and have the shadow minister incorporate their speech as well. It's generally accepted that uh, opposition senators who are in a shadow position are able to read their speech for the reasons set out by Senator Ray. And I would suggest to uh, Senator Crichton Brown, if you feel strongly about the matter, you could write to the president yourself. Yes. Senator Knowles. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. The care receiver must also be a legal resident of Australia and be 16 years of age or older. Now, Schedule 11 removes the requirement that in order to receive carer pensions, uh, the carer must live in the same home as or in the adjacent home to the person being cared for. Now, Schedule 12 contains amendments to allow certain recipients of some pensions and benefits to access advance payments of their social security payments, to assist in meeting their or their family members' living or capital expenses. And those recipients will be able to capitalise up to 6 per cent of their payments over a 12-month period with an advance payment range of between $250 and $500. The advance payment will be repaid by deductions from ongoing fortnightly social security payments over a period of 13 fortnights. Schedule 13 increases the fortnightly rate of guardian allowance by $4 per fortnight from 1 September 1996. And Schedule 14 contains two measures relating to the parenting allowance. Schedule 15 contains two measures. The first relates to entitlements to periodic compensation payments converted to a lump, uh, to a lump sum, the second to the treatment of, a, uh, compensation, uh, of compensation affected payments where one member of the couple is a social security client and the other is a veteran affairs client. Schedule 16 makes sure that customers who transfer between different types of allowance during a waiting period are also able to transfer any of the waiting period already served so that they are not disadvantaged compared to customers who do not transfer between allowances. And Schedule 17 contains three measures relating to sickness allowance and claimants. Schedule 18 a amends the bereavement provision for the carer pension to provide that bereavement payments will be paid to the principal carer when the person being cared for dies during respite care, and b allows the bereavement period for short-term bereavement payments to commence on the day after a child dies. Schedule 19 relates to the nomination of bank accounts for payments of benefits or pensions, and Schedule 20 amends the sole parent pension and sole parent special needs pension provisions to clarify the situations where a pe person is obliged to pursue maintenance. Schedule 21 ensures that all social security payments, whether they are paid by instalments or in the form of a lump sum, are absolutely inalienable and are protected from garnishy action. And Schedule 22 contains amendments to exclude as income certain payments received by a person who is engaged in part-time training or vocational training activities under a labour market program. Schedule 23 contains amendments relating to cross-references in penalty provisions to the Crimes Act 1914. The Minister representing the Minister for Social Security in the Senate did give an undertaking during the second reading debate on the Social Security Parenting Allowance and Other Measures Legislation Amendment Act 1994 that amendments would be made to the Act at the earliest possible opportunity to refer the, readers, uh, to the, ability, the reader to the ability to convert an in imprisonment term to a monetary penalty via the operation of the Penalty Unit Scheme. And this schedule amends uh, all provisions in the Act that refer to imprisonment terms by inserting a note that refers the reader to the ability to convert an imprisonment term to a monetary penalty by way of the operation of the Penalty Unit Scheme in the Crimes Act 1914. And Schedule 24 contains a number of minor and technical amendments, with Schedule 25 amending all provisions in the Farm Household Support Act 1992 that refer to imprisonment terms by inserting a note that refers, to the, re refers the reader to the ability to convert an imprisonment term to a monetary penalty by way of the operation of the Penalty Unit Scheme in the Crimes Act 1914. 
Now, there are a number of issues in relation to this bill which I would like to address, and these include the care of pension and carers' pension, rent assistance, um, uh, waiver of debts, and the guardian allowance. The major issue, however, relates to data matching. And on behalf of the coalition, I will be moving an amendment relating to the data matching amendments in this bill. And data matching is an issue which the coalition and uh, Senator Patterson, in particular, has kept under close scrutiny since it was first introduced. At that time, there were widely unrealistic estimates of millions of dollars in savings and huge increases in efficiency. Neither of these predictions have actually eventuated. And despite the government's uh, pathetic attempts to claim otherwise, the data matching system has not lived up to expectations. It has not delivered the huge savings it promised, and it continues to pose a real threat to the privacy of Australians in general. And we must be vigilant to keep it under control. The Social Security Legislation Amendment Carer Pension and Other Measures Bill 1995 contains a number of amendments to the current data matching program. It proposes to extend the data matching program to cover the child care assistance payment. And while the Coalition is not opposing this measure, we are very concerned about the insidious extension of data matching. In this case, data matching is being extended into yet another portfolio, Health, which jointly administers with the Department of Social Security the child care assistance payment. There is also the proposal to remove the sunset clause for data matching. The Coalition will be proposing an amendment which it will extend the sunset clause for data matching until January 1999, effectively for another three years. The government has proposed changing the reporting requirements for the data matching agency, and these amendments would mean that the agency would only have to provide a comprehensive report to Parliament every three years rather than the current requirement of reporting annually. The Coalition will be opposing this amendment. As I've already mentioned, the Coalition is very concerned about protecting the privacy of individuals, and to ensure this, the agency must remain accountable to the Parliament. Also, the bill will authorise the provision of the date of the person's most recent tax assessment to the data matching agency. We will, in fact, be proposing an amendment to the effect that the operation of data matching will be extended for a further three years to January 1999, but we certainly want to ensure that the efficacy of the process is something that is still tested. Amendments have been put, put forward in relation to, de to departure certificates. Presently, the Act provides that a person's qualification for a pension ends if they leave Australia without a departure certificate and stay overseas for more than six months. This amendment will provide that if a person leaves the country without a departure certificate, after six months, their pension will be suspended rather than cancelled, and then it will only be cancelled after 12 months. It also provides that in special circumstances, the Secretary has the discretion to restore a pension with full arrears up to two years from the, de the date of departure. This amendment has been made in response to the Commonwealth Ombudsman Annual Report, which commented that about 1,200 pensioners per year had their pensions cancelled this way. The report also mentioned that problems arise when pensioners go overseas intending to stay for less than six months and are unable to return because of illness or medical treatment. They could face losing their pensions permanently and then lose their major means of payment, paying for medical treatment. In this year's budget, the government announced that the Guardian allowance would be increased by $4 a fortnight as of September next year, that is, $2 a week, for the people who are seen to be the most needy and the most vulnerable in our community. And this has been identified particularly by ACOS. And what does this government do? It acknowledges that this is a problem, that there is a need that ought to be addressed, but it delays the introduction of the measure by 16 months to the budget after next. And why such a small increase? After all, ACOS has identified that there has not been a real increase in the allowance since 1986 and that, in fact, since 1973, the real value of the allowance has dropped by 48 per cent. This increase has left the payment $10 per week, short of the amount needed to meet the benchmark of 10 per cent of the married pension rate. So the government has acknowledged this problem, but is responding in a most inadequate way to a group of people who are really in need. There are also amendments relating to rent assistance. Uh, rent assistance is to be increased by $5 per fortnight for families with children. However, the rent assistance threshold is to be increased by $5 per fortnight at the same time. The end result is that the government is pretending to be generous in handing out an increase when, in fact, some recipients have to pay an additional $5 per fortnight in rent before being eligible for rent assistance. In addition, the rent assistance entitlements of certain recipients, which has been, had been preserved under the Act, including certain borders and lodges, Certain residents of retirement villages and recipients of rent assistance will now be frozen until they are in line with all other rent assistance recipients. 
These changes will bring about a saving to the government of around $16.9 million over three and, three, uh, three and a quarter years. That is a saving of $5 million a year from the needy. And this really does highlight the hypocrisy of the government. Admittedly, the 190,000 $190, families will receive up to $5 a fortnight. However, the government has estimated that 310,000 recipients will lose up to $3.75 as a result of the increase in the threshold. 8,700 recipients will lose entitlements to rent assistance as a result of the increase in the threshold and 556,100 recipients will not be affected. The second bill being debated as part of this package of bills is the Social Security and Veterans Affairs Legislation Amendment Bill 1995. This bill also gives effect to a number of measures announced in the government's 1995-96 budget. Again, these measures were announced in May, and here we are some six months later, and they're being rushed through in the final days of the sitting. The legislation amends the Social Security Act 1991, the Veterans Entitlement Act 1986, the National Health Act 1953, the Income Tax Assessment Act 1936, the Child Care Rebate Act 1992 and the Disability Services Act 1986. This bill contains another 230 pages of changes to the, um, to the Social Security legislation. It contains 17 schedules which propose a wide range of measures. Um, and many of those measures are particularly uh, significant, and I, I wish to probably focus on the most important ones tonight in the essence of time. And one of those, of course, is the question of extended deeming. The main issue in the Social Security and Veterans Affairs Bill is the ex introduction of the new extended deeming regime and the resulting repeal of the unrealised capital gains provision, which treats as income any gain on shares and other investments. The Coalition has long pledged to repeal the unfair, uh, unrealised capital gains provision, and the government has been uh, criticised by all sections of the community for the unfair nature of the unrealised capital gains provision. It, is, it created uncertainty amongst the pensioner population and was a complex and inequitable system of assessing income. For many, it became impossible to plan ahead as their pensions could reduce significantly four times each year. The government did not receive the revenue it expected from the treatment of capital gains as income for Social Security, and the extended deeming introduces a new system of calculating income from financial investments. Initially, a standard deeming at a rate of 5 per cent will apply to the first $30,000 of financial investments for single people and to the first $50,000 for couples. Above these, a standard deeming rate of 7 per cent will apply. The government has argued that the new deeming rules are attractive because they will create certainty and they are comparati comparatively simple. The problem is that the government has made no provision in the bill to determine how often a person's financial assets are in fact to be valued. At present, people are required to notify the department each time the value of their assets change and their pensions will be adjusted according accordingly. There is a penalty involved <coughs> excuse me, if, a person is, if a person fails to advise the department of a change which leads to a debt due. This matter was referred to the Senate Standing Committee on Community Affairs, which considered the issue of appropriate timing and regularity of valuation and reported to the Senate today. While the Coalition supports a simplified and more equitable value of valuation of assets, it believes that, that the timing of the valuation of financial investments should be incorporated in the bill, and this system of timing of value and timing of valuation must not only be administratively simple and workable, it should also place minimum demands on the clients of Department of Social Security who will be affected by extended deeming. To that end, I foreshadow that I shall move an amendment to ensure that valuation of financial assets takes place at six monthly intervals, with the option of the client being able to seek evaluation at any time uh, during the year. The new system of extended deeming has been lauded by the government as being advantageous to pensioners and other Social Security recipients, but it needs to be pointed out that the government itself estimates that it, will that it will result in savings of $62.58 million in 1996-97 and $65.02 in 1997-98. Order. Senator Ritchie. Deputy President, pursuant to Standing Order 189, I move that Senator Knowles be granted an extension of 15 minutes in which to conclude her contribution. I'll put the question. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Knowles. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President, and I thank the, the, uh, the Senate and the government. Um, 
The new system of extended deeming has been lauded, uh, as I say, by the government, but uh, there are problems and that the government, uh, in addition to those that I've already mentioned, the government has also estimated that 270,000 pensioners and part pensioners will see a decrease in their pensions if they do not rearrange their assets. Pensioners or part pensioners who lose their pension will also lose their fringe benefit, fringe benefit entitlements arising from the concession cards. The government estimates that the 120,000 people who will see an increase in pension, but this increase will on average be of $4 per week. Regardless of how the government attempts to simplify the system, it needs to be clear that it remains Labor's income and assets test in operation. Fourthly, the government has failed in this bill to assist investors of estate mortgage trusts who have been adversely affected by the unrealised capital gains provisions. The trust collapsed in 1990 and investors lost a considerable amount of money at the time. The trust has now been relisted as the Meridian Investment Trust and since that time investments have increased considerably. However, the gains have not been sufficient to make up for the loss. Investments in the original trust were exempt from the unrealised capital gains rules as they were classified as a saved investment. When the trust was relisted, they were no longer exempt and the total gain since that time has been assessed under the income test. This is causing a reduction in investors' pension. The coalition indicated last week that it would be proposing amendments in the committee stage to treat Meridian investments as saved investments until July 1996. We heard today that the government intends to give people an ex gratia payment, but it is not going to put them back into the position that they would have been if these were saved investments. Additionally, there have been considerable representations to members and senators from the Umbrella Friendly Society Organisation, Australian, for Friend Australian Friendly Societies Association. The organisation has asserted that provision should be made to treat tax prepaid investments such as friendly society bonds differently to products on which tax is not prepaid but where the investor pays tax at their own marginal tax rate. The association argues that returns from prepaid tax products will necessarily be lower than those available to non-pre-tax paid investments as the tax has been paid prior to distribution to the investor. The Australian Friendly Societies Association has argued that they will be unfairly prejudiced under the new rules as they do not have the ability to deliver returns equal to or more than the deeming rates of 5 per cent or 7 per cent. The majority of friendly society members and associations are, of course, located in Victoria, but uh, nonetheless the Australian Friendly Societies Association has made alternative suggestions to solve this problem. Firstly, the suggestion has been to introduce a differential deeming rate for pre-tax paid investments, which would take account of the fact that the tax has been paid prior to distribution to the investor. And secondly, amend Division 8A of the Income Tax Assessment Act to enable friendly societies to provide income stream products and which allow pensioners to uh, switch to the product without tax penalty. The Senate Standing Committee on Community Affairs held an inquiry to assess the merits of the representation of the friendly societies and assess whether the deeming rules should be changed, whether the tax legislation should be amended or whether no changes should be made. In its report, the Community Affairs Committee concluded, and I quote, the committee has considered these arguments from the friendly society, but considers that extended deeming has considerable benefits and that organisations claiming to be affected by the proposed changes need to develop more attractive products and that consumers have a responsibility to seek the best possible return for their capital, unquote. There are other measures in this bill which should be discussed at greater length, for example changes to the earning credit scheme and the mature age allowance and the amalgamation of the job search and new start allowance schemes. However, the government is ramming through these measures th at such a rate before the end of the session that time does not allow at this stage for the debate. And the third bill, of course, being debated lately tonight is the Employment Services Amendment Bill 1995. And my colleague, Senator Tierney, will also be speaking on this bill, so I will only give an outline of the bill at this stage. The Employment Services Act 1994 establishes the case management system and established the Employment Services Regulatory Authority as an independent statutory authority responsible for regulating the case management system. The bill makes machinery changes arising from changed case management arrangements for certain part-time and seasonal workers. 
It would also streamline certain administrative procedures relating to CES notification requirements and allow the ESRA to obtain goods and services by using a credit card. The bill would allow for consequential amendments arising from proposed changes to the Social Security Act 1991 that would amalgamate job search allowance and the New Start allowance. It would also amend the Social Security Act 1991 to provide uh, for the national convener of the Social Security Appeals Tribunal to delegate his or her powers under the Employment Services Act 1994. At present, the CES is required to send out two notices to people under case management. The first letter notifies a person that they have begun participating in the case management system, and these people may have to wait for months before they actually meet their case manager. They receive another notice when they actually are referred to a case manager. Under this present system, the government can inflate immediately the number of people in case management by totalling the number of letters initially sent out, even though large numbers of these people had not even met their case managers and those who are actually consulting with case managers. One of the biggest constraints the system faces is that there are many more people in case management than there are case managers to handle them. The Coalition has long been concerned that the number of clients per case manager are sometimes ridiculously high. There have been reported instances of case managers servicing up to 200 clients each. Clients cannot possibly expect an adequate level of attention or advice when they are competing for their case manager's attention with so many other people. The recent Auditor General's report number three into CES case management revealed very serious weaknesses in the functioning of the CES, which is said must be very quickly remedied as they reduce its capacity to assist the long-term unemployed. This bill also makes provision for the ESRA to purchase goods and services on a credit card, and the Coalition will monitor closely the way in which this ESRA credit card is used. The bill relates also to to job compact eligibility for certain seasonal and part-time workers. The definitions of persons eligible for the job compact is amended to include the requirement that in addition to having been in receipt of the job search allowance, new start or youth training allowance for a period of 18 months, a person must also have been registered with the CES for a period of 18 months. This is apparently to take account of persons who may have had their CES registration date reset to zero. When seasonal and part-time workers elect not to participate in case management, the period of 18 months registration required to be eligible under the proposed amendments would be taken to commence from the time of that election for seasonal workers and for part-time workers after they have completed at least 13 weeks of work. A new subsection will be added to provide that persons um, CES that a person's CES registration will be added to provide that a person's CES registration is reset to zero by deeming that the person has ceased to be registered on the day specified in the determination under section 39.14 and, and to have recommenced registration on the following day. A new subsection, 39.16, will be added to make it clear that CES registration means being registered by the CES as unemployed. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, the opposition will not be opposing this bill, but notes that this government uh, has failed in adequately addressing the massive unemployment problems still faced by this country. And, uh, in closing, Mr Acting Deputy President, I, I thank uh, the Senate for allowing me uh, additional time to cover uh, this number of bills in this cognate debate. And, uh, I uh, conclude the coalition's comments. Senator Wirt. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Thank you very much, Senator Knowles, for your lengthy contribution. And I know that it has been done at short notice, and uh, I found it most interesting. The areas that I would like to concentrate on tonight are the issue of valuation and extended deeming, and they were the two issues that were referred to the Community Affairs Committee to for us to investigate and we had some hearings um, a week ago. It's important, I think, for people to remember that both these issues actually affect all Social Security recipients and not just those who are aged pensioners. And I think a number of the people who made submissions to our committee of inquiry obviously had forgotten that. But on the issue of valuation of assets, I understand that the department does have a preference for six months. That certainly was the impression that we gained from the inquiry. 
Um, but that a lot of other organisations who would have a keen interest in this had not, in fact, or appeared not to have given this a great deal of thought. And the, the department is undertaking additional consultations on this matter and is certainly has a variety and has, has worked up a number of alternatives and options that are available. And for that, they are to be commended. They've gone carefully into this issue. Um, they are also, as I say, the six month valuation with the opportunity for the recipient to actually, if there is a major change in their valuation, the value of their product, for them to actually be able to go to Social Security and, and seek a revaluation earlier is a very important thing. But the issue that got a lot of attention was the extended deeming provisions. And I think it's important to state very clearly that deeming is not a new thing in the issue of Social Security, in the area of Social Security benefits. It's certainly been around for some time with bank um, uh, accounts and it initially was sort of discussed as, or thought of and spoken about as if it was going to be the end of Western civilisation as we knew it. However, it has, appeared, it has turned out to be a very, very beneficial um, product, a beneficial way of assessing income because it's enabled people to have certainty and to make investment choice so that their investment can be put away and left in a, in a vehicle that will give them a reasonable in return and they do not have to worry about fluctuations if it's taken care of by the, by the deeming. It also means that they are, of course, if they are getting earning over and above the deeming rate, able to say that that is money for jam and it's, it's beneficial. The deeming rate, of course, has not been set at a high level. I've seen in the media some comments that it's set at a high level because it will encourage risky investment. That's not the case, and it's not proved to be the case to date, and it wouldn't be the case in the future. What we are wanting pensioners and aged people in particular to do, we are encouraging them to make investments for the provision of their, as best they are able, for their retirement and the pension is seen to supplement the income that they are able to get, or in fact, if they're only on a small amount that they've invested, they are able to supplement their income, their, in their pension. And it's very important for pensioners to be aware that to supplement their incomes, in fact, leaves them financially better off, leaves them in a financially superior position because that gives them more money, more disposable income, for them to, to live on. And rather than trying to reduce their income levels from outside sources and just try and live solely on the aged pension, it's not the way that we're going to be going. People are more and more people are having superannuation investments and having those small amounts of money at this stage and getting larger to invest and to assist them in their a their old age. And it's important that we get to the pensioners and the older people to carefully think and assess what is the sort of product that is going to suit them best as they get older. It shouldn't be construed from anything that's been said here tonight that aged pensions are going to disappear because they're certainly not. But extended deem extending the deeming enables simplicity and transparency. And that has to be the two key things that keep being asked for by pensioner groups by older retirees. They want something that is simple and something that is transparent. And in this provision, this is what we have. We have the, 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 the amount of return that we intended to be a guaranteed deeming rate of 5%, up to $30,000 for single people and up to $50,000 for couples. And above that, 7% 7 is, the, is the, the deemed rate. It's important that if elderly people are making investment decisions, they make them in a considered manner and they make them wisely. And sometimes one wonders how wisely people have made decisions. They, they maybe get a bit concerned and a bit scared. As I say, this is not, deeming is not a new issue. The, the issue of income for elderly people is one that's been around for a while. The, this committee actually also undertook an inquiry into the treatment of pensions and shares, and certainly a, more, a variation on deeming was one of the options that came out of that. That was in August of 93. 
We had, following that, uh, John Barber took, undertook um, some, a consultation process in the Targeting for Equity, which was published in, in December of 94. And it's very important that people remember that um, this work has been going on for some time. And the thing that kept coming out of the consultations from that strategic review of income and assets text was that there were over 6,000 submissions to that consultation and review. And without a doubt, the thing that kept coming through in all of those issues was simplicity and stability, minimal intrusion, and minimal impact on investment choice. And I think that that is what it, the extension of deeming allows. It's also what setting down a period, a set period for valuation will allow, that people will be able to plan ahead, people will be able to make assessments and know that if that's their amount of income or that's the amount of, that they have to invest, they're going to have this return on that and this is what the effect is going to be on their aged pension. And it's very important that people recognise that. We've heard the, the Friendly Society certainly appeared before us, and they, for people, for pensioners or for people who have significant amounts of income and who are paying in higher marginal tax rates, and for them, those investments are quite good. In fact, I'd say they're very good. They're secure, but they also have the tax taken out. And for some people, that would in fact give them a, a bit of a tax break. But for the 70 odd percent of pensioners who don't pay any income tax, then these products are not the best products for them. And it's vitally important that people do look at what the best products for them are. There will be, as I say, it's not as if deeming is something new. It was announced in the, in the May budget. It's not going to be implemented until. July of next year, and this will certainly allow a number of organisations time to alter, to, to amend their product that they are able to offer as well to people. So I think it is vitally important that we remember these particular points. But the, the telling thing that came out of the inquiry to me was the plea, the urging by the pensioner and aged people's, aged persons organisations that we not halt or slow up the deliberation on this bill and that we not amend it in any way. Um, be, to quote the APSF, they say they believe that the message of the extended deeming system is that pensioners should make investment decisions on the performance of the investment and not on their favourable treatment under social security rules. They also go on to talk about reminding the Senate committee that every single pensioner or retiree organisation across the country that took part in the strategic review of the income and assets test review has enthusiastically welcomed the extended deeming changes because they are simpler, fairer, offer more predictability, increase incentive for self-provision and simplify the choice of investment options for older people. And those are the sorts of um, the comments that we keep going, that we, that we kept getting, um, that, that we, we wouldn't delay this legislation in any way, that we would get it enacted quickly, as quickly as possible, um, because they all could see that this was a, uh, a bill that was actually going to enable them to have, um, have simplicity and surety and stability within their, their, their thing. In fact, even the Financial Planning Association urged the Senate committee not to, to succumb to, to special pleading um, for any extension of deeming. For any extended deeming to work fairly and equitably, there must be no exceptions among financial institutions. And that's very, very important. Uh, and of course, the Financial Planning Association actually represents those bodies and those people who are involved in, in advising people how to plan their money. So, for those people, and as I said to us, probably talking themselves out of business, but it is important that the aged people of this country get a product that is simple and get something that they understand. So it's with much pleasure that I support the bill. Senator Woodley. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, the Senate is debating the Social Security legislation amendment 
Carer Pension and Other Measures Bill 1995 and the Social Security and Veterans Affairs Legislation Amendment Bill 1995. As Senator Knowles said, this is an incredible amount of legislation to be trying to deal with at this time of the year, but uh, we'll do our best. Looking first at the Carer Bill, overall the Democrats support the thrust of this bill. We believe, however, that in a number of areas the reforms proposed could have and certainly should have gone further. For example, the departure certificate changes proposed in this bill are a great step forward. The operation of the current provisions has been criticised as being overly harsh by a number of groups and individuals. Indeed, the Ombudsman's attention was drawn to this issue by the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, which referred on 17 cases in which the AAT was compelled to follow the legislation and decide in the Department's favour, but was concerned about the fairness of some of those decisions. Now, that's quite a significant step for the, Ombudsman to for the AAT to take. I'm sure you'll agree. In response to the concerns raised, the bill will require that if the department becomes aware of the fact that a pensioner has left Australia without a departure certificate, then the department will have to send a notice to the person informing them of their obligations. The bill will also provide the secretary of DSS with greater discretion to exempt a person where, the circumst where their circumstances warrant it, from losing their payment uh, for failing to satisfy the departure certificate requirements. For example, if they should become ill while overseas. These decisions, however, will not be open to appeal. I believe that it is appropriate that the exercise of this discretion should be subject to review and, as a matter of fact, would say that all uh, decisions of this nature should be subject to, to review. And as such, I will be moving an amendment at the committee stage to ensure that decisions made under the new section 1218A can be reviewed by authorised review officers, by the SSAT and by the AAT. Let me now turn to data matching. This bill will also make changes to the operation of the data matching program. I don't think anyone in this place needs to be reminded that the Democrats opposed the introduction of the data matching program, and we've opposed it all along, and the use of the extended tax file number. In fact, we remain horrified about these measures. And I remember certainly speeches made by Senator Meg Lees, my colleague in this debate, and uh, placed on the record our opposition. We oppose the data matching program on two grounds. Firstly, that the savings it was claimed would be achieved through the program were wildly exaggerated, and I underline the wildly. And secondly, that the program presented ma major privacy concerns. In response to those privacy concerns, the Senate imposed an, a requirement that all data data matching agencies submit an annual report to Parliament, which includes reference to guidelines issued by the Privacy Commissioner. This bill now seeks to replace that requirement for annual reporting to Parliament with a requirement that such reports only be provided every three years. And I would say, why bother? If, you want to, if you're going to report every three years, then obviously there is no intention to take that requirement seriously. You won't be surprised if I tell you the Democrats will be opposing this move, as we still believe that it is important for the parliament to maintain a reasonable level, level of scrutiny over the operation of this program. Turning now to the debt waiver provisions, the bill provides for the waiver of a debt where, the debt, where that debt is attributable and I quote, solely to an administrative error. 
The Welfare Rights Centre has argued that debts often result from a range of complex circumstances and, as such, this term is too narrow and should be replaced with other words, and I quote, the dominant cause of which can be attributed to administrative error. I will pursue this at the committee stage. Secondly, welfare rights have suggested that the new provisions may not be available where there have been assurance of support payments made, since the person who incurs the debt is not the one who receives the payments. I understand the government has provided welfare rights with an undertaking to address this issue, and I welcome that undertaking. Rent assistance. This brings me, that brings me to the changes announced in the budget and contained within this legislation that will increase the maximum amount of rent assistance available to families and will increase the lower threshold above which rent assistance becomes payable. It is estimated that around 1, 000, uh, sorry, 191,000 families are expected to, to benefit from the $5 a fortnight increase in rent assistance to families with a cost to government of around $26 million per year. At the same time, however, ACOS estimate that nearly 365,000 households will be worse off as a result of the $5 increase in the rent assistance threshold. The government says that increasing the thresholds by $5 per fortnight, and I quote, will reduce outlays and improve the targeting of rent assistance by reducing levels of assistance to customers who pay low or moderate rents. The effect of this so-called better targeting will be that rent assistance recipients will lose a total of around $30 million per year. $7 million will be taken from aged pensioners. Just think of that, Mr Deputy. Mr Acting Deputy President, $7 million will be taken from aged pensioners, who ACOS expect will be mostly elderly single women, my mother included, I might add. Disability support pensioners will lose $5.5 million. The unemployed will lose $10 million. The worst affected likely to be single young people, and $7 million is going to be taken off additional family payment recipients, that is sole parent and low income families who are in the greatest need. The Democrats will be opposing the raising of the rent assistance thresholds. I should say that two changes proposed in this bill to the operation of the rent assistance seem to exemplify the pattern of I should say that the two changes proposed in this bill the operation of the rent assistance seem to exemplify the pattern of changes in the social security portfolio that is any winners from policy changes gain at the expense of other social security clients talk about bad news good news stories this must be the ultimate. In this case, to quote ACOS, the rent assistance increases to families with children will be paid for by single people, couples without children, and by families with the lowest incomes. That is, by, by those people who make up a high proportion of the most marginalised groups in the community. They'll be paid for, and the government will also make a windfall of around $6 million per year. So much for their generosity. The next issue from this bill I want to discuss is the $2 a week increase in the Guardian allowance, which will not take effect until, until September next year. I think all parties will have received the submission from ACOS in which they point out, firstly, the gross inadequacy of this increase and secondly, the inequity of the September 1996 start-up, particularly in the light of the fact that the new maternity allowance 
available to those with incomes up to $61,000 per year will commence in February in 1996. ACOS has pointed out that the real value of the Guardian Allowance has dropped by a massive 48 per cent since 1973, and there has been no real increase in payments since 1986. In particular, in the early 1970s the allowance was paid at a rate equal to 22 per cent of the married pension. Since that time the allowance has plummeted in value to the point where it is currently just 5.5 per cent of the married pension. ACOS and the, policy <coughs> and the Social Policy Research Centre have stated a view that the appropriate benchmark for the allowance is 10 per cent of the married pension. And to achieve this, ACOS were pursuing a $12 a week increase in the payment in this year's budget. Instead of $12 a week, of course, the government has granted just $2 a week. For all the reasons I have just given, it can be seen that this increase really is quite inadequate, and to, let, to delay the increase until the end of next year simply adds insult to injury. Finally, as the name of this particular bill indicates, there is a package of measures for, for carers. The first of those measures will provide that a recipient of the carer pension will continue to receive their payment for 14 weeks after the person they have been caring for is permanently institutionalised. This will allow the person some time to adjust to their new circumstances. One of those new circumstances, of course, is that they will have to transfer to a new social security payment and, in the majority of cases, that will mean the loss of some income and, more importantly, the loss of their pension or concession card. Now, I must say to you that, uh, having run a campaign for thousands of uh, widows in particular who, uh, who are in this situation, uh, I'm well aware of the significant loss which this, mean, which this, uh, which this indicates. I'm sure all of us in this place, in fact, are aware of how highly pensioners value their concession card, and I believe that the government should be looking to provide the concession card to these people for six or even 12 months after coming off the carer pension. In fact, uh, I believe they ought to continue it indefinitely until that person's uh, circumstances change significantly enough for, the, uh, for them to lose that concession card. But I must say 14 weeks is simply not long enough for them to be able to adjust completely to their changed circumstances, and while the concession card isn't the total answer to this, it would certainly be greatly appreciated by these people. Turning now to the Social Security and Veterans Affairs Legislation Amendment Bill 1995, there are just a couple of issues from this bill that I want to touch on. The first is the proposed changes to the operation of the earnings credit scheme, which is currently available to those unemployed people who are receiving a job search or new start allowance. The earnings credit scheme allows unemployed people to earn a very limited amount of inco outside income without affecting their social security payments. The scheme is a very valuable initiative. It allows people to accept work opportunities which they other otherwise may have knocked back for fear of losing their social security payment. However, if we make the restrictions on the scheme as tight as this bill seeks to do, people simply will not take advantage of it. In fact, just recently a friend of mine who, um, who has a PhD uh, and who sought uh, higher uh, qualifications because he was encouraged to do so by government policy, was telling me that uh, he's been unable to get full-time work. Uh, recently he took uh, uh, four weeks uh, uh, part-time work recommended to him by CES and found at the end of the four weeks that he had lost a significant amount of money. 
Surely the earnings credit scheme is meant to encourage people uh, to in fact find work, uh, to get into the workforce so that uh, they can uh, get back self-esteem and, and in that way uh, become uh, full-time uh, and permanent workers. Uh, if we're going to make this scheme so restrictive that people won't take advantage of it, then we are simply, uh, as they say, cutting off our noses to spite our face. I indicate now the Democrats will be opposing that part of the bill which seeks to limit to $100 the amount of earnings credit which can be used in any one fortnight. The final issue I want to comment on tonight relates to the changes proposed to the Mature Age Allowance. The Mature Age Allowance was introduced as an interim measure to assist older, long-term unemployed people. It is now proposed to make the allowance a permanent part of the social security system. Of course, the main reason there is an ever-increasing need for the Mature Age Allowance is as a result of the government and opposition decision to increase the pension age for women. Many older women are now finding themselves in the very difficult position of not qualifying for the pension but having very little hope of finding work. I might underline that in a soon to be tabled report of the Super Committee we received a lot of evidence on this very issue. All of the evidence underlined the fact that it was a significant disadvantage for women to have this imposition on them. Indeed, I predict that in the uh, soon to be tabled uh, Super Committee report, a report entitled Super and Broken Work Patterns, uh, that I predict that that report will in fact prove the point that the Democrats have been making and some others in this place. Given that the increased pension age for women is going ahead, however, the Democrats believe the extension of the mature age allowance is the least that can be done. The Democrats, however, are strongly opposed to the idea that new grants of the allowance after 1 July next year will be made under the benefit, income and assets test. Let me just explain about this nasty. We believe that this is nothing more than a cost-cutting exercise. As senators will be aware, the benefit income and assets tests are much tighter than the pension tests. For example, while both assets tests allow a single person to hold assets up to $118,000, after this amount the pension phases out gradually but benefits cut out immediately. In other words, for benefits the $118,000 is a sudden death limit. So single people with assets between $118,000 and $231,750 would qualify for some mature age allowance under the old test but will not qualify under the new test and neither will they qualify for the unemployment payment. The practical effect of this will be that people will be forced to run their assets down at the very time that we should be encouraging them to maintain their assets for retirement. Minister, this is a crazy proposition, just crazy stuff. I can't understand it. Why should the government uh, even be considering such a proposition? Finally, <laughs> I'm doing my best. <laughs> Finally, as the welfare rights people have pointed out, this change will also lead to greater complexity within the social security system as you'll have two categories of mature age allowance recipients. Those that applied before 1st July 1996 and are subject to the pensions income test, pensions income and assets test, and those who applied after that date who are, paid, who are paid under the allowance income and assets test. I am aware that the coalition will be supporting these changes, so I simply state for the record the Democrats' up opposition to the imposition of the benefit income and assets test to the mature age allowance. 
Perfect. Sure. Um, Senator Troth. Thank you, Mr Directing Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Woodley, for your valiant efforts. Uh, I speak with, references to, to, with reference to the Employment Services Amendment Bill 1995, which was um, introduced earlier by my colleague, Senator Knowles. Uh, this bill changes case management arrangements for some part-time and seasonal workers, and it also streamlines the administrative procedures for CES case management and allows ESRA to obtain goods and services on a credit card. It amalgamates the job search and new start allowance um, as well. Now, the coalition will not be opposing this bill, but there are several pertinent comments that I wish to make with regard to it. And firstly, I would like to look at case management. The coalition has had concerns with the case management system, most noticeably the high number of clients per case manager which must preclude adequate attention being given to individual clients. The recent Auditor-General's report number three into CES case management revealed very serious weaknesses in the functioning of the CSS, CES, which it said, quote, must be very quickly remedied as they reduce its capacity to, re to assist the long-term unemployed. And it was evident from this report that many unemployed people have very tenuous links with their case manager or are not receiving effective assistance at all. And indeed, I met a lady in Tasmania on Saturday who, after two years, is still waiting to meet her case manager. The survey results were critical in their assessment of the CES case management system. It was found that 39 per cent of clients did not recognise that they had a return to work plan a key element of case management. Surely, if this government is failing to get across information about a key element of the Working Nation program to a large proportion of the participants, there is something wrong with the emphasis of the scheme. 29 per cent of clients had not been asked for feedback about the usefulness of elements of their return to work plan in finding them employment, and again, neglecting to get information and failing to inform clients of a key element of the program begs the question, how serious is the minister about the duties of his department? Only 43 per cent of clients in employment or studying at the time of the survey indicated that they had received post-placement support, and this support is supposed to help clients in their transition to employment or study. Now, given that the people who are receiving case management are the long-term unemployed, you would think that this group, or this ought to be the group, who are receiving 100 per cent support in transition. Coming back into the workforce after a two years or more gap, possibly after retraining, would entail an enormous amount of readjustment. One of the most damning findings in the Auditor-General's report was the suggestion that while most clients were satisfied with the length and type of contact, 30 per cent, one third almost, of clients who had visits or personal contact did not believe their contact with the CES was useful. And for such a large minority to be unhappy with this system indicates that there are some serious problems. And this negative perception, perception by clients is an indictment on the efficacy of the whole program. The bill also makes some um, provision um, for ESRA to purchase goods and services on a credit card. And I reiterate the concerns expressed by Dr Kemp in the other place regarding the provision of this credit card to the chair of ESRA, who is at presently Mrs Joan Kerner, the former Premier of Victoria. Last week, Mr Peter Costello in the other place revealed in the answer to a question on notice that Mrs Kerner used her position as the chair of ESRA to fly to Perth for a board meeting, which surprisingly coincided with the appearance of her federal colleague, Dr Carmen Lawrence, at the Marks Royal Commission. While in Perth, Mrs Kerner not only attended the Marks Royal Commission, but addressed a Labor Women's Forum where she called the audience to stand shoulder to shoulder with Carmen Lawrence as she takes the witness stand. Mrs Kerner was also interviewed by Paul Lynham on one of the four evenings she spent in Perth on the 7.30 report where she defended Dr Lawrence. All this in a four-day visit to Perth for the purpose of conducting Ezra business. Needless to say, 
given this highly questionable use of taxpayers' money in her capacity as Ezra Chairperson, the Coalition will continue to monitor closely the way in which the Ezra credit card is used. This bill also makes provision for CES registration for seasonal and part-time workers who choose not to remain in case management. This issue of case management flexibility was highlighted in the recent Senate Employment Education and Training Report into long-term unemployment, and recommendation of number one of that report stated, the committee recommends that mature age workers, that is 35 and over, who become unemployed be eligible to access labour market programs within three months of becoming, becoming unemployed. Many mature workers feel that early intervention is essential. It being 10.30 p.m. Uh, pursuant to order, I propose that the, the question that the Senate do now adjourn. Senator Tierney. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise tonight to continue a series of speeches on the disastrous state facing this nation and the impact that long-term unemployment is having on Australia. Uh, it's very timely I do this in light of uh, Senator Troth's comments uh, in that uh, recent debate, and in some ways uh, what I'm saying may uh, seem like a continuation of her comments uh, relating to some of the failures uh, of working nation. And I want to focus on, uh, on this uh, tonight because our Senate uh, committee held hearings right across Australia over a three-month period and scrutinised exactly how the so-called Working Nation program was working, or to be more precise, how it wasn't working. Uh, last uh, week I focused in the matter of public interest debate uh, on evidence given to the committee that highlighted the voice of despair of the long-term unemployed people who felt abandoned by this government and the uh, system that's been uh, set up by its Department of Employment, Education and Training. Mature age people who felt that they were only qualified now to be on the scrap heap of life and youth who were giving up and slipping between the cracks uh, in our society. Children who were living in families where no one was working and the despair of the health effects uh, on the long-term unemployed and their families, particularly uh, their children, who, as I outlined last week, were, uh, were, were beset with uh, a greater amount of uh, chronic illness. Tonight I want to focus on the stark evidence that reveals uh, how this uh, ALP, so-called Working Nation program, isn't working. The programs were set up to solve the problems of the long-term unemployed and the evidence we gathered around the country showed again and again across the regions of Australia how this was not working. They are creating a situation where the long-term unemployed is becoming increasingly entrenched as part of the Australian landscape. This government likes to talk about its so-called Working Nation program in dollar terms. It will boast that it's spent $2.2 billion uh, on Working Nation. But when all the rhetoric is uh, laid aside, the government cannot es escape the simple disgraceful fact that 8.7 per cent of the Australian workforce remains on the official uh, unemployment list. That, doesn't that does not include the unofficial list of people who have just given up or who are underemployed. But even on the government's own shonky figures, there are still 760,000 Australians without work. And of that number, one third are long term unemployed. Labor's recent uh, document on labour market programs shaping our nation boasts that Australia is leading the OECD nations in the generation of new jobs. Now, this is just a nonsense claim. The incidence of long-term unemployment in the country is near 30 per cent, and this is much worse than uh, comparable OECD countries. Uh, by comparison, in Japan it's 15 per cent, in the US it's 12 per cent. So the Keating government's claim that working nation programs 
are having a significant impact is just not true. The evidence provided to our committee showed the scale and the dimension of the long-term unemployment problem. The striking increases in long-term unemployment from 4.5 per cent in the mid-70s to almost 40 per cent in 1993 at the height of the recession. The main victims uh, of long-term unemployment are the young and the mature age. And our Senate committee did a major study on youth unemployment two years ago, which to this government's great shame they virtually ignored. And in this recent report on long-term unemployment, we did focus on the mature age. The youth unemployment that they ignored is still rife in our society. In parts of regional New South Wales, it's reached 38 per cent and in the Hunter rising to 50 per cent on the far north coast. The long-term unemployment report says over half, 56 per cent of unemployed males over 55 years were unemployed for 52 weeks or more, as were 53 per cent of males aged 45 to 54. The mature age are unwanted and unhelped by Labor's so-called world-class labour market programs. And as we moved around the country and as we heard from these people, as they came before us and told us their story, not only of losing their jobs, but of the total frustration and demoralisation that occurred when they tried to access this Labor government's uh, labour market program, it just showed the stark reality of the failure of working nation to us. We found this particularly in regional areas where this government doesn't seem to have actually made uh, enough uh, leeway for the regional differences and the programs that might work in some regions and might not work in others. Uh, at page 58 of the report it says, we had to aggregate national figures showing economic growth that was regarded as too high for some. So as a very blunt instrument, interest rates were used to dampen demand. Now that might be part, fine in parts of Queensland and in Western Australia where, uh, where growth was up to 11 per cent in some cases, but in the western and northern suburbs of Adelaide, for example, they claim they still had a regional recession. And it's this lack of flexibility in the Labor government's uh, programs that shows that regional Australia really misses out and the focus just is not on what is needed in those areas. The dimensions of the long-term unemployment problem presents a massive task to put everyone back to work. We heard evidence that with a million unemployed, to get everyone back to work, we will have to create the equivalent of 20 entire BHPs or 50,000 to 100,000 small businesses Australia-wide. That is the scope of, uh, of what we're facing. And to have the government coming up with a program that creates training that doesn't lead to work and creates a situation where dull queues are just constantly churned is not the response to put people into long-term work and the scale of what is required in terms of the creation of new employment to absorb these people is shown by those figures that I indicated in the numbers of small business needed to take up, and big businesses, to take up this sort of slack. Working Nation is a cover up to really hide the dimensions of long-term unemployment in this country. It brings together the numbers of people on long-term uh, unemployment training schemes and those with short-term subsidised jobs in places in the same category as those who have gained unsubsidised employment. This is dishonest and it skews the outcome of the Working Nation uh, initiative and really shows what a cover-up it is when they do those sorts of combinations. I reject the notion, as dishonest, that the placement of long-term unemployment in, of people in subsidised work or formal training justifies their removal from the official unemployment figures. As we moved around the country, we found a number of other major criticisms. One of the main ones focused on training that wasn't leading anywhere. In Wyala, people are sick and tired of training for the sake of it, they told us. 
They are disillusioned with training programs that get them nowhere. There was a report of the mismatch between jobs and talent. Training in the absence of real jobs is pointless, and evidence at page 80 of the report underlies this. Too often there was a mismatch between the training offered, which must be accepted if all benefits are forfeited, the talents and abilities of the long-term unemployed and the local employment opportunities. Training is often used just as a time filler in some regional areas and to reduce the unemployment statistics. The perception with many older, long-term unemployed in regional areas with high structural unemployment is that no amount of training will make a difference and that these deep programs are indeed time fillers. We have the evidence of the churning of the dull queue in this situation. The unemployed and the professionals in the labour market program and delivery express the view that labour market programs were merely recycling unemployed people. This was <coughs> highlighted at page 81 of the Senate report. I quote. Order. Uh, your time has expired. The Senate stands adjourned till tomorrow at 12.30 p.m. <laughs>